Uh, hello! Welcome to the stream! Surprise. Surprise. <laughs> oh, get fucked, losers. <laughs> losers! My, my, mm years? What's mm years? Thanks, I'm deaf now. <laughs> Oh, D colons. You can't D col. No, D colons are banned emotes. D colon. If you D colon in here, you will be banned. You will be banned for D coling ning. All D colons get banned. Stop. That's not how. That's not how it works. Ah, uh, you can't winky D colon. That just doesn't. That just doesn't even work. Hmm. 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 Oh, de clo clogni. Oh, de clogni. <laughs> oh, time to get banned. Get fucked. Losers. That's okay, chat. You're okay. You're okay, chat. I think you're just fine as you are. Hmm. What's even happening right now? We're gonna run around Grand Theft Auto real fast while I eat. Don't ban me? Why wouldn't I ban you? Chat, I need reasons why to not ban. Audio out of sync? It probably is. Hmm. This is the only game I had on here. Let's max out that anti-aliasing. Turn on white. Turn on widescreen. Very high quality. Unlike chat's code. Um. All right. Uh, what was I going to do? Change the controller setup and make it so the mouse is not inverted because that's literally for communists. I don't, I don't understand why people use an inverted mouse unless they're objectively wrong at existing. Frame limiter on? Yeah. Have you ever played GTA? It has to be 25 FPS. Is it control? No, that's jump. Is it shift? I don't know what the settings are. If you became a variety streamer, I'd totally watch. Why? Why though? All right, chat, we need a mini mission. I need a mini mission. What What do I do? Do I speed run to uh, $10,000? <laughs> hmm. And just do it. All right. So this is uh, this is San Andreas. We're just going around here looking for some uh, looking for uh, just uh, here. We'll go on the ramp. All right. Here you go. Uh, nope. There we go. Here's content. This is a variety stream today. <laughs> Your pleasant personality where I complain about all software being shit. 
Hmm. Speedrun getting fat, Carl. How much money do I need for that? How much money do I need to get fat? Can I even go in the store? You just killed a lead? No, no, no. It was a, it was just a little bump. Let's go to the well-stacked pizza co. Let's see what they got here. Shoop. Oh, they're not open yet. We can't even get fat yet. No, oh, that's no good. I have no idea. What are my controls? I have the default controls and it hurts. I like how you can honk and then people can't get in your car. It's great. Uh, what else? Uh, so we, there's like nothing we can do here, is there? We'll just hang out here, I guess. It'll buff out. <laughs> oh, shit. Ah, these cops are so aggressive. How did they how did they see into the future when they designed this game? <laughs> Someone should make diet food for nerds called X Fat. Jesus Christ. Does that make you feel good? Does it make you feel good when you type something out like that? When you hit the enter key, do you feel okay with your existence? Yeah, boo. Uh, thank you so much, Dave FTW, for the 33 months. Holy shit, coming up on three years. <laughs> I love my existence. No, you don't. You live in Canada. You're literally a communist. Can we buy food in the 69 cent store? Unsubbed. <laughs> Infinite entropy, thank you so much for the tier one. Hmm. There we go. <laughs> I don't know the goal here. Is it high score? How do I take damage? Oh, do they get closer to me with time? Oh! I don't know what that is. I got something. Oh, okay. Okay, I see. They shoot things at me that I have to dodge. <clears throat> okay, okay. I can, I can do that. Damn, when are we writing cheats for this? Ooh, now they're blue. Oh, wow, they're complex. Look at that rotation. <laughs> Isn't that how streaming works on July 4th? Yeah. Something like that. Why aren't you shooting off fireworks from my hot tub? I could shoot some fireworks off from my hot tub. Oh, is that a cheating spot? Can I just whale in one spot? Oh, can you shoot really fast? Okay, okay, okay. We're learning, we're learning. What's our score, 820? I think that's a good score. Oh, I took damage. Is there no way to heal? This game is impossible. <laughs> We've been scammed, there's no rust. How do you know this isn't written in rust? Bah, 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 bah. We're at forty percent health. This is this is tragic. Is there a pause? I don't. What? Why did the enter key? Why did hitting enter do this? When are we writing game cheats for this? We gotta write speedrun strats for this game. Um. Interesting how Americans call 4th of July their Independence Day in British date format. What? That's not how that works. 
<laughs> oh, we got a... Wait, you seriously can't type out the numbers? It's, we're going to be ace. There you go. They crawled from Uranus. <laughs> That's pretty good. What else can I do in here? Oh, I can buy a snack or a drink. What do you think is going to be more fattening, a snack or a drink? My music stopped. Uh, what do we want? Here we go. Both together? Let's see. Let's see how fat we get from this. Okay, it went up like one pixel. I think we can do this. This is the speedrun strat. Beer crabs. You know, what's wrong with crabs? Oh my god, this spaghetti is so good. Okay. <clears throat> Let's try some of the snacks. I bet they're identical. Yeah, they look identical. The real question is, is one vending machine faster than the other? That would really tell us uh, what, what's important here. Do you think I can speed this up by turning off the frame limiter? I don't know. I don't think that's faster. We're riding a fast alligator so the GTA devs can stroll in faster. Oh my god. How many times are we going to parse JSON today? Why is JSON just the best format? Like, there's nothing I love more than having to parse numbers and do A to I to parse ints on computers. I think that's a great use of uh, compute. I love that that's become a meme. The funny part about it is all the big brain hackers and the programmers on like Hacker News and on... Uh, and on, like, programming humor on Reddit, all think that GTA devs are idiots for doing that. Meanwhile, they do the exact same shit, and they literally don't even know they're doing it. Because they don't know when strings are parsed. <laughs> Imagine to use a binary for a what format? Computers don't work in binary though. They work in they work in English. It would it would be a waste to use a format in binary. We've technically gained weight here. Do you think they have a Spanish computer? No. Why would they have a computer in Spanish? English is the only language that matters. Freedom! <clears throat> CPU instructions take JSON input. Yeah. Yeah. And the compare instruction does, uh, does JavaScript, uh, JavaScript comparisons. All right, I'm almost done eating. It took longer than expected to heat up my food. 
Relax, chat. Fucking relax, okay? That's why they called it Intel Management English. Jesus Christ. Why do we even fucking stream? Chat, did you keep hitting enter? Did he keep hitting enter while we were gone? <sighs> Who said speedrun to fat CJ? This is gonna take like 45 minutes. AVX is advanced JavaScript extreme. SSE is simple sentences in English. Oh, that's why they have wider registers, so they can fit sentences. Instead of... They... Uh, to, because SSE works on sentences, and that was a big speed up because computers used to work on words! <laughs> Ah. <laughs> uh, <whew. sighs> <sighs> 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 right, what's this game? Duality or do a itty. Mhm. Mm do a itty. How do we play this? Uh, okay, uh, okay, uh, okay. I don't understand these physics. Space makes me go fast, and I slightly turn in the direction that I steer? That's just not how space works, though, right? That's just, that's just not how space works. Oh, do I need to alternate? white and black and my score goes down when i take damage so right now i need to get a uh one of the black orbs here no wait okay now i'm four what am i doing how does this work <laughs> is it only the big ones i use up my score when i shoot Wait a minute. But now I don't. I I don't understand. This game is so sophisticated. Okay, okay. We're just going to go fast. Uh Oh, I'm running out of fuel. Can I restore fuel? Does fuel come back? No, if I run into these, I gain f what a I gain fuel, but I lose score. When I run into them? Okay, this is an extremely complex game. 
Um, <clears throat> honestly, I don't think people have figured this one out yet. I think this is one of those... One of those games where people just don't quite know how to beat it yet, because my score keeps going down. It goes up sometimes, and it goes down sometimes. Uh... Uh... And sometimes it goes up and I gain fuel. Oh, do I want to hit the ones that are the color of the score? I... <clears throat> The big ones, do you have to shoot? No. Game sucks. Game sucks. I hate it. I hate it. Game sucks. I don't even think the devs knew what this game is. What the fuck is this game? I have no idea. All right, chat. The first thing that we have to do to this stream is completely off the rails. No. Infinite entropy. We're not going to do fucking Ruby. Like, stop. Stop. We're not doing Ruby today. Uh, all right. BMI 2, Fat Guy Speedrun Acceleration. AVX Advanced Vocabulary Extended. CUDA, Computers Understand Different Alphabets. <laughs> Why is that? Why is that funny? Is it? Is that funny, chat? Because it kind of seemed funny, but it shouldn't be. Ram, ridiculously awesome memory. <sighs> does anyone still do Ruby? No, no one does Ruby. <laughs> Ruby's terrible. All right. All right, chat. So what we have to do is this project is over... How old is this project? This project is like four, three or four months old now. Uh, and I still haven't named it. It's called Mutator Test. So what we're going to do is we're going to find a better name for it. Subnet, thank you so much for the 28 months. You're on a 27 month streak. Wait. That means for one month you didn't subscribe to me? Me? After all of the content that I give you? Oh, gosh. Gosh. All right, so we got to find a squishable chat. Let's go to squishables. If no one uses rubies, then why is it still on rails? Jesus Christ. These are just bad today, chat. This is just wrong, okay? All of you are wrong. What's alter egos? What are these? Oh my god. Oh my god, what are these? Whoa! Oh my god! What are these? Oh my god, these are great! <laughs> oh my god! What the fuck are these? How do you even come up with these? <laughs> Look at this! Oh my fucking god! Oh my god! What, like, how, how do you come up with this? They're released in collector sets of five. God damn it. A smooth hacker! You get to be an ice cream cone today, a waffle cone. Smooth Hackers, the waffle cone today. We'll, uh, we'll make some space. You gotta lay on your side. God, that's brilliant. How are they so smart? Holy shit. <laughs> this is so good. This is so good! Oh, okay, 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 credit card. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what else? Oh, marshmallows is in now! No, it's out of stock. Oh my god! That sold out immediately. I ordered marshmallows. Oh, no, I ordered mini These are the big ones. Okay, so I need to order these. 
I need to order marshmallows. Oh my god, these are cute. These come off the stick. There's little burn marks. <laughs> they come off the stick, which is wild. Oh my god, they're so brilliant. So I already have a project named Marshmallows, so that's already taken. Uh, technically, I ordered a Marshmallows and it got stolen out of my mailbox. I got skimmossed. Wow, okay, okay, okay. What's new? This is a new cupcake. A new style of cupcake. At least. Uh... Uh, the egg. The egg's cute. I have a cannoli. A turnip? Is that a bagel? French fries? Oh, those are minis. I don't want minis. No, 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 no. No, I don't want minis. I want standards. Ooh, what are they getting soon? A rose? The egg. The egg is so cute. The peanut how is peanut butter cute? How do you make a jar of peanut butter cute? It's even got peanut butter running down the side of it. Oh my god, what's the okay, what's the nutrition facts? How do we look at this? Oh, how do we get a bigger image? Smooth and snuggly. Oh my god, I wanna read the label! Shit! <laughs> Make a peanut butter cute. <laughs> oh, the dumpling! The soup dumpling! Oh my god! Oh, the soup dumpling's so good! <laughs> AI upscale. Gotta buy it to read the label. Oh my god, that's fair. Grapefruit! I have a cinnamon bun. I can't believe they're still doing that. A mystery squishable. I can't do a mystery anymore because I have too many of them. The burrito. <laughs> oh my god, what the fuck? <laughs> it's a fucking burrito. Look at the face on it. Oh, what an idiot. Oh my god, that's great. <laughs> Waffle cone? Why does that say pre-order? That's weird. The loaf of bread. Lemonade. Oh my god, that's a cute lemonade. Oh my god, that's a cute lemonade. What are these posters? What are these posters in the background? Why can't I get full screen images? Is that like his art? He must be one of the designers. Who made it? Pat H. Is this Pat H? Oh, so the, here's all of Pat's designs. Oh my god. He made the cannoli! <laughs> and the peanut butter jar! <laughs> oh my fucking god. They're so good! <laughs> $45 for a squishable burrito worth every cent. Yeah, I kind of like the mocha, even though I don't drink any, like, coffees. The cauldron. No! Why is that- why- why is that a 404? Skamas. So the other thing you can do is you can look at the community. Is it community? No, vote. If you go to vote, you can vote on new designs. And there's some bangers that will come through. Oh, okay. Okay. A Ramune soda? Okay. Okay. Macaroon stack. So the winners are going to be made. So we're going to get a lavender. <laughs> oh, an evil eye. Oh, fuck. Oh, hell yeah. <laughs> it didn't win. It didn't win. Sag. Does this monkey have a banana? <laughs> Look at that! Holy shit, that's so good! <laughs> a chameleon? Oh, The onion! An onion could be pretty cute! <laughs> How many of these made it? 
I guess if they're not grayscale, they're currently being voted on. How's the Ramune doing? Oh, do they not tell you until it goes through? I'm, no, I'm an Ohio college student who loves to do art and design my free time. I'm majoring in visual communication design, and my dream is to have a book published. Oh my god. This is like 12 gen Pokemon. <laughs> Shit. What's a Wild West worm? <laughs> How the fuck do you even come up with this? It reminds me of the SpongeBob worm. Like, what? <laughs> oh my god, I like the Ramune. I would totally get Ramune. <laughs> it's Shelby from Adventure Time? I've never watched it. I've heard great things. Squishable Dune Worm. All right, chat, what's the best? What's the best one here? In stock only. What do we want, chat? What's the name of this project? Hmm. God, even the grapes are cute. Look at these. Oh, one's winking at you. Avocado. The avocado is very cute. Do we get one of the fancy avocado? Do we get the set of the avocados? Can I even get an avocado? Yes, I can. <laughs> I mean, the avocado is cute as fuck. All right, how do we tie this into an allocator? <laughs> the avocado is so cute. And that's a good shape, too. What is this? They do, they have an avocado puzzle. Oh my fucking God, Squishable, you're geniuses. Like what? Alicado. <laughs> we could get the set. Can we? <laughs> the alter egos? The whole set? I don't know. I kind of want the big one. Yeah, these are small. Hmm. <laughs> They're goofy as fuck, though. Oh my god, what's this? A baked potato? <laughs> it's just a fucking baked potato. Oh, it's retired. <laughs> Alicado. Alicado or alicado? I guess alicado. How many L's? How many L's? Alicado, alicado. I think we'll get the we'll get the avocado here. I think that's what we're gonna do. We'll get the avocado. I need a what do I need? I need to buy cannoli. I need to buy an avocado. And I need to buy the marshmallows. And the marshmallows aren't in stock, so I'm gonna have to keep my eye. I can get the mini one, even that's out of stock. Holy shit. Oh no. Maybe Amazon has them in stock, let's see. Sometimes Amazon will have stock. Uh, squishable marshmallow. Nope, I can't get that. Holy shit. Okay, and then we'll buy directly from them. I don't like buying from Amazon because I love this company so fucking much. Uh, we'll get a cannoli. And we'll get an avocado. And then we gotta just keep our eyes peeled for the marshmallows. I can't believe I got they got stolen. Fuck. <laughs> Alright, let's order this real quick. I probably have an account. Yep, I have an account. <laughs> oh, did I save my information? I hope I did. I hope I can just click buy. Fuck yeah. Billing shame is shipping. Next step. 
Use the recommended address. Uh, let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go. Fuck yeah. Ordered. Ordered. Okay, that's coming. Wait, I gotta review my order? Why? It's on the way. Fuck yeah, dude. Fuck yeah. <laughs> oh, I can't wait. Okay. All right. So now we gotta, I guess, update the uh, project. And let's see. Can I reset these stats? Yes, I can. Perfect. I had some frame drops when I launched uh, GTSA at the start when I compiled some sheeters. Avocalic. All right, chat. Let's, uh, how do we do a poll? Uh, poll. Poll. New. Dude, how the, f how the fuck am I possibly going to do this? Can I do a poll built in? I think I can. Yes, I can. Okay. Uh, we're going to do, uh, uh, project name. Uh, Alocado. Alocado. Uh, avocalic. I don't know, something like that. Here you go. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's cue up some music. Let's go for. Oh, I did. We are the in crowd. I think already. Um, what do we want for this hour of the day? Hmm. We'll put on some Ash Nico. Fuck yeah. Avoc Avocator? I don't think I can edit my poll at this point. It's too late. Too late. Get fucked. Uh, Alicado with two L's. I mean, that's pretty fucking good. <laughs> that's pretty good. Uh... Commands, edit, project. Today we're working on Alicado, our high performance allocator in Rust. There you go. <laughs> Alicado. All right. Well, that was a very, that was a pretty landslide victory. 87%. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it wasn't even close. If you voted for the other ones, you're just objectively wrong and stupid. Okay. Okay, so let's, uh, let's rename it from Mutator Test. Because that was a terrible name. And now it's Alocado. <laughs> That's such a fucking good name. Uh, we'll remove the lock file. I didn't even know what lock files do. Or just made up, I think. Uh... Alicado. And then 2021 proc macro debug true. Uh proc macro we'll call this um Alicado proc macro. I think is what we'll call that and that's a proc macro. We'll get into that in a minute. Uh What do we call it? Alicado. Okay, cargo build. Does it build? No, because that. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, that's going to be in the procedural macro. Shh, don't worry. Chat, just don't look, okay? Don't look, chat. It's okay. It's okay, chat. It's fine. You didn't see anything. Okay, great. Okay, and that's fine. Source lib. Uh, uh, proc macro. Alocado. That's, that's, a, that's a pretty good name. All right, chat. Uh, okay. Uh, lock files only matter when built for building libraries, not binaries. I thought it was the other way around. I thought it only mattered for... Binary is a lot libraries, but I don't know. 
Um, I guess if you ignore deallocate calls, you can write a pretty fast allocator. Yeah, we're not, we don't have free. We're not going to have free. Free is a bad primitive. Okay. So, uh, we're going to, we're going to do a benchmark quick. Uh, how do you think this will compare to, uh, 84? We'll just set this to U32 temporarily. Don't, we were doing some weird shit last night. Um, so, what do we, Chad, how do you think this will benchmark? Let's allocate a bunch of U8s for blah and zero to a million allocations. And then we'll do, uh, na dot alloc uninit. And I think I give it a type, something like that. Uh, Alicado Cargo Watch. Okay, yeah, that's... Oh, wait. Cargo Tests. Release. No Capture. Uh, Alec on it. Oh, new on it. There we go. So we're going to allocate an uninitialized thing. And we'll unwrap it to make sure that that was successful. Okay, and then... Uh, and then we'll do that... How many times will we do this? How fast is this going to run? Let's see. Okay, pretty fast. Uh, so we'll do IT is standard time instant now. Print line. IT elapsed. Okay. And then we'll do four blah and zero. Can we do a billion allocations? Uh, can we do a billion allocations? Oh, you know what? This is probably going to get op optimized out. This might get optimized out. Mm. Oh, that's on a NUMA pool. I don't want to do it on a NUMA pool. I want to do it on a local pool. Okay, okay. So I'll make a local pool. That LP is local pool new. And then we'll do uh, lp.accessor, numa accessor, uh, la, which is the local accessor. <laughs> Damn it. Uh, something like this, maybe. Accessor on the outside. All right, some, some, something like this. This is fine, chat, okay? This is fine. Uh, let's see. Does this get optimized out? I think this will. Actually, it probably won't if we don't, uh, LTO this. Oh. Bam. Bam. Unwrap that. And outside loop. Where's my black box hat? Black box doesn't do shit. Uh, 292. Accessor... And mismatch type. Uh, borrow this. And mutable on LP. Shouldn't it be LA? Yeah. Okay, that runs, and it got optimized out. It got the 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 reason we know it got optimized out is because of the 88 nanoseconds. We can try black box, but I'm pretty sure black box has never worked for me. And I also don't really want to black box. You know what? Here's what we're going to do. We're going to fill it in. So we're going to do unsafe elk is equal to this. And then we're going to do elk dot. I think we call a knit. Uh, LA dot a knit. I forget how to do this. And then like 5U8. See what happens. 25 milliseconds. Is that optimized out? Let's read it as well. LA dot get. Uh, okay, so we'll just do new. We don't have to do new on in it in this case. 5U8. So we'll allocate that. That will initialize it inside. And then we'll do LA dot get allocation. And then we'll do unsafe 
Uh, core pointer read volatile. So we actually read that memory. 263 millis. That's pretty good. 261 milliseconds to do a billion allocations. That's pretty good. <laughs> uh, is that using these flags? Does it use profile.release? LTO is fat. Opt level is three. Uh, code gen units is one. Is it going to use these? Yes. Two sixty four millis. Okay, nice. Um, so that didn't really matter. Sometimes LTO matters a lot in this case, but I guess since we're doing it in a test in the crate, LTO doesn't really matter too much. So let's take a look at this binary. So here's what we ran. I had a sixty four. Ah. Compare with the standard allocator? <laughs> yeah, we can. Uh, there's the VF tables. Where's the actual function here? Uh, probably this. Yeah. Um, yeah. So right here, you can see it filling those bytes in. This is really weird code gen. I guess it fills in two bytes at a time and then it reads them. So it allocates how many bytes at a time? It allocates five bytes at a time. There's our million and four. So it allocates, it allocates five bytes at a time and then fills them in and initializes them like this. So that's pretty hot, I would say. In the grand scheme of things, that's pretty hot. Uh, you probably have never seen an allocator that optimizes allocations across allocations. <laughs> because I don't think I have ever seen this in my life. 260 picoseconds per alloc seems iffy. Nope. It's definitely doing those. Like here, you can see, here's the outside loop. Here, or here's the inside loop. That's a million iterations on the inside loop. And here's a thousand iterations on the outside loop. That's, this is real. It, the co it's not like this got optimized out because I'm looking at the code right here. We loop until EAX is a thousand. That's our outside loop. And that is done, EAX is probably zeroed. Up here, yep. It's zeroed up here. And then the inside loop, it runs a million times on that loop. Well, technically, it, it runs less than that, but it adds five at a time. How the heck? <laughs> we'll get into that in a bit. But yes, um, let's see how this compares to uh, libc. Uh, let's see. So here's the code that we have here. And honestly, that's not even great code gen. I'm going to do powers of two. Powers of two will lead to slightly better code gen, I would imagine. Let's just see what happens. Um, let's see if that improved code gen or not. Ida, stop being a bitch. Bam. Ida, stop. That's a weird Ida prompt. Uh, test. Database is corrupted, okay? Uh, yeah, okay, that's not great. Let's just, uh, uh, dump this. Uh, and then we can demangle this. Uh, and then we're just looking for test. Probably colon colon test. There we go. Where's the loops? That is... Where is our initialization loop? I kind of want to look at it in Ida. 
Looks like shit here. Uh, I gotta... Why is it loading an existing file? It's so weird. Like, what the fuck is this? What the fuck? Cargo clean. That's really strange. Um, cool. I can't open that. Test. I'd, uh, CF this. I don't understand how that file is so fucked. It didn't give me a discard option, which is weird. I don't know if I changed something in my edit settings. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, look at that now. With the powers of two loops. Look at that. Outside loop to 1024. Inside loop to uh, to one meg. And it literally initializes four bytes at a time. Even though those are four individual allocations. And then there's the actual reads of those bytes. <laughs> yeah, I'm telling you, man. This allocator is pretty good. It's a pretty good allocator. How fast do you think Malik is? So we can do a gig of allocations in 283 milliseconds. How long do you think it will take Libsy's alloc to do that? So we'll do it the exact same way. We'll do four. Uh, int i is zero. i is less than 10 to four. i i plus plus. Uh, and then we have to do uh, four in JJ is zero. JJ is less than uh, Meg. JJ plus plus. And then we have to do Malik one. Char buff is this. Then we have to initialize it to a five. And then we have to, uh, I guess we'll mark this as volatile. And then we have to read it. Uh, char temp is equal to this. So we'll deref that. And then we need to free all of these. Uh, that's really hard. Let's just do it without freeing. Even though that's not a fair comparison because mine frees and this doesn't. Uh, GC03 test does C. That's fine. We'll give it it just so it's happier. 1.25 seconds. <laughs> Eight it out. Uh, we'll just time the program. There you go, 31 seconds. Not bad. Not bad, 31 seconds. Is that a repro? So how much faster are we? We're over 10 times faster. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. Now, technically, it's not fair, though, because we free in ours. So let's do a, a void star star free list is equal to malloc uh, 8 times 1024 times 1024. And then we're going to do a free list JJ is equal to buff. And then we have to go through all of them and free them. Now it's a fair comparison. Uh, yep. Free, free list, JJ. Now it's actually a fair comparison. Because mine frees. Uh, discards volatile, so that's fine, doesn't matter. All right, that code right? I think so. Okay. Honestly, I'm just going to cut off a cut. I'm going to cut. Uh, we're going to go to 128. We're going to just, we're just going to do that. Okay, two sec three seconds. Okay, so we can run it for the whole thing. 
And could you, in theory, expert this allocator with seed bindings? Yes, but it's our our allocator is very special cased. You, you would not replace Libsy Malik with this. What about J E Malik? I don't know. It's probably also ass. Okay, it's faster when it freezes. That makes sense. That makes sense. So now it's 20 seconds. So now we're not 10 times. We're only like eight times faster. Wait. No, 100 times. Yeah. We're like 80 times faster. And that, you know what? I'm pretty happy with that. I'm pretty happy with that. That's a, that's a perf game. All right. So now we're, we're already writing the world's fastest allocator. So that's great. <laughs> What about me, Mel? I don't care. It's going to be faster than all of these. <laughs> all these allocators are going to be uh, at least 50 times slower. The only thing that we could try is maybe bump below, like a bump allocator. But even that's not entirely fair. Uh... Keep in mind, uh, this doesn't need to be marked volatile. This code, these allocations cannot be optimized out. Whereas mine can. If I get rid of the volatile, then my stuff entirely gets optimized out. Oh, well, maybe not. 27 millis? Oh my god. Uh, well, we just gained a 10x, and I think it's still doing the allocations here. I bet it won't do the allocations if we say uh, LTO equals fat. Uh, code gen units is one. If we do this, it will probably optimize out and it will delete the allocations from even happening. Whereas allocations in C and C++ and a normal allocator will never get optimized out. Uh, 4.7, three millis. Okay, let's see what code we got. Cause I don't think that got optimized out. We're now on B3F. Let's see what kind of code gen we have now. Let's see. Why is it faster with free? Because it uses less memory and it doesn't have to grow the allocator region. Test. Oh, shit. How are we going to find this function now? Uh, how are we going to find the function? That's big num test. Run test. Did it did it do what I think it did? No, this is run test. I don't think this is uh what did I call it? We're just gonna call this moose waffle. And can I uh can I no mangle this so it shows up better? I don't know if you can no mangle a test. Search for print and work backwards. Now it should be good. Uh, I think no mango will always export it as well. I'm not 100% sure. What did we name that? Moose waffle? There it is. The fuck is this? What is this shit? It's actually calling the function? Well, that's terrible. What is this function? What even is this? I mean, maybe it's not terrible. It could be brilliant. Let's see. Where is this set up? What is it calling? This? What the fuck is this? I don't even know what it's doing. There's elapsed. 
I don't know what it's doing. <laughs> I don't know what it's doing. Anyways, mine can get optimized out, and uh, it has bump Bumpalo has a nice mascot. Bumpalo is pretty nice. Bumpalo is pretty cute. Unfortunately, it's also gonna be slow as shit. It'll be it'll be faster than uh, LibC, but it won't it won't be as fast as mine. I can tell you that much. So I don't even know. Like LTO is even hurting us here. It seems. Two hundred sixty five milliseconds. It's pretty good. Uh, bump dot Alec. Okay, let's try. Let's try Bumpalo. Uh, cargo new bin bump alo bench. Source this. Uh, I guess we pull in. This is their trait. Then we create an arena. And then we do bump dot alloc, and we do this. Uh, this we do it a, a ten twenty four times. Let's see a bump. Let's try and make it as fair as possible. Let's see if there's a bump dot clear. Bump dot reset. Reset the bump allocator. Sweet. So we'll make a bump allocator outside. So we create it once. And is there a with capacity? Perfect. Well, that's not. F oh, I do with capacity. Uh, 1024 times 1024. So now it's fair, because I I do that. I make the I make it outside the loop. Then we'll reset it. Bump dot reset. Let's see what happens here. Um, and then for blah in zero 1024 1024, we'll do bump dot. Uh, how do I do this, Alec? Alloc an object in this bump and return an exclusive reference to it. That's exactly what I'm doing. Alloc, and then we'll give it a 5u8. Right, so now that's the same operation. Uh... And Bumpalo should be pretty fast, right? Uh, but I don't think it will join allocations like mine can. The font is a little small. I can't really go smaller than this without massive, massive sacrificing of usability. I barely even fit 80 characters on this. This is already like miserable. Hard to read on a phone? Yeah, it's just gonna be like that, sorry. This stream is optimized for desktop viewers, unfortunately. But, like, if I were to code on something where I can't do this split, it would be miserable. And this still is not fair. So now that will, that will give us an allocation. Let elk is equal to this. Unsafe core pointer read volatile of elk. And that's what I'm doing, right? I allocate 5u8 in that region. I reset the region 1024 times which I do in here as well. Uh, I read volatile to read the value after I get a reference to it. And so now this is a very, very, very fair comparison. Uh, let IT, where do I start my timer? After I create the pool. Uh, standard time instant now. IT elapse, right? So this is now the identical code. Even down to the semantics of when we're resetting, it's also identical with the semantics of uh, that free, basically, or resetting that pool and freeing those objects. Okay. Okay, thank God, we're faster. All right, and we're almost, we're almost 10 times faster. And yeah, I have no other flags on here. I'm, th it's the exact same code on both. So yeah, we're even 10 times faster than Bumpalo. Uh, and we can give this, uh, we'll give this profile release, debug is true. So we can get symbols and then we'll just, uh, we'll be able to look at this code gen. Ida64 targets 
release bumpalo bench. Okay, so now we get to see what they do, and they probably have a call in the in the hot loop. How did it go with the last stream with the video encoding? We didn't really do anything with it. We were mainly looking around. I don't really have time for project like that. I can't say I really give a shit. Like I would love, I would love to improve this stream. I'd love to make it 60 FPS. I'd love to re, uh, reduce my CPU usage. I'd love to record as well as stream. Uh, but we're this is what we get. Okay, let's find that hot loop. And here it is. Right here. So here's the hot loop now. This is the uh This is the 1024 loop. So we have the outside loop. Here's the reset call. There's that move. And then here it does an alloc of uh, one by one. So one alignment, one size, technically opposite. It actually, yeah, there's a call, there's conditional branches, there's a bunch of stuff. And that is exactly why mine is, uh, mine is almost 10 times faster. Right? Hacker tool alert. What? That's illegal. We don't hack, okay? There's no hacking here. I'm waiting for my ice cream to thaw. I had it in the freezer. Alec layout slow. Yeah, monkas. Yeah, look at this. Look at this. Gross. I'm guessing this is the hot path right here. This, it does a bounce check. And then here's success. RDI. No, that's fail. Wow. So this is the fast path is this. Yeah, that's garbage. That's garbage. Right? So that's why we're 10 times faster. I'm surprised it's only 10 times faster. But anyways, we're 10 times faster than Bumpalo. And I don't think anyone can come up with a faster thing than that. Did you try Alec, Alec layout really fast? So the reason why no one's going to outperform it. Actually, I'm really curious. Let's try. Let's try um, Rust Flags. C target CPU is native. Oh my god, that got faster. Oh, that might have been a fluke. I don't want to repair. I want to reload the file. And you can't disassemble that. That's not the file I'm trying to disassemble. Yeah, it is broken right now. That's so fucking stupid. Uh, cargo clean. We'll just clean it just so we remove that database because I know it's in te uh, target. But yeah, I just just literally broken right now. Sick. Just can't. You can't reload a file. Uh, and that's not no mangle anymore. That's okay. Test. Let's see what we got now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you're gonna you're gonna struggle to beat this hot loop. <laughs> so we loaded RCX up. That's gonna be yep, 505, 505, 505. So we load a register with a constant, and then we initialize eight byte at a time. And then this is literally just the the reason we have all these byte reads. Like here we initialize all eight allocations in one instruction, even though they're eight independent allocations whereas bumpalo has to call a function eight times and then we're just loading them and that was just how we got it to not optimize out but let's see if we remove that let's see what happens here uh, let's see what code gen we get now a hot loop more like fire loop hell yeah any learning recommend uh resources uh just have a lot of projects man just have a lot of projects question everything assume that all code sucks because it does like, it's not even assuming, it's just, you're just being correct at that point. Uh, test. Come on, come on. Oh, 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 okay, I see. That would make sense. So it just removes the allocations entirely and replaces them with a loop of mem sets. <laughs> <laughs> yep 
Yeah, so I guess we are actually, uh, what is that? 27 millis? This was 2.6. So we're 100 times faster than a bump allocator? Yeah. <sighs> yeah. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> well, if there's no allocation, maybe it's not an allocator. I don't think it matters much for a real program. Libc would uh would be even much slower with freeze and fragmentation. So I guess using bumpalo in real programs wouldn't slow down the programs much, uh, because fixed time low offset per allocation. Yeah. What is this raspberry? This is good. I've never had raspberry. Mmm. God, that slaps. So, yeah. Um, how well do you think my allocator optimizes, chat? Do you think I can say this is the world's fastest allocator, given we're uh, 100 times faster than a bump allocator? <laughs> The Raspberry Claws rule? Yeah. Who checks what they're drinking after they start drinking it? Well, it's a surprise. All right. So, yeah, I don't think there's really any reason to do more benchmarking here. Um, here, we can make a little image here quick. Um, <laughs> I don't need a man, I need a let's make a let's make a little hype image uh okay and then i'll put this up here and then yeah something like that okay good and we'll do a screenshot and then we'll just say we'll make a tweet deal with that faster than je malik and tc yeah we're probably a thousand times faster than those <laughs> uh rates how well my allocator optimizes mm -hmm. there we go and here you go here's a duck for you <laughs> Ray, how well my allocator <laughs> that's pretty fucking good i'm gotta say Pretty proud of that one. Yeah. <laughs> you should get a duck. Can it free though? I am freeing. I'm freeing 1,024 times. I dumped the whole thing, right? It's literally the same as Bumpalo. Absolutely, I can free. That's what it, it's designed. It's, it is literally designed to free faster. It, it is designed around freeze being very 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 fast but yeah it absolutely freeze you can tell by the way it mem sets the it mem sets the uh one meg each time <laughs> god that's hot that's so hot that's so fucking hot <laughs> duck oh beautiful Beautiful. All right, Chad. You want to learn how the how this allocator is so fucking good? 
and also safe somehow. Is it faster than the Mac OS system allocator? It's written by a trillion dollar company. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I'm I'm sure that trillion dollar company has uh, some some great code written by the engineers with four years of experience before they're forced to go into management for any promotional uh, ability. Nothing like a classic 26 year old that's the peak of your technical capabilities because everyone else is a manager. Is it up on GitHub? No, it's not. Nah. Is this a suitable replacement for Malik? No. It is a bump allocator. And since it's a bump allocator, um, uh, since it's a bump allocator, you would have to use it like a bump allocator, right? So, yeah, anywhere that you could use a bump allocator, which is arguably any... Oh, I got a, I got a message from Squishable. <laughs> Wait, Squishable gives me, like, text updates. Great to meet you. I'll drop you secret notes every once in a while about all kind of new release. Oh, oh, I see. I got subscribed. You know what? That's one of the few things that I'm okay with being subscribed to. Uh, you can tell me about all the new squishables as they come out. <laughs> Mosa never puts anything on GitHub because most of its toy implementations are specific to his use case. Uh... And then he feels bad when people write pull requests that he doesn't merge. Yeah, I do. I do feel bad when I do that. I like your new hat. Hell yeah! I bet no one has touched D the Darwin Alec in twenty years. But wouldn't the Darwin Alec uh, evolve on its own? Uh, sorry, you're not allowed to see the Macos allocator code. That's part of the, the Delta Alpha team. They have top black clear. Oh my God. Yeah. Apple's so bad about that. Shut it down. Hey, Mr. Bite, Mr. Bite, Mr. Bite. Can you give us 444 support for stream so we don't have color loss so I can stream in 1080p instead of 4k? You, you missed the stream, but let me, who has the link? Who has the link? Uh, uh, we got, we gotta, we gotta carpe this DM while we have admins here. Uh, uh, ba, 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 ba. uh, there we go. Okay. 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 This is why we need 444 support. This is why we're streaming in 4k, even though I'm on a 1080p monitor. Look how good it looks on the right. That is nothing to do with bitrate. That is entirely to do with the fact that 444 would be way better. But we're emulating 444 by streaming in 4K at 420. 420 Blaze it. The link to the past? Ter terrible game. Fucking God. I hate Zelda. Zelda's the worst. He, he is the worst playable character in a game. This is why we need 444 support. Stream immediately crashes. <laughs> Rip. All right. All right. Um, colorblind. Yeah, I've literally never played it. <laughs> You're going to scare off the admins uh, from talking in your chat. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we're just, we're just. We're just gonna simp for the admins here. We'll do a hot tub stream for the Twitch admins. Poor, uh, poor Prince, Prince Link. Yeah. Or Princess Link. Yeah. Link is the princess. Zelda is the main character. Duh. What does that promote button do? Uh, it allows me to promote things. I've done that with some shit posts before because it's hilarious. I love advertising my shit posts. But then some people got pretty mad at me for doing that. Apparently people don't like when I when I make fake Ode and then promote it so it gets so it gets forcibly pushed to people's feeds. 444 would be great. Uh chroma subsampling is sucky for text. Yeah, it's really bad for us programming streamers. And we're probably putting more load on Twitch by having to stream in 4K. So technically we're trying to save you some bits. 
Um, you know? Because I could totally stream in 1080p 60 444. That would be amazing. But yeah, chroma subsampling is some hot shit. It's a genius move. What is? Twitch chat? Are you saying Twitch chat is genius? I think Twitch chat is very intelligent. <laughs> All right, chat. Let's go on a little adventure. <laughs> Promote joke news. Yeah. 4K 420 versus 1080p 444 at the same uh, bits per pixel is only 20% bigger? Really? I guess that makes sense if it's upscaled. Nobody promotes news that isn't true. That would be illegal. Yes. That is exactly how that we... Why are you decoling? No decolons. Uh, let's go to... Uh, uh, whack em rotate. Uh, LF. Still waiting for the freedom phone hack? Yeah, that was getting too real, so we had to stop it. Uh, Krita. Oh, we got a cap in here. Okay, let's do this in 4K. Okay. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to we're going to do a quick I think we'll do a dark dark mode. Yeah, we'll do dark mode. And then we'll do hacker green. What color is hacker green? What's the hex for hacker green? Krita mask got so cute. Yeah, they're always so cute. Uh, what's hacker green? People demand pipeline diagrams. Uh, it's like this territory. Geek at work, I'm so close to banning you for that, for that fucking remark. Jesus Christ. Uh, okay, we got two votes on 20C20E. YouTube still gives me ads where I can win $10,000 if I join a Ponzi scheme? Yeah, why haven't you invested in my coin? Okay. Uh, okay, let's see. Let's, uh, let's, uh, let's test this out. What we're gonna do is we're gonna do a quick test of this, and what we're gonna do is we're gonna just draw... Uh, we're gonna draw a brain cell, or just the brain of a Twitch, Twitch chat. Okay, good. Good. Yeah. Uh, this is working pretty well. I think that's great. That looks, yeah. Yep. That looks about like the neural activity of a Twitch chat. Uh, okay, let's do this. We'll put that on a new layer and lock it. Pop, lock, and drop it. We go to this. Yep. Nice. Okay. All right. <laughs> Why are you decoling? No decolons. Okay. Let's get a, let's get a, this, get a smile. Chat, smile. Smartest singular brain cell. Well, the thing is, each Twitch chatter is one neuron, so the collective Twitch chat can do some basic mental math. <laughs> I've, I've seen Twitch chat plays Pokemon. Is camera desynced? Yeah, it looks like it is. What do I do, turn it off and back on again? Yeah, something seems desynced, but uh, that's just the way it goes, I guess. One neuron seems like an overestimate. The hive mind swag. All right, so... No more flute? Oh, yeah, there is no more flute. That's a throwback. What is that D colon? That's not even a D. That's a... What is that? Let's figure out what this character is. That's a... It's a tha? A, that's a Canadian Aboriginal syllabics.
Ah. Huh. huh. Okay. It's transcribed as the. The. So that's a, that's a the colon. I see. <laughs> uh, you're the lucky one, uh, Gamozo. I have seen Twitch chat trolls install Arch Linux. Is that, was that a thing? Did someone do Twitch chat installs Arch? We should do Twitch that chat installs Gen 2. Hey, Julian, thank you so much for the, for the seven months of support. Hell yeah. You know, generics and Golang? Yeah, Golang just sucks, man. It has a garbage collector. That doesn't sound real. They did Gen 2? Wow, that's pretty good. How did they get through, uh, how did they get through disk? Twitch plays Ponable was a great CTF. Oh, there's another D uh, uh, sorry, a the colon, a colon the. I only use real operating systems. Sorry, I won't move from my Hannah Montana Linux. Hey, nothing wrong with Hannah Montana Linux. Okay, was I actually going to draw a diagram or was I just going to write code? Uh, okay, so basically the way that this works, uh, Twitch chat writes hello world. In what language? <laughs> Probably just using a DOS header and spamming enter. Next, they'll do Temple OS. Hmm. We need to make a... We need to make a... a what's the Reddit April Fool's thing? The place? Is it the place? We need to make the place, but each... Each pixel is a... Is a byte. And then it's like Twitch makes shell code. Twitch produces executable x86 code. <laughs> Are you using Tmux? No, nah, Tmux is for, for losers who don't use a mouse. Did the mask for the data rate? For uh, 1260p, we'll have twice the raw YUV frame data. But as it compress, it should compress pretty well. Oh, there's that D colon. <laughs> <laughs> Why is my stream so behind? Uh, what is a good terminal emulator for high res screens? <laughs> I mean, the cynic in me wants to say none. Uh, but I use Xterm and it's totally fine. Like, even if I do big font, right? It looks fine. It's really just a matter of the font that you use. Um, but I don't know. It, Xterm works fine with uh, this. I can even go to small font. And really, all these font sizes look fine. Like, this is massive, and it still looks fine. It's acceptable. No, you look fine. Winky face. <laughs> Simp. <laughs> You're just a bit X. A, a bit X. A bit X. You're just a bit, you're just a bit X. I don't know what your name is, sir, sire, madame. Uh, the Rust Hello World is ugly. It has a macro in it. Dude, Rust macros are hot as shit. Maybe it's a problem with VMware. Oh, interesting. Hmm. I haven't used VMware for a long time. I used Hyper-V when I was on Windows, and then I would use KVM, Kimu KVM on uh, Linux now. Bitter X? A bitter X. Is Rust Hello World smaller than Java's? Yes. Yeah, I mean that's a hard that's a hard statement, but Rust Hello's world is pretty small, although Rust format code is really bad. Wait, did you just say standard C out is so much better? Yeah, that's gonna be a that's gonna be a moderation right here. We're gonna just Yeah. Yeah, we're just gonna I'm just gonna Just gonna erase that one. Yeah, if you like if you like stream syntax in C, you're literally a communist. <laughs> it's fucking gross, dude. <laughs> let me let me use the fucking less than symbols uh to move around things and then I'll I'll call into standard colon colon 
format colon 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 and colon colon namespace colon colon so I can format a string so that uh, we only have one sig fig instead of three million. Ho 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 ho. STL is well designed and has no flaws. Using your mod powers for good, exactly. That's what we're here for. What's gross about communism? I mean, clearly everything, right? Like, communism is just evil. It's bad, it's red, it's bad, it's not American, and it's bad, okay? Pfft. And don't forget Endel. <laughs> God. I can't believe that design. What what was Bjorn on when he designed that garbage ass format library? Like, I could see you making that stream API if printf didn't exist, but printf already existed since then. Sound argument? Exactly. Exactly, right? It is a perfectly sound argument. It's for my education that I've gotten in the US. Really no reason to debate beyond that. Um, Americans have no idea what communism is? No, we have completely understand what communism is. Uh, hmm. Hmm. Wait, what happened to all those countries that tried to go communist again? Hmm. Seems like America really understood communism quite well because, because, uh, yeah, it seems like America kind of ran those countries. <laughs> Fourth of July, Eagle Screech. <laughs> they have no consistency. I mean, do any C++ programmers have consistency? Yeah. Yeah, it seems like maybe you don't understand communism because I'm pretty sure America ran or at least, uh, what is it called? Uh, occupied nearly every country that went communist. So maybe it's you that don't understand communism. I'm pretty sure communism is just a gateway drug to, uh, getting democracy delivered to you from the skies. <laughs> USA number one. <laughs> Oh, uh, what is this C out blah bullshit about? I never understood why C++ uh, needed an entire set of operators for that. Well, uh, I mean, it didn't run them into the ground. Yeah, communist doesn't seem, communism doesn't seem very successful. It always seems to end in uh, poverty and being bombed and invaded. So honestly, it doesn't seem like a great government system. <laughs> <laughs> you made me do this stop hitting yourself usa probably yeah see it's terrible what a terrible government system that totally isn't just shut down at the first opportunity by the u.s government are you a socialist no not really sorry but this is extremely ignorant See, the fact that you can't understand that we are completely making fun of the U.S. the entire time we're saying this shows that you're really not in the right state of mind for this uh, discussion. Um, yeah. I think, uh, I think you're struggling to understand what we're saying here. My man doesn't understand jokes. Hey, it's okay. It's okay. What do we really understand? Do we really expect communists to have brains? <laughs> I assume the worst, not gonna lie. I mean, to be honest, yeah, it's pretty fair for most Americans. See, the thing is, making fun of Americans is also like ironically in style right now. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone who rages about the US online has a double digit IQ. Yeah, they clearly didn't go to American schools to get big brains. <laughs> We're just memeing on you, DF. I I I we uh, we probably understand the points that you that you have here. We've probably heard them. 
we probably agree with them in some ways and disagree with them in other ways. Um, we should go back to sortish sortition, like like bubble sort or like merge sort. The ones that did go to American schools didn't make it. I mean, I don't know if that's a really dank joke, but a lot of people don't. A lot of uh, a lot of ki a lot of kids don't make it out of American schools. If I'm being honest. <laughs> oh God! Oh God. <laughs> Jesus Christ! <laughs> I asked too soon, but it's every week. Yeah, yeah. I was just telling a friend that I like really wanted to. I've wanted to get an AR for a long time because I just think they're interesting engineering devices. But I really don't want to go into a gun store and buy a gun when it seems like I'm maybe doing it as a panic buying thing or as a political statement. But the problem is, yeah, that's pretty much every week. <laughs> so, like, I really don't want to go in and be like, oh, I want this and not have a great reason other than I think it's a really cool piece of, like, machinery and manufacturing. Uh, without seeming like I'm going there to like panic buy, but yeah, at this point you can't really. There's really not a time where it's not panic buying. <laughs> there's some shootings a day. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah, it was a Fourth of July shooting, I think. Memeing pretty close to the sun. Yeah. Well, the thing is, when it becomes consistent enough, uh, too soon no longer applies. Like, too soon applies to events, not to a way of life, right? And that's where it becomes very difficult. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Way too tank. Yep. Too far. I know. I know. It's, uh, it's tough. It's tough, but uh, it's a coping mechanism. Why doesn't Rust have 128-bit floats? Uh, C has them? Does C have them? Where does C have 128 bit floats? What? Really? I don't think I've seen 128 bit floats in C. In America, we already have the majority of uh, Marx's goals implemented. Oh my fucking God. Jesus Christ. Chad is a little too dank today. Uh. Double double? It's like the onion article about school shootings that they just update the date and the location every time it happens. Yeah. Yeah. Uh people that go arms blazing don't have a license for said arms. That's usually not true in the US. C floats are 80 extended, yes. I'm familiar with 80-bit floats, which is the dumbest thing on the planet Earth. All right, chat. Let's go. Uh, let's let's check my clout. Uh, yeah, it's, it's doing great. Okay. Um, all right. So basically, I've been working on this allocator for a couple months now, and this allocator is specifically designed for mutational fuzzing. Uh, so raise your hand if you know what mutational fuzzing is. Uh, great, because we're not going to explain it. Uh, okay, so basically the goal is to have an allocator that is designed specifically for what I do. And it follows this pattern exactly. Uh, <laughs> sorry, you're just a bit... Get fucked. Uh, <laughs> so basically the goal is to have an allocator where I very quickly can parse structured data like serialized data let's imagine we're like parsing a network protocol uh so the the theory here is that i would have basically i would do this like lp accessor this local pool and when i am deserializing an object i will deserialize it into the local pool that's like super fast super local you saw the optimizations you're just not going to get faster than that I can get those like combining allocations while deserializing and doing crazy shit like that. So the goal is the correct like usage of this. Um, someone needs to make a variant of that onion article titled No Way to Stop This From Happening. Says only programming language where this regularly happens. Yikes. Yikes. 
too real, Gasubra land. <laughs> uh, can someone make that image? I'll tweet it out. Someone, someone make the onion article image and I don't know, put some rust crabs on it and, uh, I don't know, put some sea stuff and then maybe some like, uh, some deep fr fried CVEs in the background. I'll, I'll tweet that out. Sounds like a good image. <laughs> Anyways, so the way this is designed to be used is not a benchmark, right? The benchmark's not really realistic, um, but it shows the strengths of this allocator. Outsourcing your memeing? Yeah, I'm a, a dude. I okay. Defunct. Here's where you need to get it through your thick skull. Okay. I am an influencer. Bow to me, bitch. Okay? All right? I control this chat. I control this stream. I advertise. Fuck, it was going to be way funnier for it. Uh, what is it called? Uh, mm. Raid Shadow Legends! Fuck! <laughs> like and subscribe. <laughs> Does that mean we're under the influence? Yes. Yes. Exposure. Yes, you're all getting paid in exposure. <laughs> all right. So basically the design of this language. So there's a... Unlike Intel Dumbest Extended 80... Wait, did you, did you say Intel is dumb? How, how can Intel be dumb if Intel stands for intelligence? Got him. NordVPN when? Dollar shave crab. Is that audio out of sync? It probably is. I forget what we did to fix that. What was the trick that we would do to fix that? Um... Is it that? No. There was something we'd always do to fix it. Test. Oh, there it is. Now it's synced. Yep. There you go. You just switch the source and switch it back. OBS. Flute always fixed it. Flute was perfect, man. Intel is smart. They invented computers in 1995 in cooperation with Microsoft. That... You really can't get more accurate than that. Yup, that did it. Yeah, did it. Did it. Died it. Um, make your website beautiful with eight, eight with over 80 identical templates on Square's face. Oh, <laughs> uh, I can't wait to shill out for NordVPN and pretend that VPNs do anything to, for your security. Localize all of your traffic. Are you sick of your traffic having to be intercepted at eight different ISP endpoints? Well, move it all to one location that is nicely cooperative with the NSA. Cut down on all those duplications of your traffic. Put it in one nice, friendly, convenient location. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> ah. They do give the government easy access. Yeah, I mean, that's like, uh, they're not, you know, you know. <laughs> Fiber taps are expensive. Can you blame them? Exactly. Okay. Anyways. So these pools, we set up these little pools here. So we got the NUMA pool. That's like the global pool that shared. So the NUMA pool is designed for many, 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 many cores to share and to optimize. Um, optimize for basically shared access. And the way that works is you give it a size in bytes, the size of the pool, and then you give it a number of nodes. So you can give it one node, you can give it four nodes, you give it the number of nodes that you have on your system. And when you allocate things in the NUMA pool, they are cloned, 
they are copied to each node. So if you have four nodes on your system, you set that to four, you allocate something in the NUMA pool, you actually get four copies of that. So technically, this is allocating size times one or size times four. And that is to get memory and those common data structures that you're accessing in a shared pool that's node local to really optimize for that memory bandwidth and latency. I haven't heard this song in 10 years. This song hasn't heard you in 10 years. Got him! <laughs> Region lock content is a ploy by the government to drive users to VPNs. That's pretty accurate, I think. I don't think that's wrong. That's big VPN right there. Lobbying to governments. <laughs> Typical. Okay. So that's the NUMA pool. And then you have the local pool. And the local pool has a different size. In this case, we're using the same size for both. But the local pool is kind of where you do like very temporary allocations. So if you think about it this way, you can never free objects from the NUMA pool. The NUMA pool objects never get freed, ever. So that means that you want to be cautious about when you push things to the NUMA pool. We call that globalizing. Uh, we name it after the globalists. Um, so we globalize things by pushing them from the local pool to the NUMA pool. The local pool is meant for very short temporary accesses where you blow away all the objects in one go. Okay. Uh, I do remember, and I want to stress it, there's a guy that offered a free proxy. Staying in the toss, they log everything and will share it with the public. <laughs> oh, that's fucking great. <laughs> the Illuminati. The globalists, they're turning our frogs gay. They're turning our rusts, our rust crabs gay. <laughs> okay, so anyways, on the outside, you're always going to make a NUMA pool and a local pool. The size of those pools, you don't pass in as a parameter. You pass those, as, you pass those in as the generic parameters. So, uh, you just call me a hoe? Yo, rude, D colon, can we get some D colons in chat for being called a hoe? That's kind of fucked up. Rude. All right. Jeez. Uh. <laughs> the music video for the song has Tom Hanks doing the singing part. Yeah, I know, right? They're like in a car or something. Uh, yeah, it's a great video. Dude, Carly Rae Jepsen's underrated, man. This is a great album. Okay. So, anyways. Uh, we have that the new pool and the local pool. And the way this, this works is you get an accessor to the NUMA pool. And when you get an accessor to it, you get an accessor specifically uh, to the node you request. So here I could say I want access to node 1. Uh, this then gives you an accessor to that such that you don't have to dynamically look up every time you access things. So it's kind of a shortcut such that NA, even though when you do like NA.new 5U8, this is going to push to all the nodes. But when I do NA.getElk, when I get the, uh, the result of this, so I make this allocation and then I look it up in this pool, um, this is now going to give me the pointer to my... Numa node, that Numa node one in this case. Have you heard the Carly Rae Jepsen uh, Nin mashup? No, I haven't. Probably pretty good. Almost as good as the perfect drug Shake It Off mashup. Shake It Off had really good mashups. I don't know why. Something about that song's thing. Okay. So then, uh, when we make a local pools accessor, we pass in the NUMA allocation, and that is because, and this is where we get really fancy chat. So here's, let's make an example. We'll say struct moose, and this is a foo, which is a NUMA ref uh, ID. So I say ID, this is the tag of the pool, and a U32. And then we can say derive uh, deserialize here, and I think we have to say poolable as well. Let's see what happens here. Uh, cargo tests. No capture. We don't need a debug build here. And then numeref we'll just do uh, use crate star. Hopefully this pulls in everything. 
The Shake It Off music video and Perfect Drug music video were directed by the same person. Ooh, interesting. Uh, and then I got to pull these in, I think, explicitly. Uh... Those are from the proc macros. These are from um, Alicado uh, proc macro. Uh yeah okay it's uh, the it's my proc macro okay it's my pro my proc macro is a little weird all right uh anyways a numeref is an actual allocation so what we can do here is we can perform an allocation let x is equal to this and we can say uh uh local accessor new five u eight unwrap right because that can return a failure if you run out of allocation space. And we have to pull that in. Use create star. All right. Um, so in this case, we don't have an ID here. Let's do an anonymous lifetime here. And uh, probably should I say 5U32. That would make more sense. So here, basically, this is a reference to memory, right? This is a pointer. Now, what's interesting about that pointer, if we go into the code, we'll do cargo doc... How do you do private items again? Uh, cargo doc, document private items. Okay, that would make sense. And then open. So we can take a look, see at what the API looks like. Okay. And let's see if this uh, dark mode holds, but I don't think it will. Nope, it doesn't because it's a local file. It's so stupid. Anyways, so here's kind of the whole, uh, the whole crate here. Um, was the last project finished? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we totally finished that. <laughs> no, we didn't do shit. Okay, so the main entry point is this NUMA pool. This is the top level pool allocator. You give it a size and a number of nodes. Inside of that structure, it has a box of maybe uninit, unsafe cells, node data sizes. And a node data in this case, if we take a look at node data, we'll find that node data is just hard. It's a strictly aligned uh, slice of size bytes. So this is required to basically make sure that these bytes are correctly aligned since we need to be able to return allocations that have the same alignment between multiple pools. So that's kind of that's basically where all of these objects are stored. And then in use, there's this atomic use size, which allows us to atomically allocate and reserve space in the in these nodes. And this in use is for all of these nodes. So even though we have, let's say, four nodes, when you increment this, you reserve space in all four of those nodes as storage, uh, which is pretty neat. Uh, I, too, have unfinished pro projects. Oh, no, I, I've never unfinished a project. They're just paused, okay? So uh, from that NUMA pool, we get a local accessor, and I think we have actually really good documentation. So NUMA pool. We have two functions. We have new, which creates the NUMA pool, and then we have accessor. And this accessor does crazy shit with invariant lifetimes that... God, I really don't want to cover invariant lifetimes, but I think we're going to have to talk about invariant lifetimes, chat. Uh, it's called Agile Development. No, Agile Development is where you just make a bunch of content for slides for managers, but you don't actually produce any code. Yeah, it's just, it's just agile slide development. <laughs> so, um, basically, does that make sense? We have a pool. You give it a size and a number of nodes. It pre-allocates that many slices for that many nodes with that size, and then sets in use to zero. <laughs> Those slides look great, though. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so new creates that pool. It just creates that empty. We can go look at the code there. Source uh, Numa pool. And this is an insert only. There's no freeze. There's no moving of objects. So new, this is going to make sure that the size of node data size matches size. This basically makes sure that it's a transparent structure, which is important. 
Uh, let's double click on. Oh, let's circle back to that. Then uh, we assert that the alignment of that node data matches that. Once again, these will get compiled out. Like this code does not exist. This is just to really, really hammer home that those uh, structures have the exact shape that we expect since we're about to do some weird pointery stuff. Then for each, for each element of that array, for each node, we create a new uninitialized box. So the allocation is very cheap. We don't initialize, we don't zero it out, we just set it. And then we set the number of in-use bytes inside that allocator. We set it to zero. What's a transparent structure? A transparent structure is a structure that is identical as a structure as the single component inside of it. Um, basically, like, uh, if you were to tra repr transparent on a U8, a structure that holds a U8, that means that the entire structure has the exact same shape, alignment, layout, everything, as a U8 itself. Um, so it's only useful for things that only have one field in a structure. So then we have this accessor here, and this is where all the fun really starts. And the fun particularly starts here on this 4ID syntax. So from a NUMA pool, which, which we mark as send and sync, uh, actually specifically just sync. So we mark a NUMA pool as sync, that means that we're able to share that across different threads, which means that with this, this accessor, this allows us to get access to an accessor to that pool on multiple threads in parallel. So, so far, everything is thread safe and has to be designed as such. Um, then you give it the node, and this is the node that you want an accessor to. So you're basically subscribing. You're saying, I am this node. Usually this requires going to the OS or it's a non-zero cost to determine what node you're on. We're basically only taking that argument in so that we can get rid of one layer of indirection. Um, and that is right here. That is basically, we pre-validate that that node is a valid node, it's inbounds, we get that node and we store a pointer to that node in the NUMA accessor such that when we access things in the pool, we don't have to go through a table of nodes, we just directly index a pointer in DREF. Then we have the pool itself, so we include self in this accessor, and then we have the marker. Now you'll see that this is a closure, and this has a very, very, very unique in uh, syntax. So this does an impl for id, and what this is doing is this is creating a new lifetime. This is one of the only places that you can create a lifetime in Rust like this. So we're creating a lifetime called id, and you're gonna see that a lot in our code. Uh, what would happen if you have two accessors with the same node number? It's fine. Remember, this is a read-only data structure. For It's an insert-only, read-only data structure, which means that you can insert into it, which means that whichever accessor you use is fine. It, this is intended that you have multiple accessors to the same node. Uh, that does not give you any exclusivity. This node is only specifying your locality to the data you're accessing. It allows you to pre-compute the distance between you and that memory such that you can access it without having to like check that every time you access data. Um, so then this calls the closure F and that creates this new lifetime ID. And this closure is a, a, uh, it's a closure that is called only once right here, it's called once, and it takes, by, uh, by move, it takes a NUMA accessor. So we create a new NUMA accessor and we pass it into that closure. And that means that that NUMA accessor is only accessible to that accessor in that closure. And we have tagged that NUMA accessor with that ID, with an invariant lifetime, and we'll get into what that means in a second, because it's fucking crazy. Um, then we have the NUMA accessor itself. Uh, this is basically what you use to actually operate on the data to get things, to push things into this uh, thing. So you have a reference. This is just, this is just, this data, this pointer exists in the pool, but we remove a layer of indirection. We don't want to pass in that node ID every time. Doesn't matter. So uh, here's, here's a immutable access or an Im immutable reference to the NUMA pool and an immutable reference to the specific node that we pre-selected such that we get rid of that in direction. We don't have to index an array. We don't have to do a bounds check. We don't have to do any of that shit, right? 
Then we have this invariant reference here. This is what consumes that ID lifetime, and this is what makes all of this stuff work, and we'll get into that in a little bit once we get further. Um, so then we have this NUMA accessor here, and here's kind of all the functions that are implemented. They're the same between a local accessor and a NUMA accessor, basically the exact same code, slightly different. This one uses atomics because this one is thread safe. The local accessor is not thread safe and thus that one doesn't use atomics. The operations are a little bit cheaper and it supports mutable access to objects because you are the only thread that can access a local accessor. Um, so Alec Raw here, this basically you pass in a layout and you get an index into the pool that is that memory that was allocated. So what we do is we make sure that the alignment is a power of two. This is required by Rust, but I still assert this anyways. We then make sure that the alignment that you want does not exceed the maximum alignment that we support. So this is really, 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 really important. Since we have, let's say four nodes, four copies of this data, those four copies of the data will be allocated at different bases. So what we have to do, we can't do pointer math. Like a normal allocator will allocate and then align the pointer itself until a pointer is aligned. But remember, we have to have four different pointers that have the same alignment properties. And to do that, the only way we can do that is just by setting an alignment maximum and make sure that the data, those pools that we allocate in the back, all have that same alignment. So max align in this case is 4096. It's a page. That's just a good size for a, for an allocator. Makes sense for like virtual memory allocations and stuff. So we cannot have alignments of objects exceed that because we cannot guarantee an alignment that is uh, larger than that of what we allocate the pool itself. We cannot do pointer math and align that because we're, we have four different pools at the same time. Then we compute the mask. This is safe. This can never underflow. It's always at least non-zero because th it's a power of two. There has to be at least, or specifically, one bit is set in the alignment. So we just subtract off one. That's going to give us a mask such that we can compute that alignment. Um, we then set an allocation base here to zero. So we start off at zero. We then do this fetch update, which is really cool. We do relaxed ordering here because none of this stuff matters until we put an object in a place where it is shared between a thread. So we will handle the memory barriers at that location. Right now, we're just atomically, we want to have exclusive access to this uh, in use, which is basically the number of bytes that have been consumed out of the pool. So we uh, align that up so we get access uh, we get temporary access, and this might loop. Internally in Rust, this might loop a couple times if we lose this race. This is basically a um, LLSC primitive, a, a load, load link store conditional primitive um, in software. So Rust will make this work on x86 and every architecture with Atomics. Um, why assigned return value? What does a negative offset mean? It actually has a very specific meaning, and we will get to that uh, in a minute. Right now, we're not gonna, we won't get into that until we hit the local pool. So the idea is to have an unsynced uh, part sort of act like a TLS? Yes. Yeah, basically, all of the pointers in this code are these I sizes, which means that's why, uh, that's why those calls get optimized out. Like TLDR, the reason this allocator is so fast is literally because the pointers are not, um, they're not references. They are indices. And indices are deterministic. That means if you allocate a meg of one byte allocations in sequence, you will get the same indices for all of those allocations every single time you run the program. The second you return a reference or a pointer, the compiler can no longer reason about what that pointer could be. It can no longer reason about the fact that the pointer from the last allocation is just the pointer minus one because the pointer itself is it's basically a variable. If you think about it from like a symbolic execution perspective, that is, um, it is, uh, it's random, right? The compile, basically TLDR, when it comes to optimizations and the way the compiler has to treat pointers, anytime you get a pointer or a reference, 
the compiler effectively has to assume that that is a completely random value. And that is why even Bumpalo, which Bumpalo is not worse code than ours. Like, let's be honest, we're doing basically the exact same thing that Bumpalo is doing. The difference is we operate on indices, Bumpalo operates on pointers. And that means that those function calls to get those pointers, they are a hard, basically, if you think about it of like, um, of like you, your your program to an optimizer is kind of this tree where your your optimizer can let's say you have like a b and c right and let's say there's this invisible dotted line here and this is like where the first like variable comes in that the compiler can no longer prove so in this situation the compiler can join a b and c together it can initialize all of them it can optimize out branches and stuff inside this boundary right and in our situation this boundary right here this is the allocator like that allocator here the this boundary of unknownness unknowingness at the compiler level is the um it is above us right basically it means that using our library doesn't terminate the optimizer. I don't know if that makes any sense. It's like a really weird way of thinking about optimizers. Um, but think about it this way. Let's say B is Bumpalo. So like A is me, like the value I want to store, like the immediate value I want to store. And C is, uh, this is the value I want to read. And let's say B, this is the alloc itself. Now, Bumpalo, by nature of using a pointer, right? Let's say this is a, a pointer here. Bumpalo, or pretty much any allocator on the face of the earth, will then mean that this boundary here, the optimizer can no longer reason across. That means that you will never, ever see two allocation gets joined together. You'll never see like alloc4, alloc4, and then you write, you know, two four byte values to each of those, you'll never see that turn into an eight byte alloc with an eight byte write. And that is because your user code up here, right? This is your user code. This is the lowest level code that you can write as a user is basically making the call into like malloc. The nature of that ABI boundary terminates any optimizations across that point. That means that the compiler can no longer optimize A, B, and C together because it has to treat alloc as a black box, right? And that is exactly the problem here. So um, basically what we've done is we've moved this barrier above the allocator. And that is why you saw when we uh, took this little screenshot, um, uh, where the fuck was it? Here, so when we wrote this code that does 1,024 allocations of a, of a U8, which is initialized to five, the compiler literally turns that into memset because the compiler is able to see past that boundary, right? But when we went to Bumpalo, because we pulled up the Bumpalo test here and we wrote the exact same code. Right, the code that we wrote in Bumpalo has the identical semantics. It's 1024, uh, it's a meg inside, we allocate and initialize to a 5U8. We can get rid of that read volatile actually in this case, we're gonna do that. So it's a little bit more fair. So here it's the exact same code on both sides from this example, which is allocate a 5U8 initialized. And here you have that 5U8 here. Mine turned into a mem set and Bumpalo's, if you remember, uh, Bumpalo, and don't get me wrong, once again, Bumpalo is fantastic, Carly Queen, once again, Ida's just fucked. Uh, I'll probably make a ticket for that tonight. They'll fix that, like, same day. Um, so, if we look at Bumpalo, um, basically, we don't have to use a black box, we don't have to use volatiles, because the allocation call itself is effectively volatile from the perspective of, of the compiler. Uh, so whatever we name this, it's just main. So if we look at Bumpalo main, you'll see that here's that hot loop. So 
uh, in our case, it literally turned into, it unrolled the 1024 loop, that outside loop, into just mem set of one meg of five, right? Because that has the exact same sem semantics. However, in this case, in Bumpalo's case, even though we're doing the exact same code, this is a bump allocator. It can never free. That index can never go backwards. It's always doing the same thing every time. It's just writing fives to memory. But the compiler cannot see into that function. It cannot reason beyond that. And thus, that outside loop, here's the 1024 loop is right here. Uh, this line here that you can kind of see like get highlighted. There's that reset. Here's the loading of the one meg constants. And then inside of here, you see that there's a literal function call every time. This will never go away. There is nothing you can do by nature of returning a pointer. This function call has to exist in every situation. You can never omit this, which means that the level of which the compiler can optimize and join, uh, join allocations together to like basically create a structure out of just sequential different allocations that you do, um, it has to make this call. And you've effectively terminated optimization at a level that you don't have control of, right? Your code is up here, right above here, and the optimizations have already stopped by that level. There is nothing you can do. It's not your fault as a user. It's not something you can change as a dev. The nature of that API terminates the optimization. It's done. It, that function will never get removed. It never will. Um, okay. Um, so, anyways. So we'll get into the ISI stuff and, and stuff a little bit more as we get into it. No one's, no one's asked the hard question yet here because this fundamentally is broken. And, and we'll, we'll talk about how it's not broken. This allocator can only exist safely in Rust. You can write this allocator in C, but literally, I, I, I seriously mean this. I'm, I'm not memeing. This allocator cannot exist in C and C++. It just cannot. It cannot. This can only exist with lifetimes. And this is a situation... This is a very strong situation where I would say that literally C and C++ cannot be faster than Rust ever. You know, people say like, oh, Rust is a little bit slower because of the balance checks and stuff and, and blah, blah, blah. And theoretically, that's a little bit slower, right? Because you teach, tie each allocation to the ID lifetime. Yes. And you cannot do that in C and C++. You can do it on safely where basically people would have to do all of this perfectly. Every single allocation people would have to do perfectly and never make a mistake. But in Rust, we can actually make this data structure safely. And it's wild. So anyways, we have the alloc raw. That's probably basically the same thing as, as alloc layout slow. All we do is we make sure the alignment is seen. We get the mask. We atomically increments by our align mask. So we basically align up to the nearest boundary. This is the index. That's the internal index of what's been consumed. We align it up to the nearest boundary because we need to satisfy the alignment that was requested of us. We then compute the end of the allocation by adding the size of the allocation once we've already aligned it. Then we make sure that we have an uh, overflow. We actually do a check dad here, but we make sure that that value fits inside of a of the positive component of an eye size. Once again, we'll get into that in a minute. Um, and then um, we make sure that it's in bounds. We make sure that we didn't run out of space. If we didn't, we return sum. We return the end, which is that base. Uh, and we basically say, this is your allocation. Otherwise, we ran out of space. All of this stuff ends up collapsing here, where we get an allocation failure, and then here. So literally, the allocation in the atomic case, and remember, this is the shared model. The local model is even faster. The local model is, model is meant for very temporary accesses. The NUMA model is meant for persistent accesses where you use objects many, many, many times in the future. So 
This basically, all it does is it atomically rounds up that internal index to the nearest alignment boundary, make sure that the allocation can fit at that, at that index plus the size of the object. If it does, it returns the base. That's it. That is, that is the allocation. It's literally two adds and a couple checks and a couple compares, right? <clears throat> so the local lifetime is guaranteed to be the same for all Alex. We'll get into that in a minute. Uh, then we have init unchecked. So here's actually where we fill it in. This is unsafe because this takes a raw index and doesn't check it. Um, this is what's used like by the internal stuff. So the way that this works, once again, this takes a T. T's have to be poolable. Uh, we, need, we need a trait to make this safe. So poolable is the trait that we use. It basically means that this object is allowed to be stored on these pools. It also has to be copy. The reason that T has to be copy is because we initialize that value for each pool or for each node in the pool. So if you have four nodes, this will loop four times and it will write that value in by move four times. So it has to be copy. Otherwise, you can't like literally if I remove this, this code wouldn't even compile. It would just say uh, it would fail on the right. Let's see. Cargo test no capture. Yep. Value moved here in the previous iteration of the loop. So that is like compile time required. And you'll find that this code, there's a lot of stuff that you won't recognize here. Um, but a lot of stuff, though, a lot of the way that I've designed and shaped this code is meant such that if you remove something like that, it fails hard at compile time. It's really important. That's why this casting here is very long. This is literally just writing a value. It, all it does is it takes your node it adds that index to it, and then it writes to it. But all of this, even though this looks like it's doing math and operations, it actually isn't. But what I'm doing is I'm very, very, very strongly communicating to the compiler exactly what I'm doing. That is why I have an unsafe cell. That's why I have this node data. So here, I get access to the pointer and then maybe unin it. So, so far, we haven't actually done a reference or anything. We're only working the raw pointers. Then I do a raw get, which gets me a mutable pointer to the node data. Then I convert that using adder of mute, which once again, this doesn't perform a deref. Even though it does, this does some magic in the compiler where it doesn't perform a deref because that's undefined behavior because we haven't initialized this data yet. We cannot make a reference until this data is initialized. Then we convert this into a slice that is exactly the size of our object, right? This is not needed. Like this, or this is not needed here. I don't need to sub slice that slice to the size of a T. It's totally fine if I just have it indexed. But once again, I'm trying to very, very, very clearly communicate exactly what my intentions, what I plan on writing to the compiler. In this case, I'm saying I plan to write to pointer between index and index in the size of a T. I then get a pointer to the first element. So now I have a mute U8. I cast that to a mute T, which I know is guaranteed to, be, guaranteed to be aligned. Actually, this is unsafe. It has to be aligned based on the calling convention of this. So since it's unsafe, this isn't even pub, so a user can't even access this. Um, and then I initialize that data by writing to it. This is all correct. This will pass Miri. This is all the correct way. I correctly wrap, maybe uninit and unsafe cell in the correct order. I correctly do the raw gets. I correctly never create a temporary reference. I'm only working with raw pointers until I actually write the value. This write is the only part that requires, like this can be unaligned. That's totally fine. Pointers can be unaligned. References cannot. This write cannot be unaligned, but that I propagate up to the user for that control. Um, uh, let's see. Um, the lifetime tags remind me of ghost cells. Yes, this is very, very similar to ghost cell. This uses invariant lifetimes, which is the critical, critical aspect of it. I feel like the core principle of having more code that tells the compiler what you're doing and why, um, and why than code that describes operations that should be performed should be adopted in other languages. Yes. So basically I am babying the, I am babying the compiler, right? I am trying to communicate the, the more effectively I communicate my intentions to the compiler, the better it can reason about it. Right. And that's kind of what we're doing here. Um, this is all, all correct. 
basically TLDR, it will go through for each node, it will offset them by index and it will write the value T into it. That's it. Note that there are no conditional operations in here, none at all. So this for loop, you would think theoretically would be conditional because the number of nodes is conditional, but it's not. We use a const generic for the number of nodes. So you might be wondering, why don't you pass in a U size so the user can figure out how many nodes they have at, uh, at runtime? This is exactly why. This loop runs in constant time because the compiler can reason. It knows that this will iterate exactly nodes times. If this were dynamic and this were like for each node and nodes is a vec, then there's now a bounds check. There's a length check. This code actually has no branches. Even though it looks like it would have branches, this code has no branches. There's no conditions, there's no checks, there's no comparisons, there's no way this can ever fail. This unconditionally will always do the same operation every single time. And that is very important. Once again, the second you, you, every, every conditional you add, you make it harder and harder and harder for the compiler to reason about what your code is doing and optimize it. Okay, then we have new uninit here. So this calls alloc raw with layout. So it basically says, give me an index to memory that satisfies the layout requirements of a type T, right? This is all straightforward. This layout thing is actually part of Rust. This is a core Rust thing. This is not my own structure. So I basically say, give me an allocation that satisfies the requirements of, of a T. And then the question mark here will return if that allocation fails. And then if it succeeds, I return an uninit numeref that contains that index itself, which is an I size, and then an invariant ref, which then ties it to this allocator. And once again, we'll get into that in a minute, right? You're minimizing state explosion. Yes, it's very important. Um, a lot of this code is very delicately done. So this is an uninit numeref. Now an uninit numeref is actually exposed to a user. You'll see that this is a pub API. Um, and it's intended that users can get access to uninit numerefs. This allows you to allocate things that are uninitialized. And this is a write-only primitive. So Rust actually doesn't have the concept of write-only. Rust only has the immutable and mutable things, but all, it, all mutable things can be read from. This, we intentionally further reduce that, and we say this is a write-only thing, allowing us to return uninitialized data directly to the user in safe code. Um, then we have init here, and init is just a helper. So init, uh, you pass in the uninit numeref, you pass it in by move. It is critical that you pass it in there by move because once that value has been initialized, you cannot write to it again. Once again, this is a shared data structure. So it is not okay it is not okay to initialize a value twice because by the time it's been initialized once, the numeref has been created. That numeref could have been shared between threads and there could be threads accessing this. So it is a write once value and we maintain that write once uh, property at compile time by making sure that you delete the existence of that uninit numeref when you initialize it itself. Then you pass in the value. T has to be poolable, T has to be poolable for all of these APIs. And then it also has to be copy once again, because when we do init unchecked, that requires copy. And if we get rid of this, this will complain with a compile time failure of T needs to be copy for that init unchecked. So all the way up the stack, that is verified at compile time very strictly. So all it does is this unsafely calls init unchecked on that index. So you'll notice I don't check that that index is in bounds or safe or correct or anything. Uh, I don't validate that it's from this pool or anything. All I do is I just write to that value. So I unsafely, remember, init unchecked, unconditionally, no bounds checks, no comparisons, nothing. Unconditionally, this is just going to write that object at that index. But this is a safe function. And we've made this entire thing safe. Even though there's no checks, not at all. It's still safe. Um, then we return a numeref. So once that uninif, uninit root numeref has been consumed, that then turns into a numeref. It's the exact same index as the uninit numeref because the object hasn't moved or anything. And we return a numeref to that object. 
Then we have new. This is uh, this is the what you would use if you're not using that uninit API. If you're not actually manually creating uninitialized memory and then initializing it. If you just want to create an and initialize something, this just does that. It's just a little helper function. So it calls new uninit. It then maps such that it checks if it's successful. If it's successful, then it calls init, which is the function above, and just initializes it. So this is just a helper around, around that. Why do you need unsafe? Because this function is very much so unsafe. Um, we have some properties we can guarantee about that index we'll get into in a bit. Um, means that it doesn't have to try and optimize for both paths because there's only one path. Yep. Yep. Less branches is much nicer. Yes. Once again... We're trying to move that line up. I know this is a really weird analogy, but every single comparison that you do, every single loop that you do adds to a threshold. So the way that any optimizer pretty much works is optimizers will have both a time and like an iteration threshold. They'll have a recursive limit. They'll have a branch limit. They'll have a const prop limit. And basically, every time you do a conditional operation or you do something that cannot be proven at compile time, you consume that resource, right? So let's say your compiler can reason about unrolling a loop up to 10 iterations. Well, if we were to have you know, four iterations of this loop that was dynamic, we've already consumed those, which means that we have removed the ability for the compiler to optimize your code by consuming those resources at this lower level, if that makes sense. Everything stacks up. Yep. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to make sure that nothing is conditional all the way up to the user. Allocations have to be conditional, right? Allocations have to be able to fail because you can run out of space in the pool. Um, Okay, so then there is get unchecked. So this is the how we access these fields. This is how we get a Rust reference to a field from an index. Once again, this is unsafe. Uh, index must be greater than or equal to zero for this to be valid. It must be aligned, allocated, and, initial, and initialized to T in the pool. Um, well, you can't get unchecked. Of, well, you can but you're not allowed to get unchecked of uninit values. And this is how we enforce that write-only semantics of uninit references. That's why we split up uninit and initialized references as separate. Uh, think about numerefs. Numerefs are basically our pointers, right? Um, so then, uh, so this is get unchecked. It's basically the same thing as the initialize, but it doesn't have the loop. The reason it doesn't have the loop is because get unchecked is going to give you a reference to the T in the pool that you specified, the NUMA node that you specified when you originally created that accessor. And this, this right here is why we have that accessor property. We also needed the accessor for the closure, but whatever, we'll get into that later. Um, basically, this will convert the index to a U size, which is safe because we know that it must be greater than or equal to zero. That is up to the caller because this is unsafe. We then get that unsafe cell, we do a raw get, we get a constant pointer this time, we do the same thing, we slice it down to the region memory that we want, we get a pointer to the first element, we cast it to a T, and then we create the reference here, right? So it is, imp it is imperative that this index references, it's greater than or equal to zero, it's inbound to the pool for the entire size of T, it's aligned for a correct T, and this, you'll notice, there's no bounds checks. <laughs> there are no bounds checks here. Nowhere in here, once again, there's no conditional. There's no comparisons. There's nothing checking whether or not that's a valid reference. You just get a reference. From an index, you get a reference in the pool, and it's for your NUMA pool. Keep in mind, another accessor might be accessing a different NUMA pool, but they are accessing the exact same field. Even though it's a different pointer, they're going to get a different base. When they get this um, when they get this self.node, they have a different node data, a different backing, a different like chunk of memory. But the index is still the same, and the object that is there is still the same. So this is totally fine. This allows you to get a node local, lower latency, higher throughput uh, accessor to the specific value in your pool that you requested ahead of time. So once again, we don't have to do any comparisons or checks here. Then there is get, and get takes a numeref and it gives you a ref t. 
And you'll see that this just calls get unchecks, unchecked. Which then means that this, since this has no, this has no conditionals, this has no checks, this has nothing, nor does this. This has no checks, no conditionals. It doesn't check if that's in bounds. It doesn't check if it's been freed. It doesn't check if it belongs to this pool. Nothing. All this does is it literally takes the self.node pointer, it adds the index, and it gives you a reference to that. But this is still safe. <laughs> and I'll get into how this is safe in a bit. Then we have an uninit slice. Um, we're going to skim over slices, uh, but slices are a little bit more complex. Um, in this case, we uninit numeref for a slice. All of the slice APIs take elements or give elements. Um, here we actually create, uh, it's actually cool how you do this. So we say, give us the layout for a U size, and then extend that U size layout, that what we call the header, and extend it with the layout for an array of T elements, or of elements of type T. So this is all using Rust correct thing to bounce check, make sure the alignment correctly propagates, correctly add padding bytes. It does everything here. This will compute the true size that we need for now, the U size that we put out front of allocations that tells us the size. And the way that looks in memory is it's literally a U size followed by the T of data. So we allocate that. We then initialize at alc base, which is the start, which is that metadata. We initialize that unchecked with the elements because we've allocated that U size. So here we're filling in the size of that. And then we return an uninit numeref for the slice. Same thing as before. Here we have a nit slice. Uh, you pass in that numeref. This then gets the number of elements from the slice by reading that slice. Um, honestly, I maybe should put that in the uninit numeref so you don't have to read memory to do that, but I don't know. So this reads the memory. It reads that header, that metadata to determine the number of elements in there. Um, then it does that computation again to determine the size of the actual the object in there. Here we loop through for each element we compute the pool index. Now it's important to note that T might not be eight byte aligned. It could be 16 byte aligned. In which case the U size is eight bytes. Then there's an eight byte gap. Then there are, then there are all of the T's. So using this layout, uh, this layout API is critical because this array off tells me the actual offset of the start of the array data, even though these APIs might have magically added some padding to that uh, after that U size. It's, I'm not just adding eight because that's the size of the U size or adding size of U size. I am specifically using these APIs. Then for every element that you want to initialize in that slice, it gets the index, which is the index plus the array offset. So the offset to the base of the array plus the index times the size of a T. Now you'll see that here, we do an unwrap, and here we do uh, an unchecked arithmetic operation. But we know from when we allocated the slice, here we actually validated the alignment, and we validated that there's no overflow when you multiply size of t and elements. So we have already checked that they are safely, uh, you can multiply those values and you won't get an overflow. So we don't have to check for overflows here, which means we can use slightly faster math. Um, and then here, we call this a knit function, and this is a closure that takes in uh, it takes in a reference to self, and it uh, self in this case is the accessor, the numa accessor. And then it takes in the u size, which is the index, um, and then that yields an option t. So as a as a user of this API, if you return none, that means that you for some reason did not know how to initialize that field. This allows you to give a way of returning out and returning a failure, basically. Uh, so that we check, we get the value that you specified you wanted at this index, and then we call and it unchecked at that pool index with that temp. So we fill that in for all of the nodes. Once again, we're broadcasting that to four nodes based on the data that you provided us in this closure. Tibby stream when? I don't know. I haven't played Tibby in a long time. I was thinking about it though. Okay. New slice, once again, this is like new. Um, you give it 
uh, you're on the Numa Accessor, you give it the number of elements that you want and an, and an initializer closure, and this will create the uninit slice, and then it will initialize that slice. Get on check slice, this is the same thing as kind of above. Get the number of elements. Um, why do we need that? Uh, so that we can compute the size of the array. We actually don't need this, I don't think. So we do this so we can... Oh, we do need it because we're giving a slice. Yeah, we need to know the length of it so we can know the length of this slice. So here, it's the same thing. This is unconditional, no bounds checks, nothing at all. This will just return a, re uh, a slice, a rust slice to those Ts. Um, okay. So that is how we create slices and how we create, um, create values. And we don't have resizable slices. That makes no sense because these are not mutable. Once you have converted an uninit numeref to a numeref, that numeref is now shareable between cores and threads. And thus, we can't, we can't resize these things. None of this data is mutable. Basically, the uninit numeref is a lease. It means that you have reserved memory that is exclusive to you that no one can read. You initialize that. You can only initialize it once because uninit numeref is consumed by a move. Um, and then, once you get that numeref, you can hand that numeref off over pipes or whatever you want to use to hand that off to other threads. Um, okay. Whispering at the compiler, please do not fuck up the data flow graph. Yeah, exactly. So, get slice, same thing. Once again, no bounce checks, no checks at all. It just calls the unsafe function. All right, so here are the numerefs and uninit numerefs. So here's a numeref. Uh, we derive debug just for debugging, uh, no other reasons. It's wrapper transparent, which means that it will form the shape of the eye size, meaning that a numeref, in terms of in memory, in storage, it is literally an eye size, right? Since it's in a structure and all these things, it doesn't matter. At the end of the day, in memory, like if you were to store a numeref in a structure, like a pointer effectively, it's literally an eye size. It's, there's no references, there's no pointers, there's no ASLR, there's nothing. It's literally just an eye size, is a numeref. Um, and we're going to probably change that during the stream, so it's not an eye size. Um, but yeah. Um, then we have the marker, and this is where we store, first of all, the type information of what this reference is. So it's storing that this is a T, which is poolable, and it could be an on size because this could be a slice. Um, and then it also stores that ID. And this is an invariant reference. We'll get into that in a second. We're really close. Are all allocations on the current NUMA node uh, for the executing thread? Uh, are all allocs on the current NUMA node? No. When you allocate something, it's broadcast to every node unconditionally. You never create an allocation on only your node. All allocations are broadcast to all nodes. So however many nodes you configure, when you alloc, it will create that many copies of the data unconditionally. Th this doesn't allow you to have different allocations of, in different nodes. Uh, they're all the same, which is important because otherwise you couldn't use an index because the same index references the same object in all of the nodes data, right? If that makes sense. So it is required. It is required that we, like, if we were to allow exclusive objects in certain pools, then we would still have to consume that memory in other pools anyways. So yeah. Then we implement clone and copy for poolable. And we have to do this manually because we're doing some weird stuff with lifetimes. All we do is we just make a new one. So we grab the index and we create a new thing. The numeref itself is just an index, but we're basically tagging it with this lifetime stuff here. So for, uh, for types of an ID, a given pool ID, and uh, they're poolable in size, we can clone numerefs and we can copy them. This means that numerefs, unlike uninit numerefs, you can copy them around as many times as you want because they are permanent references to memory, right? <clears throat> this is perfect for mass parallelism of identical tasks across nodes. Yes, yes. That is entirely what this is designed for. Then there's an uninit numeref. Uninit numerefs are identical in terms of their shape and structure and contents. All they do is they hold an eye size. However, Uninit numerefs do not 
implement clone and copy. And since they don't implement clone and copy, that means you only get one. When you get an uninit numeref, you only get one. And to initialize that uninit numeref, you have to move it into the function, meaning that when you write it, when you initialize that value, you lose access to writing to it. So that compile time safely, provably, prevents you from double initializing values or changing something once it's being observed by other threads. Um, basically, once a numeref exists, we have to assume that that memory can be accessed by multiple threads in parallel. Okay. So then uh, we'll hit the numa, uh, the local ref. So this numa pool, if you think about it, um, this numa pool is uh, it's expensive, right? First of all, one thing that's expensive is allocating memory requires an atomic operation. You have to atomically get a get an index, align the index. Check that it's in bounds for the object you want to allocate. And you basically have to retry that, right? There's literally a loop in there, like an LLSC loop, where you are trying to win that race to, to win that allocation. So the intention here is that the NUMA pool is rarely used, right? The NUMA pool, and as you saw in here, there's no way to free memory. Like, you can delete the NUMA pool itself by just by dropping the NUMA pool itself. Um, but you can't free memory. So the NUMA pool is meant for pushing objects that you know you will reuse many times, right? So then we can look at the local pool. And the local pool, you'll find the code is nearly identical to the NUMA pool. The difference of the local pool is that in use is no longer an atomic and there's no longer multiple copies. So when you create data, when you allocate data here, it doesn't have to broadcast it to NUMA nodes, and you also don't have to use an atomic. So this is slightly faster, slightly more optimized. It doesn't have that conditional loop. It's not racing with other threads, so it doesn't have to be you know, aware of races and stuff like that, which is really important. Pointers as negative integers. We'll get into that. <laughs> we'll get into that. So uh, here we have new once again. Create an uninitialized box. This time we don't have an array because we don't have multiple nodes. We just have one. We set in use to zero. Here's the accessor. Now an accessor for this case, when you make an accessor for a local pool, you have to give it an accessor to a NUMA pool. <laughs> and that is because NUMA pool allocations, and this is where we really start getting complex. NUMA pool allocations, that poolable trait, basically the poolable trait makes sure that your structure contains only plain old data. So U8, U32, U64s, I, I32, I64s, or references to poolable types in the same pool or poolable types themselves. So basically it, it ensures that everything is plain old data and it enforces that there are no pointers or references in those structures. That's basically the whole goal, is to make sure there's no pointers or references. There can be NUMA refs. Remember, NUMA refs are our fake references, our fake pointers. So what we're doing is we are at compile time ensuring that the structures that you store in these pools never contain pointers because these pools by nature can be moved. <laughs> These pools by nature, all of the indices in these pools, all of the references are indices, which means that you can actually move the pools. You can take the raw pool and serialize it to disk by just writing out the raw bytes, and then you can allocate memory again, load up the pool into memory, and that's valid. Now that's unsafe because you've created point like you've created objects out of thin air by doing that. But does that make sense? There's no pointers. The, the entire blob of memory, that node memory, that uh, in this case data, is entirely self-contained. Nothing references outside and nothing references into it. Everything is self-contained, which is really, really, really cool. Uh, so we have this local pool and the local pool is designed to be really fast temporary allocations. So the NUMA pool is designed to be permanent allocations that are a little bit more expensive because you copy the data for or however many node times for all of those. So it's a little bit more expensive. So 
basically pushing something or what we call globalizing uh, a local allocation to the NUMA pool is something that you as a developer have to be like, okay, this is something that I really want to keep around. I want to make sure that I store this basically permanently. I want to optimize this for other threads to access. Um, so because of that, the local accessor is actually a sub of the, the NUMA pool. The NUMA pool fully contains the local pool itself, right? And that is why you have to give a NUMA accessor when you're working with a local pool. So a local pool has a different size. So you can have a different size local pool and a NUMA pool. They're not mirrors of each other. A local pool is fully independent and it allows mutable fast. It allows freeing of stuff. Well, it allows freeing of everything. It doesn't allow freeing of single fields. It allows freeing of the entire thing. Um, so here we have an accessor. This is now mutable because this, this mutability right here ensures that you have exclusive access to the local pool which means that you have been tied at compile time, provably, you've been tied to be the only person who is working on this pool. There's no other readers. So now that has changed some of our semantics and our logic and our implementation because now we know that the local pool is exclusive. The NUMA pool is never exclusive. It can always be shared between threads, but this is exclusive. So then we have a local accessor here. And a local accessor has both an ID, so that's the local pool's ID, and then the NUMA ID, and that is the ID that we would have seen on the NUMA structures. Because we have to understand the lifetime, we have to understand that tag effectively of the NUMA pool that this local pool is a uh, sub to. Um, this allocator is aware of programmer defined data types. Yep, and we'll get into that in a minute. We'll write like an example program. So when you create an accessor, you can create multiple accessors. Well, only one at a time. When you create a new accessor, it resets the allocator state. So that deletes all of the existing allocations. So when we uh, were writing this in bump below here, and we did bump with capacity, and then bump.reset, this mirrors that. When we create a local accessor, you're getting exclusive access to the local pool and you're wiping it clean. So this allows you to reuse that allocation and reuse the caches being warm for that region in the CPU, but it gives you, it clears it out entirely. So now the entire local pool is, is up to you again. Uh, why is there a cell you size instead of a plain you size? It allows better nesting when, because all of these take refs. None of these take mutable references. Um, and this is required for some, some paradigms. Like uh, a good example is, um, let's think of a situation where you want to uh, create a slice. This new uninit, not new and uninit slice. Uh, init slice is a great, new slice, right? So new slice takes a closure of uh, F where you give it things to initialize that slice. Well, if your slice is a slice of references, then you have to be able to create references in the pool in this closure, uh, which means, well, actually I could just pass that mutably, but basically I, I think actually before I didn't pass access to the accessor before, um, this code has kind of changed shapes a couple times of like whether the accessor is above or below the objects. Um, it's kind of weird, uh, but with this model, I think I can actually make them all mutable. So historically, Due to the code structure and the API design, they had to be immutable so that you could like create objects inside of creating objects, if that makes sense. So you could, you could create a field while making a slice of references to that field, if that makes sense. Um, however, I think now that I've restructured that, I think I can change that and we'll, uh, we'll do a quick pass of this file and then we'll change that. Um, so, uh, we'll see. I can't remember if there's a reason for that. So once again, make sure that the alignment's fine. Get the alignment mask. Here we're doing the same thing, but not with the atomics. All we're doing, we align it up to the nearest alignment boundary. All of these are checking for overflows. Then we align, uh, we add the size, make sure that that fits. If it's greater than or equal to zero, then we update the in use. So we push that forwards. So the cell only matters here. This is the only place where the cell is used. And since nothing in here can cause the cell to get updated, it technically is the same. So it just relaxes a little bit of the 
basically where you can call these functions. You don't need mute on everything, which can be a little messy. Um, this is completely safe. And it has the exact same cost as a normal U size. The cell actually has no cost or overhead uh, for this. Anyways, here we set the allocation to the end, and then we do this. <laughs> All right, chat, what do you think this means? Why do you think we do this? This is where it gets interesting. Doesn't it still make sense to make it immutable wherever possible so the compiler can easily reason about whether the value will change? Yes. Um, so, yeah, that, that theoretically is an improvement. I think it doesn't matter just due to exactly as you said, um, the compiler sees all of this code. Um, but, yeah. So, does it being negative give it some sort of a property? Yes. Yes, it does. Don't ask me. I'm 100% here by accident. I'm not leaving. Hell yeah. Add negative one? No. No, this is way different than negative one, but it's unique. Definitely unique. Set the most significant byte. This is, ex or most significant bit. This is exactly what this does. This, um, this, uh, this, uh, I size independently sets the most significant bit. That's all it does. So, and you'll note that these comparisons all use I sizes, both in the local and NUMA pool, to make sure that we're only ever using half of our integer range. All right. Then we have an it unchecked. This is literally identical code. I think everything is identical. I think the only code that is different between local and NUMA is whether or not they use atomics and whether or not they broadcast a value to multiple nodes when you initialize it. Uh, I think that's all that changes. So everything else in here is basically the same. Um, so you have get unchecked, that's the same. And then there's get. Ms. Miro, thank you so much for the tier one sub to John Brooks. No. So check out that get. That's the local getter. Ah, ah, Ms. Mir, thank you so much for the sub as well. Hell yeah. Welcome to the good life. How do you like this getter? Do you see what we've done here? <laughs> you can unify NUMA and local references. Yeah. Almost had it with my guess earlier. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So, so NUMA refs always only reference NUMA refs in the NUMA pool. Local refs can reference either local refs or they can also reference NUMA refs from the NUMA pool that the accessor was defined to. Can this be done with the LSB? I mean, technically, yes. But this is faster. This is faster because this is, a, this is just a sign bit comparison, and every architecture pretty much in the world has a sign bit comparison. Uh, a least significant bit comparison would require, first of all, we'd have to shift the index. We'd have to shift over the index. So we have to do a shift. Then we'd have to do an and and a check. Whereas this, this is not like... This is not an and. This doesn't check the top bit, right? This literally will just do a assigned comparison on the architecture. So we'll do a sign extension to the word size, or if it's an architecture with multiple different word sizes, it will just do that comparison here. Hi, Dad. How's it going? So yeah. So local references are negative. Numa references are positive. This also means that Numa references are they can exist in existing objects. So that means that I can take a NUMA reference that exists and has NUMA references in it, and I can move it into a local reference system that, that is totally fine because 
all of the references inside of it are positive. And thus I know to access the uh, Numa references for that. Gonna sleep to see if I can wrinkle my brain like I do my clothes. Can you nest pools? No. No. And I see no reason to do that, and that's why I didn't implement it. I think you maybe could express that. No, you couldn't, because this requires lifetime. So this Numa accessor, this local accessor, has the tag for the pool that it belongs to, but it also has the tag for the Numa pool it belongs to. And if you were to be able to nest these, you would have to have dynamic generic traits. This is both brilliant and spooky. I now see why you can only do it in Rust. Yes. In C and C++, you would have to make sure all of this is, is done. Uh, localize. Yeah. So here's localize. This is how localize works, and it's crazy. Localize. Convert a NUMA reference from the NUMA pool into a local pool reference. This is effectively zero cost. It just changes the lifetime. Local pool values can refer to either the NUMA pool or the local pool. So, this takes a NUMA ref that is tagged with a NUMA ID. Now, that NUMA ID, we know is the NUMA pool that we're using for this local pool. We then return a NUMA ref of an ID, and all we do is we just, we just make a new NUMA ref with the same index. That's totally fine. Isn't that fucking crazy? So, that's the core of this. So, chat. What happens when I make this allocation? So here I make an allocation in the local pool, right? I make a NUMA ref on the local pool. Now what happens when I have another local pool? We'll make this a LP2, local pool two. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna make an LP2 accessor. Um, and this will be on, uh, that can also be on NA actually. Uh, LA2, so this is the local accessor 2, unwrap this. So inside of this scope, check this out. Print LN, this, so we'll do um, LA.get, so using the accessor for the local ref, we'll get X. And there's no unwraps or checks, this can never fail. This is an unconditional, this is literally just a deref. There's no bounds checks, there's no accesses, anything. Uh, and then we have to just say standard. So we are inside of another local accessor, and you can see we got a five. What happens? What happens if we try and access that value with LA2? X, X does not exist in LA2. Fail. Compile time failure. Because it knows. Provably, it knows that X belongs to LA. And if you try to use anything other than LA to access X, it is wrong. And that means I don't need bounce checks. I don't need to check if I'm in the right pool. I don't need to check if my pointer lies in the right regions. It is guaranteed that this allocation came from that pool. And yet, X at runtime is just an I size. Yes. Yep. Yeah, we can, we can do that. We can print, uh, we have to get rid of that because that's not going to compile. Uh, we can do this. Uh, core mem size of val uh, ref X. So this is the size of X. And you'll see, it's eight. It's just eight bytes. So yeah, this is where invariant lifetimes is critical, and that tagging. So when we're using lifetimes, that ID and NUMA ID, these are not lifetimes. These are tags. And we use an invariant reference in here, and the invariant reference is, is really simple. So basically, um, mutable, pointers are, uh, mutable pointers are invariants uh, over T, and in this case, T is a ref ID uh, Z, which makes ID itself invariant. Basically, if you're familiar with Rust, traditionally, size of a pointer, not the in itself, correct, because that's the size of the numeref. That's not the size of that. 
right? If we were to do la.getx, this would be four. Because this is now this, uh, well, that's eight, because that's a ref ref. Um, there we go. Four. That's the size of the actual object that is in there. So yeah, the invariant lifetimes is critical because there's a lot of, th we need to make sure that in no situation you ever use an allocation in the wrong pool. If you use an allocation in the wrong pool, then we're wrong. Our code is very incorrect. Um, so in this case, um, that lifetime, so the closure creates the lifetime, right? So this closure silently creates that ID lifetime. And any time that we use get, we can only use get with an ID that matches ID. Now, what invariance does is in normal Rust, if you're familiar with Rust, there's, a, there's basically an ordering where um, static is the longest lifetime and any reference can be static. You can put a static reference into an A reference because that static reference lives longer, right? So in normal Rust, you can use any reference that lives for at least ID. But in our situation, we're not using ID as a lifetime. We're using ID as an association between an allocation and an object. So yeah, and that's basically this allocator. Now, the intention, the way that this is designed to be used is here you have your local accessor on the inside, right? So this is the Numa pool, and the Numa pool, um, the Numa pool doesn't uh, lose its objects. Like those objects stay around. The pool has to live longer than the allocation. Well, in this case the pool has to live for the exact same time as the allocation. Because if it doesn't, then that means that you can use an allocation from a pool that lives longer than a different pool in a shorter lifetime pool. That is why it has to be invariant. Right? It's critical that it's invariant. Because otherwise I could pass in that LP2 example that I made here, this LA2, this... If that was not an invariant reference, and let's see, let's do that. Uh, let's just break our invariant ref implementation. Here we go. So we're gonna change this from a mutable pointer to just an IDZ, right? That's all we're doing. Now, this is no longer an invariant lifetime. This now compiles and runs. And you'll find that this is wrong. This returns zero because we are now accessing an index that is not in our pool. Right? This is wrong. We didn't allocate five in LA2. We allocated five in LA. And this compiling and running is wrong. That zero just happens to be whatever was uninitialized there. If we were to run this in Miri, I don't know if you can run Miri tests, but this is undefined behavior. We're reading, uh, we're reading uninitialized memory because this, this allocation does not exist in this pool. So that, that mute star right there, this right here is what makes this work. And now it'll fill the build because that is an invariant lifetime. It is critical that the lifetimes must match. And that's why I don't say it's a lifetime, I say it's a tag. Even though to the compiler it's a lifetime, we have coerced them by, first of all, creating one out of thin air with the closure. The closure is also required. Because if you don't use a closure, then you can move, basically, the closure makes sure that you can't move variables outside of here, right? We need to make sure that we also can't save this allocation. We can't say like foo is none. Let's say mute foo is none. And the closure boxes us in in the other direction. It makes sure that we don't move things out of this. So I can't do foo uh, equals some x, right? This is impossible because numeref has a lifetime of the closure, and this will also fail. We'll get rid of LA2 so we don't get that comparison. And this is LA escapes the closure body here. And that's also not okay. Um, 
Is there a reason why specifically a pointer syntax is used to create this? Yes, because a pointer is invariant. Right? So here's subtyping invariants, and here's why we use a pointer. We use a pointer because pointers are invariant. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> That's it. It just happens to be an invariant thing that we can use. Um, so, yeah. And it's invariant on T. And in this case, uh, we can't use refs, right? Refs do not work because what is the lifetime of the outside reference, right? Because T is what is invariant here, and we want T to include our lifetime. So this would be A ref mute, ID ref, whatever, right? So we can't do that because we don't have an A ref. So basically, mute T means that T is invariant. Uh, we could also use unsafe cell and cell, but uh, mute T is just a little bit lighter and simpler. Remember that unsafe cell and cell are just basically draw pointers at the end of the day. So that's why. It, it just happens to be invariant. And you'll see the reason we use a closure, the reason we also use the closure is because of this contravariance. And by combine, basically, if you think about it, contravariance allows things to be like uh, a shorter lifetime. And that makes sense. You can move things into a closure, right? Because you're moving something with a longer lifetime into a shorter lifetime. And that's okay. That's the contravariance. Um, so by using both, we kind of bookend it. Right? So this contravariance is kind of the, the less than comparison, and the invariance is kind of the greater than comparison. And by using both the closure and the, uh, uh, and the invariant reference, we have now boxed it in, where you can't move, you can't move those allocations, you can't move a numeref outside of the accessor without a compile temp failure because it escapes a closure because of that contravariance, right? Here's that subtyping. And this is contravariance that we're hitting. And then we can't go this way uh, because of the invariance. Once again, it's a subtyping thing because it's invariant. So yeah, combining those two things together means that we basically can use a lifetime as a tag. And that means that when we create allocations, we're able to tag those allocations as coming from a certain location, which means when we access those, we know unconditionally that's why we don't have to do bounds checks we don't have to do we don't have to do any checks on this this is literally just a straight direct raw comparison a uh, raw deref um car miri test should work with your broke example uh sure let's do that uh let's do this let's break it uh source variant ref um there we go uh, cargo Miri test. Uh, yeah, sure. Yeah, because this returned a zero before, right? Um, and the zero was just uninitialized. It just happened to be what was in that memory. Beautiful. Um, and we have uh, constructing invalid value encountered uninitialized bytes, but expected initialized bytes. And um, let's just do this full screen so we get a better stack. Let's see what we got. So this is in uh, inside the closure. Let's see if this can tell us where we are. We are at, uh, where are we? This is weird because we're in, a, we're in a test, which is a little weird, but that display failed, right? Displaying failed. So what we can do now is we'll put the mute back in. This should no longer fail. Uh, oh, this fails to build. That makes sense because now it literally can't build. And if we run this, this will just run under Miri, right? Everything here we do is safe. 
We correctly wrap all of our stuff in, maybe on init. We correctly map them in unsafe cells. So we indicate to the compiler that they can change under a shared reference. We indicate that the uh, memory is interior mutable. And we do all of the correct things. Passing Miri here is not easy. <laughs> like, passing Miri here is not easy. I can, I can tell you that much. Like, do not do what we're doing. This is very, like, this is, uh, this is very similar to Ghost Cell. Um, in Ghost Cell, <laughs> for reference, not to toot my own horn, but for reference, Ghost Cell is like a very big paper from last year, right? And this is like PhDs, academics. I mean, Ralph Jung is like the, the theory crafter behind a lot of stuff in Rust. Like, do not do what we're doing. Seri seriously. Write your slower code that does runtime checks. What we're doing here is beyond that of really what anyone reaches in their entire life of programming. S seriously. Seriously. Like, do not do this. Um, I wouldn't even be surprised if when I write a blog on this and I go more public with this that, you know, I'm sure Ralph, Ralph will definitely be reading this fucking blog. I can guarantee you that, which is kind of sick. But a lot of people will read this and, and people will absolutely probably find flaws in this or find things that they're concerned about or see things where maybe I'm relying on undefined behavior. I don't think I am. I think I have thought through all of the possible state trans transitions here um, but yeah, this is, this is like very bleeding edge language type theory. Like this is within like the past year or so of type theory. And I would say that while, yes, I'm using the invariant lifetime stuff that ghost cell proposes, right? Ghost, this ghost cell paper is what made me comfortable in doing what I'm doing. Um, it goes through kind of exactly what these examples are. They call them brands, right? These ID, these branded vectors, where you're able to push, here's that impl 4 a syntax. They go into the invariant lifetime somewhere in here. Here's the invariant lifetime with the mutable ID, right? This is very, very, very bleeding edge, like compiler language type theory stuff. So, yeah. <laughs> so just, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's not me trying to toot my own horn. That's me trying to make sure that people don't fuck off and try and do this. Like, as you saw, if you accidentally misunderstood the paper and you thought the important type was the lifetime and you accidentally forgot that mute, this code everywhere, universally, in almost every single function, this is undefined behavior. Like, universally wrong, right? So it's very, very, very fucking important that you understand and you're A-B testing these things to understand that these things should fail in the way they fail. But yeah. Um, it's not particularly hard to understand. It's hard to understand all of the state transitions because this, if you in any of these APIs can accidentally create an invalid lifetime that allows you to use it in the wrong pool, then the entire pool becomes tainted and invalid, right? So this isn't about like getting one thing right and then it passes in your tests and stuff. This has to be universally correct in every situation. Um, but yeah. Anyways, so this is designed for fuzzing. <laughs> As everything I do, this is overkill and it's designed for fuzzing. And the way that this is designed is that you have your local pool. Um, the ATS language uh, hands you a proof which acts like a brand ID ref with every allocation and has similar invariants at compile time. Yeah, that's really cool. Yeah. Rust is like not just shit on other languages. Rust is the only language that is usable. And when I say usable, like has enough of a community compiles to reasonable code that can be used for OS design and low-level development and, and core functionality, Rust is the only language that can do this, right? It's either perfect or completely broken. Seriously, yes. Yes, it really is. Um, all about the edge cases. Yeah. So uh, this is designed for fuzzing. 
And what it's designed for is that the Numa pool is where you push your corpus. And the local pool is where you deserialize temporary objects. Doing this in C++ would be rough. I don't think you can do this in C++. You can implement this API in Rust, but or in C++ or C or any language for that matter. But in those environments, you would have to make sure that every single situation where you get, set, use, initialize, allocate things, that you are, as a human, manually making sure that you're using the right pool object. <laughs> Every single time you access an object, every single time you initialize an object, every single time you create an object, you have to make sure that you are correctly never crossing pools. <laughs> okay, so uh, we're gonna move out of the test uh, so that we can get access to the procedural macros. I'll show you a little bit about how I do procedural macros, which are gross. Um, it's the way I like to do procedural macros now. Uh, sorry, but it's the way I like to do them. So, cargo new bin, uh, alk test. Uh, okay. So, we have this allocation test. We'll paste the code in here. Um... It's the same code that we wrote before. This now becomes main. Uh, since we have a lot of, uh, and we should do this code up here in the compiling down there. Here we go. So basically, uh, and this is going to be uh, 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 alicado. Okay. So this, um, while this is designed for fuzzing, I still think it's a universally very, very, very good allocator. <laughs> like disgustingly good allocator. <laughs> uh, as you saw, like we are... We are beating simple bump allocators that don't free by two orders of magnitude. Could this in principle be done with constant generics and counter in C++? I don't know if you could do that across modules. I think you could at least in maybe a couple... I don't know. I don't know. Maybe. I will be curious what the community thinks of this because... As I was saying earlier, you can use that local pool without the NUMA pool. I use the NUMA pool because it's designed for fuzzing, but the local pool is fine standalone. Um, but the, uh, the local pool, if I'm not mistaken, correct me if I'm wrong, the local pool is just a, it's just, it's just a fully featured bump allocator. It's not a fully featured allocator, because allocators require freeze and partial objects and stuff. But I would say, I don't think the local pool deviates functionally at all from a, um, from a pool, a uh, normal bump allocator. However, um, to do this, you have to write accessors. You have to do that, like, la.get. I used to call it get in, but I just changed it to get to shorten the, the length. But basically, anytime you want to get access to something, you have to use the accessor to, to read the reference. So anytime you want to deref something, you can't just deref it, right? So it adds a little bit of boilerplate to the code. I'm okay with it. <laughs> I'm okay with the boilerplate because it's fucking good. So now you might be wondering, who cares? Like, if you are decent, if you're bottlenecking on allocations, and I agree with this personally, if you are bottlenecking on allocations, then make a fucking structure, right? If you're bottlenecking because you keep deserializing a U8 followed by a U32 followed by a U64 followed by a U8, make a structure and then deserialize and like allocate those as structures. However, that's when we get to crazy shit. Local refs allow mutability, yeah, through a local mute, which I actually don't have in this current code base. Um, I have changed that out. Um, so, here's where it gets fucking crazy. <laughs> here's where it gets really fucking crazy. So let's do this. Uh, let's pull this in. Uh, what well, you need to pre proster to automatically write the boilerplate for it? Yeah. Um, uh... Alicado is equal to uh, path equals uh, home pleb alicado. Okay. 
That should pull that in. Nice. That gets me the proc macro uh, crates. Yup. Um. So, uh, I just make helpers so we don't have to type out all the generics here. But this is specifying the size and the Numa pool, uh, the number of nodes. I think if I do zero, I don't know what happens if I do zero, actually. Oh, it just fails. Yeah, invalid node. Yeah, because you can't you can't get an accessor to any nodes. You can make a pool, uh, but you can't get an accessor to a node because you can't index uh, an, an empty list. Okay, so uh, here's what I can do. Moose is, this is going to be a foo uh, numeref u8 and a bar. And this is a u32, right? So that's a valid structure. And now I can do a uh, derive, deserialize, and a uh, poolable. Um, Yep, and those type IDs are missing. I'm literally, that's what the goal of this stream is to do, is to work on these. Uh, so let's just go find that code quick. And let's just break it. Uh, if you're smart, you'll figure out why why this allocator is disgusting. Um, okay, here we go. And poolable, oh, type ID, yeah. Uh, let's just, we're just going to nuke this for now. This is the poolable trait. It's just an unsafe trait, send sync. Um, so, okay, here we go. Uh, poolable, check poolable. Oh, does that automatically implement here? Oh, deserialize, I think, implements pool. I'm still working on the proc macros. Like, now we're getting into, like, where I'm experimenting and, and working on the language, right? So that's important to understand. The core functionality exists. The APIs, I think, are stabilized to the ways that I'm going to use them. But here we go. So now I can say la.deserialize, uh, I don't know, five, one, two, three, four. And this, um, let mute, uh, let mute temp is a reference to this. This is just the deserializer API. Uh, it, it's, it works on, uh, references to slice, mutable references to slices. Uh, associated function, yeah, that makes sense. Uh, because this will be a, um, this will be a moose deserialize, and then you give it the pool that you deserialize into. Bam. And uh, mutability, this has to be, uh, oh, this is, I think, ref mute. Uh, temp. Temp, 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 temp. Oh, mute here. Mutable reference to a slice, and this has to be a specific type. And, okay. Uh, and then we just have to slice that down. Once again, this is just the API. It's these like these things you can abstract away with like procedural macros and stuff. Uh, and then unwrap here. Okay. And then we'll say uh, moose is equal to this, right? So this deserializes a moose, and it automatically deserializes these into objects. So we can also do like baz, where we'll say that's a u8. So this will now fail to run because we'll run out of objects. Uh, we just need another byte in here. Let's just add a five in the end. Um, here we go. So that deserializes. We're just unwrapping for convenience here. And then we can print uh, la.gets moose. Uh, actually, moose is not in the pool itself, right? If that makes sense. And then we'll drive debug. So here you go. Here is a moose. And um, these, what has happened is this is not a reference, so it just deserialized it directly in a moose. That actually didn't allocate anything. But the way this works is you give it the accessor, you give it the pool, and this will automatically, anything that is a numeref, it will deserialize it into that pool. <coughs> so these are discrete objects in the pool. <laughs> Uh, which means that we can then do like moose.foo. Uh, and then here we have to do an accessor. So la.get moose.foo. So this is going to get that allocation in there. And you can see it's one. And what was foo? It was the second byte and the second byte was one. Yeah, makes sense, right? So the reason why we're doing this is because imagine you are writing a fuzzer 
And imagine that you're deserializing a structure. Now, what if hypothetically you write your structure definition? Let's say this is header, right? This is a header instead of a moose, right? This is the header of your data that you're deserializing from the wire, the network, or something like that. And what if you deserialize it where every field is deserialized into a numeref? And what if hypothetically the performance of this allocator allowed these things to get merged such that this allows you to deserialize the header as one object while still keeping them as two discrete objects? Because I can then, if I get coverage gains or something happens, let's say I, this is my fuzz input, I'm fuzzing some shit, generating data, and then I get a coverage increase. Then on that coverage increase, I can globalize that structure, meaning that that structure and all of the nested components all the way down get pushed into the numeref. Then on the next fuzz case, I can say, hey, I would like a header. And it just goes into the, so the pool of objects and says, here's a header. And then I can then pull that header into a local pool at the header level. And then I can mutate one of the fields. So I grab a header. I'm I move that into the local pool. I then blast over just this one field. I replace foo with a local ref. That's like a new thing that I just created. Like just for that fuzz trace, I created that. But bar, maybe it's a probabilistic thing where I mutate these things probabilistically. Bar still sits. It still remains as the original numeref to the pool. So that is shared. It's shared between the cores, it's shared in the caches, and there's copies for all the NUMA nodes. So then I can see, I can basically, in the local pool is where I do fuzz cases, if that makes sense. The local pool is where I make temporary fuzz cases. It's where I deserialize things, it's where I make new fuzz cases, it's where I mutate things from the global pool, the, like the NUMA pool. I mutate them in the local pool, and then, if I decide, for some reason, I want to pay the cost to permanently commit that data structure to the NUMA pool, I can just globalize that, push it up to the pool, and then on the next fuzz case, I can say, give me a header. And that's now part of it. Does moving to another pool involve making a copy? Yes. It makes a copy for every node. So n copies, where n is this number. Um... Like source control for your data. Yes. Yes. But even better, when you're fuzzing, you're not mutating every field. If you're mutating every field, you're an idiot. You're mutating like a couple fields here and there to see if you can affect and get a different behavior. What, so when I go to serialize that payload, when I go to generate the input for the fuzz case, I can serialize it where most of the memory accesses are hitting that NUMA ref, the, the NUMA pool, where it's, it's localized. It's made to a super local copy in my memory, but it's shared. Meaning that if you have, you know, you've had a thousand increases in coverage, which means you have a thousand headers, these headers are small enough where all of these would fit in cache. And that means all of the threads are sharing that memory. They're sharing the cache, they're sharing that, when they're reading to serialize that data, when they're reading that data to like blast it out to a VEC of U8s, all of that stuff is shared. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah. So I've already done this. <laughs> so offline, I have a slightly hacked up version of this that thoroughly implements like Mm, thousands of lines of code of deserialization, right? And what it means is that if you write your code like this, if you write structure definitions like this, it will automatically register anything that goes into a reference into a pool of those objects. So let's think about it like this. Imagine this is, uh, let's imagine this is DHCP and we have an IP. Uh, we'll say specifically it's an IPv4 adder. 
Let's say it's a U32. Now this is specialized. What that means is I can then say this is an IPv4 adder, right? So uh, blah, blah, blah. Poolable's not implemented on that. Um, on IPv4 adder, deserialized. Why is that? Did I typo that or something? What did I do here? Oh, it's because, um, yeah, I the, the proc macro is not complete yet. Once again, I'm kind of experimenting with the API and making sure this makes sense before I commit to it. Uh, we'll just say this is the IP. So uh, we'll be able to improve all of these things. Poolable is not implemented on that. So, oh, here we have to do poolable, I think. Um, the ordering might matter. Oh, it has to be clone and copy. I think poolable requires copy. Okay, so now I've deserialized. If I get a bar, right? If I get bar, that is now an IPv4 address. And what I can do is I can just keep adding layers. So I can say this is a numeref ID U32. So now, if I were to say, uh, give me a U32, it can give me an IPv4 address. But if I said, give me an IPv4 address, it will only give me things that are IPv4 addresses. So the way that this is intended is that uh, your NUMA pool has like your, that's basically your persistent corpus. Those are things that you decided to register due to coverage and stuff. Internally, let's say you have your fuzz loop uh, for fuzz. And inside of here, let's say you're fuzzing 10 packets, right? So you're fuzzing 10 DHCP packets, 10 DHCP packets, right? So you make a local accessor um, on the outside, right? So you make an accessor for kind of the entire fuzz session. That's your like temporary storage. And here's what's really cool is when you're generating these packets, blah, 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 you make these packets and then DHCP gives a response. So what you can do with that response is you can deserialize the response. So response deserialize into the local accessor such that you're going to blow these away unless you decide to save them. And then on the subsequent packet, you come back around. So on the first packet, you generate your packet, whatever. You, like, you say like, uh, give me a DHCP packet, and then you send it, right? Then you get a response from DHCP. You deserialize it with this logic. By right, all you do is you like write these templates. Obviously, these procedural macros, you, they're as limited as, as the procedural macro is, right? So you implement the protocol in these procedural macros or whatever syntax. You can do it manually if you want. Then, on the next fuzz case, uh, in the same session, you can then say, give me a DHP packet. And then you're like, eh, packet.ip is equal to mm, give me an IP address. Well, that IP address could be from this. Because you deserialized an IP address, potentially, in that packet. Or a GUID, or a magic number, or a reference, or a token, or a key, right? By nature... That is temporarily in your corpus. <laughs> right? So you end up you end up deserializing these intermediate packets, even though you don't want to save these. Like, I don't want to commit some intermediate thing if I'm not getting new coverage or a new crash or anything unique happened. But most pro like many protocols have like a challenge response, right? Where if you don't correctly handle the protocol thoroughly enough that you handle responses, parse them, grab the magic fields, and then put those in the correct magic fields on a response in the future, your packet literally gets dropped, completely rejected. There's no bugs. There's no parsing. It's just entirely discarded. So what this means is that temporarily in a fuzz case where you're doing like multiple packets, multiple messages, you end up deserializing extremely cheaply into a local pool that then when you query in a dumb fuzzer, right? I would say this is a dumb fuzzer. You say, give me an IP address and you will get an IP address some percentage of the time from your global database that has all the IPs you've ever saved. But also 
you'll have an IP address from the local pool, from the packet that maybe is the response from the DHCP server. And maybe maybe the DHCP server won't do anything with subsequent packets unless you're responding to the IP it gave you, right? And so you don't even have to understand the protocol. You don't have to understand that, okay, I have to give the IP it gave me in return so that it knows who I am when I'm talking to it. That will just happen. With, with, probable, with probability, right? It's obviously the smarter it is. If you get in there and you actually say, this IP needs to be in this, I don't use I3, I use DWM. Um, basically, if you have, uh, this allows you to just treat everything as an object, right? You parse everything into these objects. And when you parse everything into these objects, they go into pools. And then when you, you request these objects in the future, you'll just get them. And that means by nature, you likely will start responding to challenge, challenge uh, responses, right? You'll, you'll deserialize a GUID that was sent to you, and you use that GUID as a token to access a dynamically allocated RPC endpoint. And you then fuzz and you mutate. And your mutator is like, okay, fill in the GUID with a random GUID. And one of those GUIDs could be from that local packet. Now you have actually had a conversation with the server without even knowing. Yeah. Yeah. So that, it's been like three or four months in the making. Obviously, it didn't take that long to write the code. It took a lot of time to theorize and design this. Um... But I hacked this together to make those object pools offline to kind of make it work. And yesterday on my Discord, I finally had an epiphany. I can actually make these object pools generically now. So, does that make sense? I know that was a two-hour tangent, but this shit is really hard. Um, and I think you can see how this is insane. Because it, it, it allows you to deserialize things like byte by byte, like tiny fields that you would never want to allocate. And the nature of allocating those, the nature of putting numeref around this U8 means that this U8 is now in a database. I now can query and I'm like, give me a U8 and it will give you U8s that you have saved. And it will get better the more U32s you actually label GUID or whatever it is. Yep. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so this allows you to start off by treating everything as just, it's just a vec of bytes. And then you parse out the header, and now you understand there's a length, and there's a, a routing number. And then you understand beyond that, and you recognize that there's a type, and then there's a, an ASN1, right? This allows you to, this allows you to um, uh, incrementally write a fuzzer, right? Does that make sense? So you can start by writing a fuzzer where you're like, it's just a fucking blob of bytes. That's all it is. And then you slowly pick out, you slowly parse more, you slowly add more fields, you slowly add more understanding of what it is. And there you go. Now you have, uh, you've parsed it into objects. And now when you mutate these objects, if you ask for a U32, you get U32s. You don't get a random U32. You don't get a random U32 that's kind of biased towards the first thousand numbers and then a random chance of being a completely random U32, you get U32s that you have observed before to make sense in those contexts. This would shred ASN1. This would shred anything. Like, even though this looks like you would use this for, like, structured binary data, there's no reason you can't do this also for XML. Right? This could be a numeref for like uh, for uh, for like a I don't know what XML uh, a tag. Right? Now it's a tag. Okay. Well, all you have to do is you have to write something that understands how to parse a tag, and maybe uh, maybe like paren matching or like nesting of like tags or depth, like stacks and stuff like that. I, like. While from a very high level view, it appears like this would make sense for binary protocols, I genuinely believe, and I shit on everyone in my life who has ever said this before, I genuinely believe this is a universal solution to mutational fuzzing. Like, seriously. Like, a lot of the ones I've looked at are some shitty things written in Python that can only serialize 500 kilobytes a second of data, so you end up spending 99%, like, 
this can this can do real perf numbers like this can do real perf and it shares as much as it can in the numa pool it keeps them local like when I ask for an object, I am likely going to get an IP from the NUMA pool, which means that I'm not creating a new allocation for that. I am literally just changing a, a pointer in my structure that is otherwise unmodified to now point to a different value for that field. Um, and all of that will just transparently be consumed at serialization time. So, so if you want to see what this can do, uh, let's make an example. Let mute foo is equal to vec uh, new. Uh, and we'll do... Um, yeah, so I actually wrote... Oh, I think it's commented out right now. Uh, because, yeah, prefix slice. So prefix slice is a built-in thing. Um, here's prefix slice. So prefix slice is, once again, a wrapper transparent around a numeref. So it's literally an eye size. Uh, but it allows you to uh, deserialize length prefixed uh, data. So in elements, and let me just fix this. The pool ID stuff is broken, but I actu actually know how to fix that now. So what I can do is I can pull in a prefix slice, and we can say, I want to deserialize. Let's say my header is a prefixed slice of ID, because it has to be a ref ID. And then it is a slice of... Um, T is the PT, which is prefixed by T. So uh, let's say a U32. So U32 is the length, or we'll say a U16 of U8s, right? Actually, we'll do a U32 so we can do big numbers. Um, okay. And deserialize. We'll just nuke that. Uh, deserialize not found in the scope. Prefix slice not in the scope. Uh, do I not double? Do I not re-export that? I thought I did. I might have deleted that or commented that out. Yeah, I did. Okay, bam. Um, once again, some of this code's in uh, slight changes. Type annotations needed for this. So this is going to be the data. This is like uh, this packet, right? And the packet is of ec new. And then we'll do packet.extend from slice ref of uh, the length. Let's just say one, one, two, three, four, five, six, u32s, um, dot two le bytes, right? So this is a, uh, we're basically just serializing the length and then four blah in zero dot dot one, one, two, three, four, five, six. Then we'll do packets dot push five U8, right? So this has now created what I want to deserialize. And all I have to do now is just a header uh, deserialize uh, LA. Um, yeah, is it just that? Uh, oh, yeah, the data. Uh, let pointer is equal to, this is a mutable reference, and this is just packet dot dot. So, right, that's just a, a, a stream, basically. Mute pointer, unwrap. Right? So now we're just going to deserialize that message, and that wasn't even a release build. So there's a release build. It's instantaneous. Um, so let's go, let's just change it. Let's go to one, two, three billion. So this is a gigabyte, a billion bytes. Um, is it? Nine, yes. Unwrap. Uh, why did that fail? Oh, because my pool is empty. Uh, so we'll set the size of my pool to four gigs, right? Okay, and a lot of this is just creating this. Uh, so let's make a timer around this. IT is uh, standard time instant now. Literally creating this buffer is taking a lot of time. Uh, so this will time the actual time it took to deserialize it. Elapsed, which might be zero. If it optimizes it out. I don't think it... No, it didn't. Okay. One second to, opt, uh, to deserialize... Uh, 1 billion U8s, right? So it deserialized the U32, and then it deserialized 1 billion U8s. Uh, but what we can do now is we can also say, so this is, this will give me a slice, right? So elk is equal to this, and if I were to say print line, um, this is the length, so we'll do la.getElk.foo. So this is getting the prefix slice, and I think I have to, 
um, I have to get the field. I forget what I call it. Dot val. I think if I deref, it derefs to, uh, it derefs to a numeref. Okay. So I should be able to just deref that, and that will actually give me the numeref. Um, can't be a uh, default formatter because it's literally a slice of bytes. And then the length of that uh, doesn't have a size. Uh, DRFREF. No. What am I doing here? Um, numeref. Uh, da, 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 dot len on elk.foo. DRF that. Oh, double DRF. Is it? No. No, that is a numeref. LA dot get numeref. Doesn't have a Oh, get slice. Yeah. You have to use get slice if it's a slice. Um, it made the API a little cleaner to do it that way. So yeah, you can see I deserialized all those bytes. Uh, 47 millis. Okay. I don't know why that's faster now. All right. Now, what we can do is let's make this really, really, really hard on it. Let's now say that this is um, not a slice of a billion bytes. This is now a uh, this is now a numeref. So this is a slice of allocations of bytes. So these this is a slice of pointers, if that makes sense. We have to up this to be large enough to hold that list of pointers. So now this is deserializing, where every single byte gets its own allocation, and this is probably going to be pretty slow. Um, Four point four eight seconds, right? But check this out. Uh, profile release, uh, opt. Uh, we don't need opt level. We can do LTO is fat, and then we can do code gen units is one. Here we go. Maybe no speed up. Four point five six. Okay, no speed up. Um, that's still really good. 4.56 seconds to deserialize a billion bytes into their own separate allocations. <laughs> right? Yeah, that's pretty good. So what is that in bytes per second? This divided by seconds. Yeah, we're doing, we're deserializing 250 megabytes per second where every single byte is its own allocation. <laughs> Every single byte is its own allocation. Uh, let's see what happens when we go back to this. Um, this might get optimized out. 1.33. There's a lot of variance on this. Uh, I'm not 100% sure why. Let's see. Uh, we'll just loop this. Um... Let's see if that time is inconsistent here. Yeah. So the first run's particularly long. You can see it stabilizes, and that's probably just that allocation. Like, we just created that, that allocation. And the first time we deserialized that, we actually uh, we hit those pages and we pulled them into the pool, right? So this is this is doing about two gigabytes a second of deserializing of U8s. Um, slow by normal measures, yeah. So if I were to say, uh, let's say this is U uh, U128s, right? Uh, dot two le bytes. Uh, let's make sure we have enough RAM for this. I think we do. Um. Uh, extend from slice. And then let's get the size of the actual payload. Uh, let uh, data is uh, packet.len, because that's in bytes. Uh, and then we can do um, as sex f64. Uh, and then we'll do packet.len as f64 divided by 1024 by 1024 divided by this. So this is now in uh, mega mid maybe bytes per second, if that makes sense. And it's considering the actual size of everything here now. That has to be two LE bytes. It doesn't matter. 
So this might take a while because this is massive. Keep in mind, we're literally going to bottleneck on RAM. <laughs> like, yeah, we're getting, we're getting 6.7 gigabytes a second of deserialization or 6,700 megabytes a second of deserialization, which is pretty fucking good. <laughs> this is, uh, this is in meg, uh, in megabit multiplies by eight. We're at like 60 meg, uh, 60 gigabit per second, uh, on a single core. Remember, this is a single core. Um, yeah. So... Uh, okay, let's try it now where we put these in pools. Because the U8, the U8 is the worst case scenario, right? So let's try this. Now it's U128s in a pool. So they're much, much bigger allocation. They're 16 byte allocation. They're massive allocations. Um, ooh, am I gonna run out of side? No, no, I should be fine. Let's see what happens. Oh, is Grizzly still worked? Yeah, I gotta add those back. So we were getting like 6. Point, what was it? 6.7. And this should be slower by quite a bit. Yeah. We're still getting <laughs> We're getting 5.2 gigabytes a second when we're deserializing every single 16 byte thing into its own allocation. I wish Grizzly still worked. Yeah, let me grab that quick. Uh Keep in mind this is on a single slow core. These are only 2.1 gigahertz cores. These are very 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 slow cores. They're uh they're about as slow as Twitch chat's brain, you know? Understand who you are. I need to make a song thing as well so you can see uh song information. This is a simple. Let's grab a couple of these commanderinos. Whoop, and we'll do add command uh YouTube this. Uh add command uh commands add a uh, twitter um and okay edit this uh commands add uh what is this computer okay so we need to do gamey Oh, gamey has changed. I don't even know if the old gamey command was right. Nope, that's old, so we gotta change that. Oh, and Biggie. Oh, Biggie's also gone. Oh, we gotta, yeah, a lot of these gotta change. Uh, uh, this is now Tupac. Tupac is now the storage server. <laughs> uh, edit. Yeah, Tupac's the new server. Uh, Grizzly. Th those didn't change. Uh, commands. And I didn't add the command yet, damn it! Fuck! Piss! <laughs> Tupac. Uh, this is Grizzly. Okay, and then Polar. Grizzly. Fucking assholes. Okay. Commands add polar this. Piss! <laughs> uh, and then we got... Uh, camera. Uh, then we have... I guess we had mouse as well. <laughs> Fuck it. P 
People like that stupid shit, so whatever. Uh, oh, Rust Book. That's a good one. Bam. Um, oh, yep. Uh, this is a good one, too. Commands, add, chair. Then we need gamey. What is this? This is... Uh, 120 gigs of RAM? Yeah. Uh, uh, commands, feet, add, uh, gamey. Gamey as, uh, 2x, uh, Xeon 4310. And this is, um, uh, 24 cores, 48 threads. 128 gigabytes of RAM, uh, GTX 3090, and then uh, 100 uh, GBE. Uh, uh, 100 GBase, uh, 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 what is it? 100, uh, 100 uh, GBase CWDM4, I think? Okay. And then I don't even remember what fucking Tupac is. Uh, uh, I gotta look at the invoice. Uh, let's see what I got for that. And what we can uh, we can edit this and say at two point gigahertz. Okay, and then uh, let's see what Tupac is. Tupac's a, a doozy. Tupac's real hot. New Nick's coming soon. We get to write uh, we get to write hundred gigabit drivers pretty soon here. That's gonna be a fun stream. Um. Okay. So it looks like uh, it was epic. Yeah. Commands. Add Tupac. Uh. Two X. Epic, uh, 7313 at, uh, 3 gigahertz, uh, 32 cores, uh, 64 threads, uh, I think only 128 gigs of RAM, yeah, 128 gigs of RAM, um, 100 gigabits, and, uh, a 24X, uh, Samsung, uh, PM983, uh, 1.92, uh, terabyte, uh, I don't know, what is it, like, 150 gigabytes second of sequential, uh, read-write, something like that, yeah, that's about right, doing Ethernet, uh, yeah, I'm doing Ethernet with RDMA, uh, and that's Tupac. I think that's basically all the stats that matter. 150 gigs sequential read, right? And that's true. I've confirmed it. Uh, it does like, uh, I think it's 50 gigs sequen- Uh, 50 gigs random 4K read and like fifth like eight gigs random write. It doesn't- I don't think I can saturate 100 gigabit with random writes. But I can definitely saturate with random reads. And do an SMB direct off my NAS? Oh, hell yeah. Yeah, I actually don't have RDMA on my uh, Epic server because my shitty Mellanox NICs don't work in it. Well, or the shitty hardware doesn't work at the Mellanox NICs. But I've gotten, I've just bought new uh, dual port NICs. So we're going to switch to 200 gigabit. Uh, 200 gigabit, uh, well, it's a dual port 100 gigabit NIC. Uh, and that's an Intel E810. And that's going to be way, way, way nicer hardware than the shitty 2014 Mellanox Nix that were, like, barely came out when 100 gigabit came out. NVMe raid? Yeah. Oh, yeah, I should probably add that shit. Yeah. This is, uh, this is, uh, this is, uh, ba -ba -ba -ba. raid 10. Uh, so that is what 1. Python 1.92 times 24 divided by 2, uh, tw 23 terabytes uh, usable storage. Um, uh, that RAID 10 plus two hot spares. That's what that is. 
I think I think that's everything. Edit. Yeah, I'm running two hot spares. That was my decision. I'm really happy with that setup. Uh, 7313 as a beast is pretty good. It's pretty good. It was basically the only silicon I could get. <laughs> Doing quad two terabyte and raid zero. Oh, Jesus, you're fucking high. Are they M2? No, they're U2s. They're U2s. So they're, uh, they're, they're on trays. How's the fiber install going? It's spliced. Which main board? Uh, I mean, we can add that. Um... All my stuff is super micro. Um... Uh, chassis. Yes. There we go. I think that's probably about everything. What else? Is there anything else? We have Discord. I think that's good. Yeah. Heads. I don't wear a headset. But I do have, uh, what are these? H8s? H8s? Something like that. An OS2 LCLC run in a couple weeks. With a 40 gig core update. Fuck yeah. OnlyFans? They rejected me on OnlyFans. They said I didn't have like a fucking uh, online presence. Uh, I think, I think I know what that means. Um, I'm sure if I pester them more, I could probably figure it out. <sighs> Nabbed a quad 40 gig port? Fuck yeah. Oh, for that? Wow, that's free. Let me know if you got bored of your components. I do need to get rid of Biggie. And I, I've i got, what? I've got a 64-core AMD machine with 5 total gigs of RAM that i got to get rid of. I've got a, I don't know if it's 16 or 32-core with, like, 64 gigs of RAM AMD machine i got to get rid of. Uh, I don't know. I've got a lot of old hardware. I'm keeping my Fi forever. I'm never getting rid of my Fi. That's, uh, that's an artifact. Um, I don't know. Technically, I have four, four, or eight, four terabyte hard drives, but I might just move those online. I might DD them a couple times and then move them for, like, stream storage. Because I don't need sequential access for streams. And I think that can saturate, like, 150 or 200 megabytes a second, which is fine for, like, uploading streams and archiving streams. I could even stream to them directly, and then I... Then I don't feel as pressured to delete stuff, but I also don't want pl uh, platters in my house anymore. You got a spare 8176L hanging around? Nope. No, I don't. Fives are just going to get harder to get. Yeah, I really want to complete out my FI. I, wanna, I only have one of four blades in it, and I really want to max out all the four blades, and I'd love to get the highest. I'd, I don't know how, but I'd really like to get Knight's Mill. I don't think I can. But yeah, someone asked about the internet. The internet is spliced, and it's spliced to the point that I have a 6LC connector. So it's a 48, um, do I have 6? Yeah. So it's a 48 uh, fiber pull. So I've got 48 fibers that drop into my house, and then they spliced out. So when you open that, there's like four jackets, and they, uh... They set up a patch panel, so I literally have a patch panel with uh, six LC connectors. So I guess they did a, a quarter of it. So half of or a, a quarter of the fibers are spliced out. The other quarter are just left in the raw form. They won't be connected. And I'm hoping that that gets activated in the next two weeks, but I still don't have the switch yet. There are two Knights Mills from Italy on eBay. Oh my god, that's hot. Xeon Fives, yeah. You're running MP... Uh, no, I'm running single mode for everything. The fiber that they dropped into my house is 48 pairs because that's just the... You know, that was like a, a mile-long pull, and that's just probably the smallest cable they're willing to pull because it's like armored cable. You can't really get armored... I mean, you can get armored, like, single pairs, but that's probably just literally what they have on hand because it is a backhaul fiber run, 
and they just probably just they just probably don't stock anything other than that. I mean, I'm only going to be using literally two of the 48 fibers. Um, locally in my house, I, everything is single mode fiber, which I pay a little bit extra for to do that. But it means I don't have MPO. Uh, cable. I do have MPO between me and my server room. So I have a breakup box uh, patch panel that goes between my desk and my server room that is three MPO 12s. And then it just turns into... I can't pull it because it's actually locked in. But it, it turns into, um, what is that, 36, uh, well, 36 over 2, 18 LC pairs. So I have 18 LC single mode OS2 fibers um, that go over three very, very small things. So it's just less to pull. I'm still running single mode. I'm still running LC um, that's just, a it's just a, a trunk, basically. And those trunks are hot as fuck, dude. Define armored, um, probably pulling cable with, I mean, you're pulling literally, like, glass threads with probably 500 to 1,000 pounds of force through a mile of bending, windy conduit. Armored in that sense. What kind of switch? It, yeah, it's a Sienna switch. And there was a model number. I had a model number, but that model number only has one gigabit for local. So they have their like upstream stuff is 10 gigabit, but locally it's only one gigabit. So there's no way that's the switch that I'm actually going to get. So it's probably just a slightly n newer gen or slightly more spec'd out thing. But it's, uh, it's just going to be a one U switch. And their patch panel is going to patch into that over LR. Um, and then I'm going to patch out of that switch with my LR to my, to my router. Uh, our, my router might not be able to keep up. So we'll see what happens there. But their switch is what does the... Um, their switch does all the metering and, and bandwidth limiting, if I'm not mistaken. It's the new switch 100 gig. Uh, I, I already have 100 gig switches in. So my whole my whole backbone at home is 100 gig. Um, I've got 100 gig, and then I've got around in random rooms I have uh, 40 gig trunked uh, one gig switches. So like 48 port switches with 10 gig, uh, four 10 gig uplinks that then go into the 100 gigabit switch through a through a breakout cable that converts the it converts the 100 gigabit port into four 10 gig things, and then those go into those switches such that I get true, like, full duplex one gig on those, even though I have a couple devices. And then I have a couple PoE switches in the racks that are uh, cop. All of my copper in my house is one gig. I have a 10 gig copper switch, but I literally don't even use it anymore. It's just not even plugged in. Um, and then that is... Yeah, that's it. Like, all my access points and stuff just run on copper over PoE, so my, I have 48-port PoE switches in my server rooms. And then I just run whenever I need to plug something in, like a clock or a... Well, I haven't got my clocks yet, I need to. Um, but, like, access points and stuff, I just run some Cat5 or Cat6 and plug it in, and that's it. So, and then those run directly to the server room. Um... I got, uh, I got, uh, I went with the, uh, Seastone DXO10s, the Celestica Seastone DXO10s. They're really cheap used, uh, but you have to build and flash all of that software yourself manually. So that's not really, uh, that's not really a switch that you can manage unless you are willing to literally build, deploy, and maintain Sonic yourself. Um, so that's, they're... I mean, they're data center switches. Like, they are meant for, like, IT, dedicated engineering teams writing, maintaining the software that runs on them. So they're not really, like, commodity uh, hardware. And that's why they're so fucking cheap, right? I'm looking forward to network storage benchmarking. We're probably never going to do that. That networking storage is all offline. So I would maybe do a blog on it at some point, but uh, but yeah, there's uh, that won't be done on a stream. That's already offline. 
What's the throughput? I'm getting uh, four gigabit full duplex. Yeah, this is literally a data center. Yes, it is. It definitely is. <laughs> uh, and hopefully next gen, I have enough money to buy new stuff. So I bought those Mellanox NICs and then I replaced them. So all of my servers now are new. All of my hard drives are new. All of my NICs, my 100 gig NICs are now going to be new once those arrive. That's going to probably be a couple weeks for those to come and ship. Um, so the only things that are now used on my network and like kind of a gen old are my switches. For the copper switches, I don't give a fuck. Like uh, one gig switches reached their peak performance in 2005. So those are fine. Um, and then I have, I have a bunch of switches inside that are one gig switches, but they're, um, they're passive. There's no active cooling, which is mandatory. I don't allow fans in my house. Uh, no fans allowed. So that is a lot of work. But yeah, I think really just those switches. But I mean, new 10, 100 gig switches or 200 gig switches or 400 gig switches, if I wanted to upgrade, those are like thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 a piece. And I need two of them. So that's probably going to be a no for me, bruh. Um, the switches I have are great. They... Uh, I mean, I'm not routing. I'm not doing layer three. I'm just doing layer two. I don't use VLANs. I don't believe in VLANs. Uh, VLANs are just extra overhead and configuration and bullshit. I mean, VLANs are great if you want to VLAN, but I will. I would rather buy physical switches than do VLANs. I don't like them at all. Have you seen uh, Intel's new co-packaged co -packaged optic A6 for 800 gigs? No, I haven't. 224 gig PAM4. Uh, that makes sense. Packaged directly onto silicon. Interesting. So, like, they have the, like, they have the, like, diodes on silicon. VLANs aren't real. That's pretty fucking true. Hey, Cyber gen Genetic. Gen genetic. How's it going? But, yeah, I'm, once my internet's in, I'm going to do, a, I'm going to do, like, a whole run through of all my hardware. And I have every computer I've ever owned, I think. I have all my laptops, all of my servers, all of my desktops, all of my gaming computers. I've never sold or gotten rid of a computer, so I'm probably going to go through, do like a little history of why I bought the computers I bought, whether I was disappointed, whether I got the perf I expected, you know, what the bottlenecks are, how they encourage me to get new stuff. So that'll probably be like a 15, 20 minute edited YouTube video. Uh, with a lot of like up close 4k 60 shots of the servers and the racks and panning shots And it'll be like a little bit more artistic and um, I mean, I have no idea what I'm doing So it might not turn out well, but I think I can pull it off So that'll be fun VC cell lasers in the silicon. That's disgusting Cloud devs in chat like take that back on your VLANs aren't real They can't hurt me I have a stack of old laptops that are nearly four feet tall. Yeah. I've got my favorite laptop, which has uh, three serial ports and two parallel ports on it. And I did some OS dev on that because that, I basically had like 80 GPIO pins through those parallel ports, which was so fun. I, that's like, that's where I did like bit banging stuff when I didn't have like, uh, when I didn't have like flash, um, flash programmers. And so I just used the laptop instead and I just like wired it out and then bit banged the, the parallel port pins at like probably 10 kilohertz. But hey, it works. Two parallel ports on a laptop, on a laptop and three serial ports or two serial ports. Yeah, dude. Takes me back to the 90s. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's got it's it's exactly what you expect. <laughs> Bit banging LPT1 and QBasic. Yep. Hell yeah. Oh god. Okay, let's uh, I gotta pee. Grab another thing. Then I'll pick some music and then I'll show you uh, what our plans are for this code. Two proper serial ports. Yeah, the real serial ports show up as like three fit and two of eight. Nope, not universal serial. Nope, they are real, real with like DTS, RTS, ring. <laughs> I'm just naming pins I know. 
Uh, VLANs do feel hacky, yeah. All right, I'll be right back. I'm going to refill my water. Hopefully my ice cream is thawed. Probably not. All right, got water, got Pop-Tarts, let's kill some time. IRQ conflicts and everything? Yeah, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be the same without it, right? <laughs> no ice cream, yeah. Nope, Pop-Tarts. Ice cream won't be thawed until tomorrow. All right. All right, what are we going to do? How are we going to kill some time? Let's play some Xenotic for a second while I eat. How's my Twitter looking? Am I famous yet? All right. Uh, all pull. I think they actually have been making some uh, UI changes to Zonotic, so let's see what we get. Kind of high. Qu it's a Pop Tart, okay? It's a fucking Pop Tart, Geek Pirate. You wouldn't understand. <laughs> you wouldn't understand. Here in Seattle, too? Yeah. Going to tour camp? No. No plans to go to any conferences right now. Next conference I'm really going to go out of my way to go to is Offensive Con in Germany. That's where I want to give a talk on the new Vec Emu, but I don't know if he'll be ready by then.
All right, let's see how we do today. What do you think about Kira? Was that Geohot's debugger thing? Yeah. Yeah, I think it has about the code quality of a hacking tool. <laughs> Offensive con? Yeah. So my favorite conference, uh, inf Infiltrate, is dead. So, so that's over. No, I don't know. I'm just sick of these hacking tools that are like, they're fucking written in Python. You get like two instructions per hour. And it's just useless. Like you realize that like it takes Chrome like literally two billion instructions to start running. Like literally the initialization sequence is billions of instructions. And all these tools are like N cubed. And by the time you get to N of like 10,000, you're already running like minutes of runtime. It's, they're fucking garbage, dude. They're useless. Like, I'd rather have solutions that work on real targets than have theoretical solutions that work on theoretical targets. Like, I recognize that all the academics and shit think that they're like doing th progress or something, but you're not. Like, the hard problems isn't symbolic execution, it's symbolic execution at a scale where you can do it on a real piece of software. Like, it's not hard to write an emulator, it's not r hard to write a JIT, it's not hard to do tracing, it's not hard to parse a log to symbolize it. Like, none of these things are fucking hard. Making them fast and usable and work on real targets is hard. Isn't most of the bottlenecky stuff in C? It is, yeah. No, Kira's totally fine. I mean, Kira's definitely got issues, but it's just not. It's it's a CTF. It's a CTF tool. It's not a hacking tool. It's a CTF tool, right? We all know, like, it's not a slight of Geohot. Like, we know he's capable of doing more than that, but he didn't have to, because it's not a it's not a problem where he wanted to do more. It's it's literally for small CTFs. They're a couple k in size where. Why would you bother making a really hard to use complicated API that scales? Woof. Woof. Hey, new PB. Wow. I am slow. Oh shit. Oh my God. Oh shit. You can pre-run it. Uh, can you pre-run this by going through the spikes at the start? Monkas. Hmm. What's the thing that Mubix did? I don't know. Damn. Most of the hard work uh, is on making the iteration effort on fuzzing lore without nerfing the coverage. Yeah. Okay, it's, it's a fucking pop tart! <laughs> if my ice cream was thawed, then I would be eating fucking cookies and cream. 
<laughs> Pop tart is the best ice cream. Pop tarts are just bay, dude. The cinnamon roll pop tarts are actually really good. Oh god, I thought I had that. No cookies and cream, yeah. Monkas. Monkas. Oof. Fucking Roblox oof.jpg dot mp4 dot exe. Wow, that's tight. Okay, that's very tight. There's some vertical tolerance, but it's a it's a horizontal problem. No ruby, only gust, uh, rust. C and go. What's C and go? What are C and go? Crap and garbage objects. <laughs> Oh! PHP 7? Or late? Wait. Do we have a PHP stan? Vbits, thank you so much for the bits. Or not the bits, the prime. The 11 months. Thank you so much. I uh, so hope you're enjoying the stream. We'll get to coding in a second here. Just finishing my Pop-Tarts. I let go. Yeah. Yeah. Go's actually a great language. I mean, it's trash, but it's good. <laughs> mm. I want to get through this door at 600 units. I can't believe this room exists. This sucks. Ooh, that like clipped me. Interesting. Ooh. YouTube uses Go for their My MySQL clear stuff? Yeah, no wonder my videos take so fucking long to upload. Jesus. <laughs> Why uh, MySQL when you, when you could have no sequel? Big thinking. Our... Uh, I already coded in uh, Ruby and JS like 10 years ago. Now migrating to Rust on my free time. We're going to go like, fuck yeah, and Ruby. Is it web scale? Nothing is web scale. Linux is not web scale. At least I can start a Linux machine in 100 millis using Golang by shelling out to Rust. <laughs> oh my god. The language hate, dude. So intense. What am I gonna do if I get through this gate and I throw away this run? Ruby is nice if speed doesn't matter. Doesn't that go for basically all languages? Do you think distributed systems like Spark scale? I don't know what Spark is, but I I'm gonna say no. I don't know what it is, but I can pretty much guarantee you it doesn't scale. Because Linux literally doesn't scale. And most of these things are built on Linux. Anyone who claims that they can scale who is running their software on Linux is lying because Linux itself can't scale. Lua's nice if sanity doesn't matter. Lua is nice. Just full stop. Lua is actually not a bad language. Still working on versions at Microsoft? No, I rage quit like a year and a half ago. I'm gonna be the odd one out and shill for C sharp. I think C sharp is a fantastic language. I I don't. Uh, it only gets shit on because it's Microsoft, but it's actually I think way better than Go, and it's been around longer than Go. Like it, I I don't understand how everyone saw Go and was like Google code. Google so good. Google 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 never make mistake. Google 
Oh, so good. But dude, it's Go is just shittier C fucking sharp written by Google. Jeez. <laughs> F sharp is the tits? Yeah. Yeah. To the four developers in the world who know it and use it. Oh! Oh, I thought I had it. That was uh, my reaction when I uh, saw ghosts. <laughs> I started making those Google noises. <laughs> Google never makes mistakes. Ha <laughs> ha. How many successful social media websites has Google uh, killed? <laughs> <laughs> Go was written by someone who thought creating and spawning threads is free. So, uh, yeah, that's going to be a good surprise for them when they realize what reality is. C Sharp wasn't even open source when Go came out? Yeah, that's true. What, you, you got a problem with their .NET runtime, dude? You hating on your .NET runtime? You don't support Microsoft by buying Visual Studio? Huh? <laughs> okay, we should give up on this. Let's just go out and, and, and do normal runs. And, you know, at least that way I thought I could maybe cheese it so that I could feel good about myself. But instead, we're just going to have to realize that we suck at this game. I can't remember the best route on this map. Not that. Ghost thread management is actually pretty clean. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. I mean, it's not a bad implementation, uh, but it turns out that threads just suck. I don't know. Too many people think threads are free and they're just wrong. Woo! Woo! <laughs> people who write micro suck. Wind blows. Wind blows with a dollar sign. Dollar, dollar, dollar. God forbid you pay for software. All software should be free and as shitty as Linux. Woo. Stallman to the rescue. GCC is great. Great code. Woo. Woo. Grep scales with cores. Woo. Woo. Core Utils actually fucking doesn't crash every time you use it. Woo! Woo! Bin Utils isn't a heap of shit. Woo! What is this? What happened? Okay, I die. I die. Isn't there a Weezer song about threads and how they unravel? I don't know. You think I listen to Weezer, dude? What kind of boomer ass music do you think I listen to? Have you experienced with Rust Async? Yeah, every time I've used it, I've regretted it. I like it. I really like it. I wish it was usable, but it's absolute ass. It's just shit, dude. It could be so good, but the ecosystem's ass. Tokyo is slow shit. I don't know. I thought about making my own async library, and maybe that would be passably usable, but uh, I don't know. Tokyo's fucking trash. Nah. C Sharp does async the best. You, you are unironically absolutely correct. C Sharp does do async the best. Rust async is just. Mm. I don't know. If you have the time, you have the brains, and you have the energy, just just write a select loop. Grab like an event polling loop, create and do your event polling yourself. Don't don't use don't use async to like hack in lightweight threads. It's just shit, dude. It just really is. It just it's crazy how slow those are. It, it, they shouldn't even be that slow, but there's just too many too many cooks in the kitchen working on those libraries, those APIs, and those design standards. <laughs> zero cost async. It is zero cost async. But I mean, 
it, it's zero cost on top of async as a paradigm and async as a paradigm will always always be slower async is a coding convenience thing it's not it's not for perf it's not for speed up it's a convenience thing it might allow you to get more performance with simpler code but ultimately at the end of the day async will always always be slower than selects and pulls it is by nature an increase of overhead always Isn't it good for IO bound programs? I mean, async, I would rather have the code I use written by other developers be written in async for IO bound stuff. Because the average developer is basically Twitch chat, and thus the average person benefits from async. Absolutely. It's lighter weight than threads. It's way better than spawning threads. It's way better than someone trying to use polling libraries because they, they don't know how they work. They don't know what a select is. They don't know what a file descriptor is. They don't know how to keep their queues nice and short. So yes, for like, for, for Twitch chat programmers, async is gonna be better. But at the end of the day, it's always more expensive and slower than manually handling it yourself. And that goes for anything. Everything's an abstraction. Abstractions are not free. Unless they're Rust, then they're zero cost. <sighs> Dude, I don't like this map. I don't know why, but I suck at this map. I wonder if it's because I'm left-handed. Ooh, no, that was an okay start. e -pull Master Ace? No, KQ, dude. KQ. Get, get out of here with your fucking Linux garbage. Oh, we got an e poll. Yeah, okay, dude. FreeBSD has had your lunch for like 50 decades. E poll, e -poll is just cope, dude. E poll is a bunch of GNU, toe cheese eating, skin picking, toe flake eating, fucking Linux open source nerds. Whereas BSD is the chat OS with KQ, proper APIs, man pages that ship with the system, a stable syscall API, a libc that's included with the system and doesn't break every fucking libc standard on the planet, a libc that doesn't go out of bounds when you do string operations by default, you know? And uh, yeah, and you don't have GPL licenses. What's the joke, FreeBSD devs will all run Max? <laughs> FreeBSD is still used by people. Hey, 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 hey. FreeBSD is good, okay? The Switch chat is probably 50k an hour combined. Epool is a batshit crazy API. You know it's a batshit crazy API? Futex. Fucking Futex. OpenBSD, best BSD? Yeah, if you, if you don't care about perf. <laughs> now, OpenBSD source code is... <sighs> How do I put this? How do I put this? OpenBSD source code is some of the best out there in terms of... Uh, written code quality? Question mark? In terms of security, not so much. How about IOU ring? IOU ring is is meh. I, I don't know. Like I like IOU ring conceptually is mandatory. It's a it's a mandatory way of doing networking. You 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 like the fucking Berkeley sockets API is trash. The fact that that is how we still do sockets is pathetic. Because it's a terrible, 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 terrible API. But, but, IOU ring is, IOU ring is corporate code. It's, uh, it's a bunch of big ass companies got their dicks in a little pinata and made IOU ring. And that's basically what Linux is now. 
Linux, like, everyone always shits on it. Like, I don't, I don't want to use Windows. It's a Microsoft. It's corporate code. Dude, what do you think Linux is? Linux is literally, like, 10 big tech companies fighting over the same code base. Like, all of them don't give a fuck about that code base. If Intel can slide in some new driver support so that they can sell some hardware, they will do it. Even if it fucks up the entire networking stack. They don't give a fuck, dude. That shit is just... Dude, Linux Linux is literally like NASCAR drivers. It, it's, a, it's a kernel that has like 50 Zoom Zoom badges on it from all these different corporations who fuck it left, right, and center with their, with their stupid-ass additions so that they can sell their shitty-ass product. Dick Pinyana. <laughs> GNU Herd will be the best. Ah, yes. Yes. What do you use for heavy IO bound stuff? I just write, I mean, I, <laughs> I mean, I just write my own OS. <laughs> like any, like anything. If I, if I'm bottlenecking on something, I'm just going to write my own OS. It's just going to solve every problem I have. What do you think about Serenity OS? I think it's cool. I think it's a hobby OS. Not, that's not meant to be insulting, but um, it's kind of just uh, kind of a continuation of everything we've been doing wrong since 1980. Same with Fuchsia. Once again, a lot of respect for the Fuchsia devs. Love the Fuchsia devs. They're big in, uh, big in the OS dev channels and stuff, and I talk to them all the time, but I don't think we need another... Uh, I don't think we need another uh, Unix derivative. Everything's a fucking file like sort of system i don't i don't know like it, it's it's time to come up with an idea beyond what was uh, imagined in 1965 i think we can do better we have we have threads we literally have a fundamental operating primitive that we did not have in when we designed these operating systems yet we s keep designing the exact same fucking operating systems it's a monolithic kernel Every fucking time, a monolithic kernel that doesn't handle threads, the way you handle threads is you just put big-ass locks around everything. What do you think about Plan 9? I think theoretically it could be great, but it's at this point, it's just too dated. Like, design-wise, it's pretty cool, but it's... I mean, it's just old code. It's just old code in an old style for old hardware. And, uh, yeah, uh, technology has progressed since, since the 80s, so it's, it's time for... Uh, it's time to maybe try something different, you know? You know, computers are a thousand times faster and have a lot of cores. Maybe we should design a system that, I don't know, uses the cores? That would be interesting, but I don't know. <laughs> NT, I like NT. Uh, you can hate on NT all you want, but I'd rather deal with fucking NT and UTF-16 where I can actually use it in different countries than Linux and like hacked in fucking code page shit. Don't get me wrong, Windows had code pages too, but I wish Singularity had become more of a thing. Yeah, I, something like that will just never happen at a company. Linux is probably the last OS we see. Companies don't want to take risk and develop anything new because they don't have any technical people who can actually make an OS. And they don't want to take the risk. And then an OS is kind of too hard to do as like a small company. So we're just going to get Linux bolt-ons and that's it for the rest of our lives. We're probably never going to see an OS in the rest of our lives, like a new mainstream OS. NT is a way better kernel in Linux. It's just the Windows APIs that suck. Except the graphics API? Uh, what? But yeah, I, I'm interested in maybe making, uh, maybe making my own like hosting provider and like Linux replacement for like a lot of, uh, basic Linux applications, you know, PHP, MySQL, uh, Nginx, Apache, stuff like that. I'm pretty sure I can just slaughter Linux, uh, for both file system performance and network performance and threading performance. I'm pretty sure I could find like a 10 or 100x over Linux for uh, most applications. 
Just need more Rust OS libs? So let me cargo install my kernel. Yeah. I don't know, man. The problem is every like crate, like there, there's some good crates for like, uh, what are the embedded devices? Um, the little arm boards, not Raspberry Pis, but there's like, uh, there's, there's like a Rust library for like making your own embedded RTOS and it's just, it's great for learning. It's great for like students, but I just, I'm so sick of this shit being like, like people keep building stuff off this. STM32, yeah. It just, yeah, it's great if you want to build a kernel with Legos and, and want to like get something running and you just want access to GPIO pins, but it's just, Dude, the, the programming paradigms we use in OSs are just outdated. It's time to move on. And every time you get libraries like that, they always are just continuations of, like, the most standard CAPIs, libc, Berkeley sockets, everything is a file, monolithic kernels, put shit in globals, don't keep things in locals or use this, everything's a global... When you don't know how to handle threads, put a lock around your entire kernel and call it a day. Say it scales because it, it technically runs without crashing on multiple cores, which is the definition of what scaling is to every big tech company in the fucking world for some reason. You know, it's the whole thing. Hubris fuzzing? I don't, I'm not familiar with that. I think I've read about that. I'm, hub, hubris, 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 hubris. Why do I know that? Sounds like how OpenBSD did it. Yep. And you know what has bugs in OpenBSD? Pretty much every single syscall that does no longer take the giant lock. Like, I remember at Infiltrate, I looked at, uh, I looked at OpenBSD with someone. And we looked like, we saw, it was like, the way they define syscalls, I think, defined whether or not they took the giant lock on the syscall. And there are like three syscalls that no longer took the giant lock that they've like slowly, slowly made not take the giant lock. Race conditions immediately. Within like 10 lines of code, race conditions. Like just open BSD. Once again, you can't, you can't bolt on threads to a fucking OS. I'm so sick of teachers and professors and hobbyists making single threaded OSs. Focusing on like getting a fucking desktop environment and like graphics working and then by the time they have like a fucking browser written They're like, okay, let's add threads and then they add fucking threads and they put a giant lock on everything fuck <laughs> Hubris is oxide to us. So it's probably pretty good then <laughs> <laughs> Tell me I'm fucking wrong. Tell me I'm fucking wrong, dude. Redox OS ironically has the same problem. Like, I'm not even exaggerating or memeing. NT has this problem. Linux has this problem. FreeBSD has this problem. OpenBSD has this problem. Redox has this problem. NetBSD has this problem. Every single operating system. Threading was an afterthought. Threading was always a fucking afterthought. <laughs> are deeply fundamental and you have to think about them at every step yeah you have to design your your apis to handle threads to be able to like select threads numa nodes stuff like that like yeah it's just the, the here's the here's the fundamental source of all of my rants i don't write code to accomplish a goal I have. Like, I don't, I don't say like, I want to make a video game. And then I, I, then I just bash my head on the keyboard until I have a video game, right? I don't say, I want an OS, and then bang my head on the keyboard until I have an OS. I think about it. And it, it's, I, it's a, like a fundamental disconnect that I have. Because you see this with like all of these example hobby projects, you know, these like even these big libraries and like the Rust ecosystem, 
and it's like they're they're not developed to be good they're developed to solve a problem like tokyo it wasn't like they sat down they're like okay how are we going to architect this how are we going to design this what will bite us in the future what are problems that we foresee it's just like let's just start writing code and eventually we'll have an async implementation and that's how everything is written everywhere at companies open source closed source proprietary shit embedded everything is like the goal is to like get something running it's not to like design something i don't think there's really that many people that design software anymore <laughs> unsafe i think you're projecting of course i'm projecting it's literally what everyone that, like that's what emotions are is projecting but it's fucking true we'll optimize it later yeah yeah 200 000 lines of code later you'll maybe optimize the deserializer you wrote five years ago uh-huh 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 yeah mm, sure nope just like, oh, we want to add docx support to our fucking PDF converter. Okay. Well, it's not, okay, well, well, what could we do to make this better? It's just, fuck it. We'll keep pulling in libraries until we open a docx file. Then we'll keep pulling in libraries until the docx file is in a structure. Then we'll keep pulling in files until we have a font creating pixels in a PDF. And then we'll keep pulling in libraries until, oh, wait, oh, there we go. Theoretically, this is now a docx to PDF converter. Cool. <laughs> and a lot of that is because everything, like, companies don't give a fuck about software quality. Because consumers don't give a fuck about software quality. So companies don't care. So they're not going to let you design because they literally want you to ship features and get shit out the door as fast as possible so they can start making money as fast as possible. That's okay. That's what companies are for. Um, but personally, like a lot of smaller personal projects are not really around like designing and coding and architecting and building. They're more about getting to a goal. They wanna make a game. They wanna make a parser. They want to display a cube. They want to write a shader, right? And there's very little along the way. It's just pull shit in until it happens. Come back to Python chat. <laughs> yes, this is what I do. Uh, I don't see what is wrong. Exactly. That's what I said. I said I have a fundamental disconnect. Because I do not empathize with that at all. I'm not saying it's wrong. I am saying I do not think that way. And so it's very strange to me. I don't understand it. I don't, I don't, I've never had things that are like that. And you probably feel the same thing, way about the way I do stuff. Right? That's how this conversation started. Is I, I literally, I don't understand it. Rewriting decades of engineering is a fantasy. It's really not. We could we could just replace Windows and Linux in probably five years. It's just the the reason that we don't do that is a we don't have people who are really in the right mindset and skill set to do it, and b because no one wants to do it. No one wants to do it. Too bad no one will use it? No, everyone would fucking use it. <laughs> like, like, they absolutely would use it. <laughs> that the world right now would easily accept a new operating system. No problem. The world absolutely is ready for it. Like, if some company invested the time and energy to, to write, like, a good Linux replacement, they would print money. They would absolutely print money. Like, it's just, I'm sorry, this, this whole, like, legacy shit is bullshit, dude. Like, 99.9% .9 of programs need 10 different functions exposed by libc. They need, like, open, read, write, close, connect, receive, send. 
congrats. If you provide those in a slightly lower, uh, lower like overhead, higher performance environment, congratulations. You get a shit ton of users immediately. Like it's, it's the whole like backwards compatible shit is just made up, dude. It's in everyone's head. Like everyone thinks that's the case, but it's not. As long as it has a web browser, it doesn't matter much. Yeah, and you can just put a web browser in a fucking VM. You don't even need to run your web browser natively. The web browser is already so bloated that you can literally put Windows in a VM or, or Linux in a VM and run a browser in it. And it's, it's negligibly different from running, uh, from running the browser natively. It, it just doesn't fucking matter. Like... It's already so bloated and so slow and so bottlenecking on so much shit, you wouldn't even notice if there's a VM with Linux in there. Honestly, an OS that can do LAMP stack uh, efficiently, the enterprise market would eat that shit up. Yep, that's basically my plan. Because I'm pretty sure I can single-handedly write a drop-in replacement where you can just run bone stock, Linux target compiled, Apache... MySQL PHP, and I'm pretty sure I can literally just give you like a 10x performance gain over over Linux. And to you, it, it nothing changes. Use the same configure scripts, the same tool chains, the same glibc, the same everything. All that changes is the kernel a bit. And congrats, great. Now you can use one core to serve your audience instead of 50 cores. Power efficiency, yeah. And we know, we know for a fact that none of our existing technologies scale. Linux does not scale. Zen does not scale. KVM does not scale. None of these things scale effectively with cores. None of them do. They scale so fucking poorly with cores. And you bottleneck so heavily when you're on like Xeons because everyone develops on their desktop CPUs clocked to five gigahertz and they don't realize that Xeons and like server processors are clocked at like two gigahertz. So the things that they think aren't really a bottleneck and don't need to be threaded because, oh, it's fine enough single threaded on their six gigahertz overclocked desktop computer. Turns out that shit's actually really slow on a two gigahertz Xeon that's overcommit on hyper threads. Like, Jesus. Hardware is a one-off drop in the ocean for them, but ongoing power consumption is what hurts them. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, hardware is pretty cheap. Unless you're running cloud stuff, because cloud stuff is an absolute scam. Just make faster CPU. That's the thing, though. Like, CPUs and hardware is totally fine. Totally fucking fine. But, like, things just don't scale, dude. Like, 90% of your CPU building software, running servers, doing database queries, 90% is single-threaded. You can literally take my, like, 200 core servers, and you get maybe, maybe, maybe a 10x speed up from a single desktop CPU. It, it's pathetic. It's all software. None of it's hard. Like, hardware is great. Like my NVMe drives that I have in my, uh, in my server. I'm not getting linear scaling with those NVMe drives. If I were to write an OS, I can guarantee you I would get linear scaling because every NVMe drive is literally on its own physical PCIe bus directly connected to the processor. There's no PCIe bridge. There's no muxing. There's no switch. Nothing. Directly PCIe 4 times 4 directly from the NVMe drives into the physical processors. No Northbridge, no switch, no hubs, nothing. That shit does not scale on Linux. I'm getting maybe, maybe one-fifth of the theoretical performance. And it's entirely software. None of that is hardware. There is no reason you can't treat those as literally 24 completely independent drives on 24 completely independent cores. No cache sharing, no TLB shoot downs, nothing. They, like, there's no reason. It's all software. It literally is. It's terrible. The storage OS will be awesome. I don't know if I'll do it. 
but I, I probably will. And VMU looks really easy. It, it's just like a, a Nick network card. Zami Mommy, thank you so much for the 10 months. Hell yeah. Nothing quite like uh, waiting for software to run, op opening task manager to see your bottleneck and nothing is full. Yeah. The reason I'm so jaded and the reason a lot of people disagree with me is most people are on four or six core desktops or laptops that are clocked at five gigahertz. Like you don't, you genuinely don't see these problems because you don't have them. But when you're working with 96 core machines with four NUMA nodes, where you literally get half, half the performance by just placing your memory allocations in the wrong NUMA node, even with the exact same code, you just, oops, I accidentally put it in the wrong core or on the wrong memory bank. You get half the perf, gone, gone. How much software is NUMA aware? Fucking none of it. Like, maybe, maybe some scientific compute stuff. Maybe some supercomputers that are, like, have teams of people to design and architect software around this shit. But, like, things are NUMA aware when they, like, query the NUMA nodes, but they don't actually, like, pin their cores. They don't fix to certain regions. They don't make duplicates of memory that's commonly used. Like, it's just, they're, it's terrible. Software is fucking terrible. Software is holding us back at least, at least a 20x right now from what we could have. Like Windows should be able to boot in under a second. Not, not like, oh, you should be able to do like some crazy hibernate and restore from, no. Windows should be able to boot entirely cold boot in under a second. Your bio should be able to post in under a second. Your web server should be able to saturate 100 gigabit ethernet on maybe four cores. In reality, you probably need hundreds of cores. <laughs> Aldrin, I don't think you've uh, really watched the stream here, bud. So uh, I, don't, I don't quite understand what you're saying here. Other than the fact that I do have some of the fastest OSs, some of the fastest allocators, some of the fastest networking stacks, and uh, some of the fastest hypervisors in the world. Um, I'm pretty familiar with what's possible. It is first time here, yeah. Like, I know I sound like an asshole because I'm, I'm an asshole, right? I, I, it's a character, well, it's my internal exaggerated self, right? Uh, too bad no one uses it? Yeah, because I don't, I don't market it? Like, what? I'm so confused. <laughs> like, why the fuck would I do this for someone without them paying me for it? Like, I don't... Why, why would I do something that literally doesn't make me money? I, I'm I'm really confused. Like you realize the the highest pay you can get at a tech company is like six years of experience. My company uses it really. If you're solving a problem, get it out there. No. Why why would I go out of my way, and get fucked every single turn of my life, and then give away? The things that I've been telling people to do for 20 years. This is a good quality bait to get the rant going. It really is. The hardest part of replacing Windows, uh, funny enough, is the graphics API. Yeah. Yeah, the graphics API is fucking terrible, dude. We forked your code for chocolate milk? Hell yeah. Sell it? Don't open source software? I don't, I don't need to sell it. I like ranting about it. I like watching companies that refuse to, to do anything technical get fucked day in and day out. They pay out the ass for cores. They pay out the ass for shitty software nonstop. I work at AWS. Oh, hell yeah. Sorry about how old are you? 28? Popcorn. Fuck yeah, dude. It's a, we got a good rant. People like the rants, man. 
This guy's a troll? I don't think he's a troll. I mean, he, he has trollish behaviors, but I don't think he's... I don't think that's his intent. <laughs> Corporations are evil. They care about money, not quality. Yeah, exactly. So then why the fuck would I... Why would I give them software? Like, I told them what it would take and what they want. And, uh, and they told me to go fuck myself. So, uh, yeah, I just, uh, I just don't, I just don't do that shit. I write OSs for other people to learn from and teach people stuff and try and build up, uh, other people who can do this work rather than, uh, do some stupid shit myself. Yeah, I do. I do actually think I might genuinely try and market some of my products, but that's not really fun to me because that's not really technical work anymore. <laughs> It's marketing, it's management, it's leadership. Like, I like teaching, I like doing, I like solving technical problems. There is a, there is a place in the world for someone like me to experiment and learn what is possible. And there's a place in the world for people who want to implement and manage and lead and ship products. And you can't, you can't design the OSs I've designed if you ship them, right? Like, think, think about it. Like, legitimately, if I were to have written my first hypervisor and I would have been like, wow, this has better performance properties for certain things compared to KVM. I guess I should just stop improving it and just market it and sell it as a product. Well, then I wouldn't have made Vec Emu. I wouldn't have made my optimizers. I wouldn't have made chocolate milk. I wouldn't have made sushi roll. Like, I ha the, the problem is I'm a researcher. I'm not a salesman. I'm not a marketer. I wouldn't even say I'm a programmer. I'm literally a researcher. And every time, I think I'm dodging the start here. Yeah, you're supposed to go through it. <laughs> I was like, how the fuck am I not triggering the start? Um, how come places like Bell Labs aren't around? I mean, they got killed. <laughs> Bell Labs got killed. <laughs> like, they just got killed. And then Bell fell from uh, its peak because that's what companies do. Companies have great engineers that make great products and then a billion managers swoop in and milk that shit until it dies. And if you're a rich enough company, then you can afford to buy other companies that develop products that you are incapable of developing internally because you are unwilling to take risks or do anything new, right? That's why all of these companies, every like... Every time you see these big ass big tech companies do something that's new, it's always fucking bought. Like, oh wow, Facebook's got a great VR platform. Oh wait, they acquired it. Oh, interesting. Wonder why. Hmm. Maybe because if anyone proposed that, they would have been like, hmm, that doesn't fill in your quarterly reports with bullshit numbers, so we can just, you know, do management stuff. I think Microsoft did okay with Microsoft Research. It's uh so there's research is really tough because it's it's arguably a two-way street. Um research both has really, really good um really good researchers. I would say most of the time for tech. I, I'm not speaking for other fields because I, I don't know other fields. But for tech, I would say traditionally, um, company-based research teams like a Microsoft Research, Google, just whatever the fuck they call their lab research group, um, they traditionally produce kind of more impactful things than academia. And I think that's largely because they have the funding for it. Um, that's not saying academia doesn't produce impactful things, but I think they just have more funding and, um, they have way better insights into the actual problems, right? Like, they're, like, a lot of academics literally have never worked at a company. They, they don't, they genuinely have no idea what sorts of problems companies have, like, do they need better dev tools? Do they need better build times? Do they need better scaling? Do they need better network? Like sometimes they just genuinely don't know. And that's fine. That's not at fault of them. It's, it's literally, you know, on the flip side, researchers at big tech companies often 
don't have much of the academic backgrounds. They'll struggle a bit more with proofs. They'll struggle a bit more with the more mathy sides of things. They'll they'll be more tempted to write like um, micro optimizations to optimize something rather than like mathematically prove of a simpler um, algorithm to literally like solve the problems and stuff. But it, it's really tough. Microsoft have a develop uh, monopoly in the development ecosystem. Yeah. Yeah, like, I want to say that's not true because I live in my own bubble with, like, a lot of Unix and Linux devs. But, dude, it's so true. Like, so many developers have never touched GCC or a Makefile or anything that isn't, like, Visual Studio. You click New Project and you get Microsoft Boilerplate and you click Build and it creates an exe. Um... And that's really not at fault of the dev. Like, a lot of people, first of all, it's important to understand a lot of people are devving literally. Uh, I don't know why I'm getting so much lag. I'll just do, like, a LAN thing. Um, a lot of people are devving just for a job, right? And there's nothing wrong with that. Um, but, like, a lot of people just don't really give a shit about their code. They just, they just don't care. It's a job. They go into work. They do it. Um... The amount of Microsoft jobs that don't involve anything are kind of huge. I think kind of goes for like almost all these companies. Okay, why are the people invisible? I don't like this uh, mode. Let's just go. Let's make our own thing. Uh, instant action. Random maps with bots. There we go. That's what I want. I want action instantly. Microsoft, NPM, GitHub, Copilot, VS Code, Atom, Windows, Visual Studio, C++, C++, uh, yeah, yeah. Do people actually successfully use Copilot? <laughs> I, 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 I'm really curious what people's stories are on that. Is that my team? I don't, I don't want teammates. I want just deathmatch. I just want to kill, murder, random. Let's do deathmatch, free for all, after slime, time limit infinite, frag limit infinite, seven bots, pro bots. Bring it. Um, I meant Microsoft products, not jobs. Yeah, 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 yeah. That makes more sense to me. Public Xenox server when? Oh, dude, I do not trust running this code. I legitimately do not trust running this code. Oh, this is actually one of my worst maps. I don't know this map. So this is just a random death match, but I'm mainly... I don't know where the items are. So I need ammo. I, I need my, uh, we're just ignoring everyone. I think Devastator is up there. Okay, there's rockets. 63 is the next spawn. Oh, shit. He could kill me. Oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. He has, like, double damage on. Fuck. Yep, I'm dead. Um... What are you usually up to and not streaming? Just writing code. Where is the vortex? Here? No. <laughs> I do not know this map. Okay, here's the mortar. So, mortar is good. Where is it? Oh, it's in here. Okay, okay, okay. We're good now. Oh, shit. Someone else just got it. Let's see if I can kill him and get it. Sometimes the bots will switch weapons and not, like, drop it. Because you drop the weapon on you. I got it. Nice. I thought that was, like, going to teleport me or something. I need health. I need health. I don't know any of the spawns on this map. Okay. Okay. I'm 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 rusty. I want that strength really bad. Uh, 
Uh. Ah! VS Code's kind of a blessing. I think VS Code's pretty good. I personally think it's a little bloated. Like, I don't, I don't like it too much, but I think it's still a fantastic, like, I appreciate it as a, as an editor, which is rare, because normally I think those sorts of things suck. But VS Code's actually pretty nice. I definitely approve. I'm glad it's not like the, I don't know, I just don't like IDEs, man. I don't even know, yeah, I wouldn't say VS Code is an IDE, it's just an editor. So I think this is the next down here. Vortex is what they called it now. Okay, not spawned. Any option, uh, any opinion on Vim 9? I haven't even looked at the diffs. I don't even know if I'm on it yet. Like, I, I literally don't even know if I've used it. Probably not, maybe, I don't know. Okay, I really need to get the mortar, which is this. Oh, I'm almost dead. I think this is the big power up. Yeah, I don't, I need to get that timer on. So I love how this game has, um, wow. Okay, this got really busy really fast. Oh, thank God. 404. Okay. I'm out of next ammo. Woof! Woof! I'm almost dead. There's like not a good place to hide here. Oh shit. Okay. 404. Okay. 34 is coming up. Here we go. Let's get that. Uh, who is they? What are we talking? Are we arguing about NeoVim now? Woo! Almost got shot in the face there. So this next, this Vortex ammo is like really, 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 really hard to get on this map. It's a shame. Okay, there's some armor over here, and I missed my window on the power-up, but I'm going to assume that that will respawn at 6. Oh, I hit both of them with that. Oh, wild. Because my VS Code is always laggy. It definitely is pretty heavy, and that's one thing that is annoying about it. It's just, like, for me, it's just not lightweight. And I'm really picky about that. I don't like when things like take a while to load and open. Oh yeah. All right. All right. All right. All right. We'll get a couple more frags and then we'll write code again. This is actually like really, really fun. It's been a long time since I've done this. Woof. Woof. Oh, come on. Oh, yeah. They changed the behavior of the shotgun in uh, Zonotic compared to Nexius, and I literally just don't know how to use it. Because it used to be like you could do three shots. Um, so this should one hit basically anyone right now. But I am dead. All right, just converted uh, my config to Lua for what? For wait, uh, are you switching to NeoVim? You got a NeoVim chat here? Also, Lua sucks. You don't like one indexing? What's wrong with one indexing?
Ooh, that's the armor power up. Okay, nice. Good to know. I thought that was the 50 armor and it's not. That's the big armor. They really improved the bots. They like move a little bit better. They still are very predictable in their movement, but Woof, woof. Oh. Luigi is actually fa actually fast for config language. Yeah, Luigi is not bad. Like it's it's pretty good. Like when I see games that use Luigi instead of uh like some custom made scripting language, I'm usually pretty satisfied with it. Luigi's actually pretty nice. I use Lua to config awesome window manager. Oh, you use awesome? Oh, oh, the bank shot. Oh, big poggers. Gamer moment. Gamer moment. Blind bank shot into a kill. Fucking gamers. Wow, I spawned right on the next two. Woo. Let's go. Oh, I really want his weapon. Oh, I hit him. There we go. Well, now I don't want his weapon. <laughs> Shit. We're strong. I don't. How is there someone with 27 frags? These bots, man. When did they get so strong? Oof. 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 Oh, I'm getting mortared. Mortared and pestled. They're pro bots. I wonder what the Unreal bots are. I, I should go to a map that, honestly, with this many bots, I'm just dying to chaos a lot. I don't think this game was super competitive, except for like 1v1s, where you're really focusing on map control. Because with this many bots, I mean, if I just die, I just, I just lose control so fast. Like, now I don't have any items. All the spawns are taken because there's so many bots on the map. Um, he probably has the next. Yeah, he does. Nice, and I got it. Beautiful. That's what I like to see. This game's so fucking good, though, dude. The performance is so great. Need ammo, I need health. There's health. It's only, like... Five ammo on these? No, 30, okay. These, you, I think each shot is six. Oof. Zonoticus plus plus plus, yeah. It used to be Nexius, like that's what I remember when I was a kid. Oh, he's got the Nex, the Vortex. I'm so used to Nexius names. Someone's going to get that kill. Yep. Ooh, big, 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 big health. And I'm going to lose it all. I don't have any ammo. Shit. And those are health. Okay. I'm not used to how the power-ups look either. So this dude has the next. Wow, double kill. Massacre, 10 kills in a row. Woo! Let's go! Let's go! Gamer moments. I also don't know where the portals are on this map. I really want that armor. <laughs> Ultimate Chad config. Uh, RxVT. Um, ADM Neovim and Suckless software. What Suckless software are you running? Dude, I really need ammo for the next. It's so bad on this map. There we go. Crylink ammo. All right, now we're good. Now we're good. Now we're good. Now we just have to not die. We gotta get some armor. Come on. Bring it. Bring it. Ooh, I really want the... Oh, someone got it? Oh, shit. I gotta kill this dude. Oh, my God. 
Wait, how did he die? That, like, someone else must have just had something on him at the same time. This is wild. I should make a Zonotic server. I think that'd be fun. I think you should write fuzzers for blockchain. And get million dollar bugs every day. Yeah, so blockchain stuff is like... <sighs> the thing is, the work's like really boring. Like, it's just shit work. But it does pay infinite money. You can easily get like $1,000 an hour doing blockchain work. And, I mean, you can't really argue with that, can you? All the companies are so desperate. Like, it's ridiculous, dude. I could probably, like, spin up AFL for them and get, like, a shit ton of money. Even if it doesn't find anything. It's just such a stupid industry, dude. Oh, I killed myself. <laughs> Whoops. But, yeah, I don't know. It's so tilting, because, like, I don't want to do trendy shit, but it also pays so well. Grovebox? What's Grovebox? Groove, Groovebox? Grovebox? Why is every Rust job a blockchain scam startup? Uh, because it gets people in the door. Wow, wow, wow. Okay, the machine gun's strong. Machine gun was not this strong in Nexus, and he can reload it. Holy shit. Holy shit! Dude, that's busted! What the shit? I still don't know how to melee correctly. I don't know, um... I know that was like a big skill cap in, I think, like, Call of Duty was... Or no, um... Why, why am I thinking Call of Duty? Literally, um... CSGO, or uh, Counter-Strike in general, pulling out your knife was like a massive skill cap thing that I never had. I never knew how to do melee stuff, which is a shame. Because I think melee is like really, really OP. It's like a one-hit kill in a lot of games, isn't it? How do they get the funds to pay so well? Um, because I think the funds know that they're just going to make money off idiots. Like, I I'm pretty sure that... It's just like an open secret that it's just everyone knows it's a scam, but it's legal like like that's why there's so much money in it Because like right now you literally can legally run a Ponzi scheme, which is fantastic Like if if you are a company your finance like now is the best time in the world to make money So yeah, you're gonna pay out the ass to just do as much as you possibly can It's just users hoping to make money back. <laughs> yeah, there's a little bit of sunk cost, maybe. I guess I didn't put a frag limit on here, did I? Okay, we'll stop at 20 minutes. Oof. Yeah, like, that dude almost melee me to death. I really want that power- up. I, I haven't been timing the power-ups. Dude, these dudes are even doing, like, curve shots of uh, rockets, which is really impressive. Bots would never do that before. They just shoot straight. So they have really gotten it better. Which means that I need to defend the rocket launcher more. Woo! Let's go! Let's go! Let's go! Last question of the day before bed. What do you think about Docker and Kube? I don't know much about Kubernetes, to be honest. I really don't. Never run it. Never used it. Not a huge fan from my experiences uh, of not using it. Um, oh, he just took that. Son of a bitch. Dude, how is he hitting those laser shots? Whoa! Wild, dude. I think he died. I think he died in that, like, pond or something. Um, Docker's very slow. Docker's performance is really bad. I don't quite understand why, because it should really not be that much overhead compared to Linux, but it's bad. It's, uh, we did Benchmark Southern on stream once, I think, for something. Was it like Fuzzbench? I remember it was like 50% slower than native, which is, like, I don't even know how. Like, what, what are you even hooking frequently enough where you can cause that much of a slowdown? I've killed myself. Oh. Barely. Barely survived. 
but I don't know. Like, I like Docker as a concept. I like lightweight VMs. Like, that That would be my niche. It would be, like, lightweight, fast resetting VMs, differential restores, compressed memory, stuff like that. But I don't understand how the existing solutions for it are so bad and so bloated. And, like, uh, Docker... Docker really encourages, and once again, this is not Docker's fault, right? It's not Docker's fault. But Docker really encourages people to make unsustainable code and projects. It encourages you to make things that you literally don't even know how to build. Like, if it's not in your Docker build environment, you literally can't build your own code anymore. Because you, you genuinely don't know how to build it. And that sort of stuff really makes me hate Docker and containers. Um, it just leads to such bad shitty practices um i don't know once again that's not docker's fault but it's oh yeah god he one hits me because docker got an angel investor so they dumped it all into advertising <laughs> yeah i don't know I, I didn't follow much of docker stuff have you explored firecracker i haven't but it's based on beehive and beehive Beehive, man. I was really excited for Beehive. But it... Like, I followed Beehive since, since it was, like, conceived of as an idea. And... Because I was a FreeBSD user for, like, six years of my life. I used FreeBSD on all my, all my servers, all my desktops, everything. Um, my workstations everything and beehive is just once again zen hyper v kvm beehive uh uh all of them they're all the same same mistakes same issues same bottlenecks same security problems same flaws same configuration like it, i think there's so much room to improve but I'm just disappointed. I'm just disappointed. All right, chat. How did you like that little rant? I know we pissed off that one guy. I don't think he's here anymore. Um, <laughs> sorry about that. Sorry about that rant. It is important to understand. I genuinely just don't know what motivates a lot of people to write software. My firecracker is KVM based, is it? Am I... I thought Firecracker was... Oh. What am I think? What is, uh, what's Beehive based? What the fuck is Beehive based? That being said, KVM is arguably even worse. <laughs> um. What the fuck is the new Beehive based thing? Oh. Someone's doing something with Beehive. It was also written in Rust. Oh, uh, yeah, KVM based, but written in Rust. How does that work again? At what, at what, like, if I write Rust bindings to a C program, is that, is that Rust based? <laughs> I'm not actually too familiar. You can boot hundreds of Linux VMs on the same host with 100 millisecond startup times. Oh, that's fucking hot. That's really good then. That's basically what I've been saying we need to have for a long time now. So, okay. Yeah, I haven't played with Firecracker then. Um, there's one new hypervisor that's like a beehive fork, and I don't remember which one it is then. So, I'll have to play around with Firecracker. I'm guessing it's very sysadmin y. Like, you probably have to manage it kind of all yourself. Um, I don't know. That just sounds like that demo you did a few days ago with Kimu would take like a hundred millis with Firecracker and the same kernel config. Oh, nice. Huh? 
Yeah, I'd love to work on stuff like that, but it's just not really a, not really a thing that I can get into. <laughs> like, I don't know. Every time I talk to someone about doing dev, they're like, oh, well, you have a security background, so we'll put you on the security team. It's like, no, I don't, I don't think my value at is security, dude. You can talk over a local HTTP server or pass a JSON config to get something booting. Okay, that's not terrible. I don't like HTTP, but hey, it's understandable at least. Okay, so what we need to do is we need to get our type ID stuff working. So basically, if we want to put objects in a pool of the same type, then we have to be able to detect what a type an object is. Um, and to do that, chat, what are your brilliant ideas? Why don't you love security? I hate defensive security. It sucks. I hate, I hate twirling around fake bugs that aren't security risks and fake exploits that aren't how people actually write exploits in the real world to put shit on slides. Uh, like, I think I theoretically could enjoy defensive security, but defensive security at every company I've basically ever seen is a... PR projects. Uh, put objects in the same pool depending on size of. <sighs> I used to be a data analyst in the military. Now I only get data analyst offers. Yeah, that sucks. Type flag bits. So the type ID, that's the direction we're going to go. But we can't quite do type IDs uh, directly. But I solved it yesterday. What even is defensive security? I mean, the security is massive. My, my specific field of security is binary security, which is looking for bugs in code written in compiled languages, often more critical things like SMB, RDP, HTTP servers, really like servers, default config things that are like turned on and like mandatory for basically doing any existence on the internet. Um, in reality, what that is kind of turning into, and that's why I'm kind of trying to like distance myself a bit from fuzzing, is that's really turned into wrapping every single function in lib fuzzer annotations and fuzzing Mm, everything that isn't really systems level or stateful or how it's used in the program. And I hate it. I'd like to say I don't. I'd like to try and put on a political face and say that I think that is a great direction for security, but I think it's just worthless. I don't see the value. And there are a lot of people in security who will gladly promise you 20,000 bugs with a shitty fuzzer, regardless of the quality of the bugs. And that makes it very uninteresting because then I get judged based on like bug count or number of lines audited or number of paths hit or number like just arbitrary metrics. I am not comfortable, willing, or interested in playing the game. I don't want to just make shitty fuzzers on shitty things that aren't security surfaces to shit out bugs, but nearly everyone else in the industry is. And that means that I don't get rewarded, and they do, and I can't say I give a fuck. Um, sorry but I just don't give a fuck. Um, I don't know. Really what it is, is I've been doing defensive stuff for like seven years and I've never believed in anything that I've been doing. Uh, so it's time to move on. It's time to do things that are either focused on things I enjoy or focused on more like developments and building stuff instead of 
bolting AFL and Python together and making managers happy. My man just dished the entire industry. I, once again, as I've said, I'm no fault to the researchers, no fault to the people. I mean, keep in mind, I never went to college. I've never given a shit about authority. I've never really cared about playing the game. Um, and I feel like everyone else is playing a completely different game than I'm playing. And it's... Uh, I will personally support anyone on their hustle. Like, do whatever you want to do to milk the shit out of big tech. Kiss ass. Manage people. Hire people who you don't necessarily need on a team just so you can increase headcount and artificially say you have more impact and scale more. Fucking go for it. Like, as an individual, that's great. Uh, as an industry, I really don't believe in it. Um, I really don't. I really, as an offensive person, I haven't really noticed the efforts of these big fuzzing endeavors. And that is what every company wants. If I go to a company and I pitch like, I want to write a really nice emulator. I want to write a really nice hypervisor. I want to write this, that, or the other. Um, I want to make tools that provide good human introspection, and nice GUIs and interfaces that communicate what the fuzzer is doing to an end user so they can make decisions and, and look at graphs and look at all of this shit and their metrics. That's not what they want. Everyone wants, I am going to take AFL and I'm going to give you a shitty HTTP interface that tells you like number of lines audited in like a big box and then like shittily highlights the lines kind of and then you tell all of your engineers to use it and that's it that's that is fuzzing and i hate it i hate it so much dude <laughs> i really do hate the game not the player yeah like once again i don't think the individual researchers doing, once again, I'm only speaking to like my field of like binary security on O'Day, right? Like, and that is a tiny, tiny, tiny niche of a tiny niche of a tiny niche of a tiny industry. Um, but like, there's definitely been some good mitigations here and there, but there's just a lot of shit and a lot of bad bugs and security and like, Here's, here's the example, and once again, I, I, I hate this because it's pointing out a specific project and a specific, like, team. And I don't fault the team, I fault maybe their motivations and their incentives and their management and their structuring. Um, but uh, let's take a look at um, OSS Fuzz, right? OSS Fuzz is Google's big fuzzing thing. And if we go to their Git and we go to their blog and stuff, they're going to talk about 30,000 bugs in 500 open source projects. And they're going to talk about 40,000 bugs here, right? This is, this is what I'm competing with. Like, in, internal to a company, when you're, like, trying to get promotions and rewards, this is what I'm competing with. Like, 40,000 bugs, okay? So, what are 40,000 bugs? Well, let's click on it. We literally clicked on this link. This is specifically the metric they use. We see this is 40,607, right? Um, this says 40,607. So that is the same number that they're using, okay? So don't get me wrong. They do find a lot of good bugs in here. Don't fucking get me wrong. I'm not saying that's not the case. Let's, uh, let's just go to like a random page. Uh, let's go to start like 10,000, right? Uh, let's keep going. Let's, let's find, I'm trying to find specifically, uh, a thing that I'm looking for. 20,000. And I kind of have to binary search for it. Um, first of all, timeouts are bugs, but sometimes they are. And hitting assertions are bugs, and sometimes they are. So that's totally fine. Uh, let's see, where the fuck is it? Here you go. Fuzzing build failure. 
What is this? The last two builds of WAF 2 have been failing. Okay. Coverage build failure. The last two builds have been failing. Okay. Coverage build failure. Fuzzing build failure. Coverage build failure. Fuzzing 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 build failure. Let's search for fuzzing build or just build failure. Four thousand things that are just I mean, who knows if the search is perfect, right? But like approximately four thousand. So like 10% of their bugs aren't even bugs or crashes or anything. These aren't even build failures. These are literally things where like they, the way that they harness it literally just broke, they just broke the build. Build failure, 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 yes. Am I like... You saw that number. I clicked on this link. 4,500, July 2022. 4,600. That seems about right. It's grown a bit since then. This is the number that they advertise, right? This is literally the number that they advertise. And then if you go to their, like, this. This hasn't been updated. 30,000 bugs. Same thing. Right? Yes, you can filter out build fillers. You can do that. That's not my point. My point is that to a manager, to a boss, to a leader, to fucking whoever knows, these are the numbers that they are getting. And they're pitching them as bugs, as security issues. I can guarantee you monthly this count is updated from that specific query and thrown on a slide. Right? It's... And like hangs... I don't know if I'm really going to give hangs in that category. I would maybe at least break them out into pieces. It's just, this is, this is what fuzzing is in tech. Only 36,000 if you exclude build failures. There you go. You almost set them back a year in progress. Almost a year. <laughs> right? And it's just... I, I went through here pretty rigorously with a friend once, and I came to the conclusion that it's maybe like four to 6,000 bugs if you get rid of a lot of dupes, if you get rid of a lot of timeouts, if you get a, like, here's a test, right? This is part of the count, right here. This is part of the bug count, right? And it's just... <sighs> I remember saying this like seven or eight years ago. I told, specifically, I told customers, I refuse, I refuse to give you, like crash and start? You really think they have a crash and fucking under start? Like, I mean, maybe this is like a branch to that location, like somehow something diverted to that. But seriously, if you look through a lot of these, you'll find that a lot of these are very loose on their definition of a bug, especially, especially when these are advertised as security bugs. I am not saying that this, this project has not been massively, massively important for fixing and getting people involved in security and fuzzing and fixing things. But seriously, these numbers are bullshit. They really are. These are probably off by at least 80%. Maybe 50% if we're like really nice. But it just... Dude, it's... <sighs> like, it's literally a couple open source fuzzing projects wrapped up in Python duct tape and shit out on 100,000 cores. And it's just... Is it uh, stupid to suggest that because of security awareness, people are making fewer fuzzing bugs? I don't quite understand. If you could reword that, I, I could maybe give that a better answer. Um, 
But yeah, I, I don't want to be like too salty, but like this is what I see in like internal politics in who I see getting promoted, rising through the ranks. It's people who go super wide, fuzz things that aren't considered attack surface, fuzz things that aren't like actually like fuzzing functions that don't take in external input that like parse a, things that are not actually real things, right? Um, do they mean less bugs can be found by fuzzing? I, like, I mean, that would be the goal, right? The more you fuzz, like, fuzzing is logarithmic, right? Fuzzing doesn't find more bugs with time. It doesn't learn. It doesn't get better. You add fuzzers to more projects, and you find more bugs, and they all find roughly the same low-hanging fruit. That's just kind of how it goes. Um, fuzzers are a pretty weak technology in the grand scheme of security and securing things fuzzers are not going to do it i fuzz my assert function it fails 50 percent of the time yeah i like i know this is like very personally salty and i know that there are people here who work on these projects and i, I like i really don't want to be critical of those projects because i recognize getting fuzzers in an easy way and providing free cores for open source projects to integrate and use them and find bugs and get things triaged and fixed and get a feel for how many bugs their code has and all those things like those are really cool and important but it's sold in what i would say is such a misleading manner because I can guarantee you a lot of those things are sold as they're all security bugs. They're so critical. And if I were to go in there and say, like, I want to write a super intense hypervisor and find critical bugs in, in HTTP and Apache in, like, super critical things, SSH, pre-auth, things that are, like, super fucking hard to hit, I would be laughed at. Um... Don't get me wrong, fuzzing is still important. Absolutely. Yes, it won't solve your biggest security bugs. No. Uh, yeah. Like, I, I think OSS fuzz is great. I think it's a net positive. Um, I think it's a shame that my work would never be even remotely rewarded as something like that. And I'm pretty sure I could write OSS fuzz in a month. It's some shitty Python scripts hooked up to a shitty CI pipeline where you build stuff with ASAN that you don't even write. You have open source contributors do that. And you bundle it all up and you make a shit ton of reports and you put 40,000 on a slide. And congratulations, you are now the pinnacle of fuzzing in the world. And uh, like, yeah, I know people see this and and like, feel like I'm insulting them or being an asshole. Um, but it sucks. It feels bad. And people need to recognize that. Whether or not I'm dysfunctional and like fucked up in the head, which I probably am to some extent, somehow egotistical where I think I'm worth more than I am, or just generally more offended by things that I shouldn't be. But, yeah. RW Grim, thank you so much for the raid. Hell yeah. How was your stream? Dream raids are the best raids. Hell yeah. When engineering becomes convincing people, yeah. And really, all of this comes down to, I just don't like the politics. Um... I don't like that my, the work I've done at companies has not changed from what I was doing in my free time when I was like 16 years old, but I keep getting paid more every year and I am very convinced that it's literally just age. Got to delete some ancient code, brand new feature, fuck yeah. That's always a good day. <laughs> but seriously, my, like, the shit I did 10 years ago at my first job, making a tenth of what I make now, was no more complex or difficult than what I do to make the money I make now. It's just made up. 
it's just made up and I, I like I hit the point four years ago where basically I will not make more money technically you get paid more every year no matter if you do your best or not it's not even that it's just like it's it's weird to like run off and do my own hobbies and have 300 people watching me on Twitch ranting about dumb shit incoherently and get awards for like most innovative research for my side projects. And then at work, I'm like running scripts with AFL. And no one is willing to pay me more or do more impactful things unless I literally take on people under me. It does not matter. It is purely when people say scaling, it has nothing to do with scaling. It's number of people under you. That's it. It's not about impact, not about what you did. It's not about like how, like, a person with 50 people under them doing nothing is making more than a person with five people under them creating a whole new fucking line of business. It just doesn't matter. Scripts back by 10 years of experience. The problem is I was making those same scripts 10 years ago. <laughs> like, like, it's not even that I really make them faster or better. Like, don't get me wrong. I've definitely gotten better, especially around, like, making more usable code. But, like... I wrote Fulkervisor eight years ago, nine years ago. I wrote my first like emulators that basically replaced Kimu for my like fuzzing purposes seven or eight years ago. And it just doesn't matter. <laughs> it just doesn't matter. I'm paid as if I have four or five years of experience. Even though I've been writing code and doing security for probably 16 or 17 years, and I've probably spent four or five times as much time doing research during those years. Um, it just sucks, dude. It feels like shit, right? I'm not trying to be salty. I'm not trying to be like a dick. I'm just genuinely letting you know it feels like shit. It feels like shit to, like, basically have spent years and years and years and years doing research, 80 to 100 hours a week of technical things where now I can do shit like chocolate milk where in a month I can write a whole OS and hypervisor from scratch to the point we can use it to, like, fuzz real things and scale over the network. And that does not matter. All that matters is, like, the number of, like, four or five years of big tech experience or the I can't get a lead position because I haven't led before and it's like fuck off and here's where we can get to the fun side I can work eight weeks a year and sell exploits against the against those companies softwares and make four times more than they would ever pay me as a yearly salary to work 40 hours a week kissing ass so fuck them. Um, it's, it's very weird when you directly can make money off of your technical output uh, and companies that theoretically should be able to leverage your technical output into bigger things by having the system, the machine, the managers, the, the leaders, the advertisement, that shit. Uh, yeah, I shouldn't be able to make more money on my own doing random shit than a big tech company with big tech backing with serious investment and pools of managers and leaders. <laughs> um... It also sucks when I try and interview for positions for fuzzing roles and I'd never get asked a question about fuzzing. And these companies literally don't know what they're hiring for. They, they want confident people who say they can lead. It, it feels like shit, dude. Like, it really does. Because I'd love to do defensive stuff. I'd love to, like, 
I know my personal research is not necessarily what I want to do at work. I'm not saying like, I just want to do whatever the fuck I do at home and get paid big bucks for it. No, I know I have to make sacrifices. I know I have to probably not do as researchy things such that there's an easier path to success and focus a little bit more on the wins and focus a little bit more on like usability and documentation and code quality and CI and integration and, and getting adoption out there. But, uh, yeah. Sounds depressing? Yeah. I mean, maybe I'm delusional, right? There's a chance I'm literally delusional. <laughs> but I've worked with basically everyone at some capacity in big tech. And the most skilled people I've met in security are people making $60,000 a year at, like, the NSA getting fucking robbed. And it feels like shit. Because <laughs> um, I know if I were to like step up my game and pull people in and talk leadership and do all the words and the, the whiz bang and come up with the bullshit, I would be heavily rewarded for that. But it's so fake. And a lot of that probably stems from me being pretty independent. And a lot of that stems from the fact that I never went to college. And the reason I didn't go to college is because I, I didn't think I'd learn shit. Like, all the shit I learned in high school, I felt like was just a waste of time. Now, looking back on it, I wish I, like, focused more on, like, history and stuff like that. Things I thought weren't really cool or interesting that now I love. I love watching, like, history documentaries, and I just subscribed to, like, uh, Armchair Historian and shit. And I've been, like, gobbling that shit up. Even, like, the past two years, I've just really loved those sorts of things. Um, and it really just seems like a game. And the same shit of, like, seeing people lose their childhoods to getting a 4.0 to get a job they fucking hate. You know, and it's just, I'm not trying to be depressing. Because a lot of realizing this is how I become happier. It's a shame that it's only when we're older that we appreciate learning things. Yeah. But... Honestly, I actually enjoyed my high school experience quite a bit, but I don't know. College just felt like a game, and it feels like everyone kind of cheats and lies and comes up with shit, and, and it, I don't know. It just feels so fake. <laughs> like, I, I hate that that's the case. I really do, and I hate that this is really depressing. Um, I, I think it's a shame because the... You know, like, when I, when I say that the technical capacity of these companies is, is really not much beyond, like, six years of experience out of school, it's pretty true. Like, genuinely, if you want any chance of moving up in a company, you have to manage and, and take people on. It's not even about having a bigger impact. The endless reports in uni. Yeah, like, I don't know. I had the feeling of, uh, what am I going to do and learn something useful is something I felt for a long time during school years. Yeah, I mean, school, also, a lot of it is you get what you make of it, right? But it's hard. Have you ever thought about going to grad school? No. Not really. In alternate reality, you're streaming history and just subscribe to Live Overflow. Fuck yeah, dude. Um, taking forever to finish my uni because I'm um, doing actual research in the meanwhile. Just seems useless. Yeah, and it probably isn't, right? And you probably won't know until later after, like, what things you should have invested and focused on. But, <laughs> unfortunately, the, like, as I have grown older... I've realized that the shit that I focused on in my free time has always been the most valuable shit that I've done. And it feels like shit. Like, no, that feels awesome that naturally I gravitate to those things. I mean, like, this allocator is fucking ridiculous. And I'm writing this, why? Because, because I want to hire per fuzzer? Like, there, like, what the fuck? But... This is what I enjoy doing. Um, 
And I think when I write this up and release it and make a blog on like why this works, I'm sure some of the big people that are in like compiler CS type theory stuff are gonna be like, this is a fucking really cool design. This is really cool. And this is the sort of thing that I would never be allowed to do at a company. Now, now, let me put a big clarification on everything I've said here. When I say not allowed to do something, that doesn't mean that they wouldn't encourage me to do this. When I say not allowed to do something, I mean not adequately compensated for it, right? It's, and that's where it's selfish and an asshole and me being an egomaniac. But the, the part there that's really important is that, like, why the fuck would I do this at work? When I have to give weekly status reports and, and suck someone's dick while I do it, why wouldn't I just do it on my free time and spend two days pooping out a shitty AFL harness and get the exact same reward, the exact same career progression, the exact same growth, the exact same recognition? That's, that's kind of what I mean when I say, like, I'm not allowed to do these things. Of course, if I were to write fucking Falkervisor for work, they'd probably love it. But it wouldn't be rewarded any differently than someone just, like, hooking up AFL to a, a random project and just putting 40000 on a slide. <laughs> um... Impact for senior ICs is too much team leading and direction setting. Yeah. And like, I, I've become okay with doing like leadership stuff recently. Like that's something that in my minds, I think I would enjoy. I mean, I like these streams, even though I wouldn't say I'm like really teaching, like I'm not really trying to teach. I like when people ask questions and I go on a tangent and I solve a problem or not even solve a problem, but demonstrate something, you know, when people bring up like, how is, why does NUMA matter? And we go on a tangent and we write a benchmark and we explain it and we, we, we feel why it matters. Like we, we write something concretely that isn't some fake bullshit benchmark. It's like, here's a legitimate example of why it matters and simple, easy to understand. And I would love to do that. I'd love to, le I'd love to architect shit. I mean, I feel like my designs for a lot of my software is pretty good. And I genuinely don't think most of the stuff I do is very hard. Like, I, I, really, I really just don't think this shit is that hard. I think having the ideas is often pretty hard. And I think having the ideas is not hard due to just being big brain. It's being exposed to these things. I mean, the reason I feel like there's 300 people watching me is because I've spent 20 years trying to figure out how literally everything works and trying to like perfect every fucking thing that I work on. So like, it would be very hard to come up with this idea for an allocator if you aren't even aware that allocators are slow in the first place, right? Like, that's why I find it so strange that there's almost no emphasis on technical skills. And don't get me wrong, everyone can say like, oh, I know the senior principal top whatever engineer who makes $2 million a year and doesn't do any fucking work. Like, those people usually exist at companies, but they're usually there because they were there when something big happened. You know, they were there when the NC kernel was, was first written. And thus, they're literally like, they're paid as a, as a like, thank you, rather than as a a reflection of their value. And like those roles don't get hired into. Like who the fuck hires distinguished engineers? They'll hire you if you are already a distinguished engineer. But if you have the capacity to be a distinguished engineer, like you're not going to get fucking hired as that. You're going to get hired like five levels below that. Um and if, there's also this catch 22 of like if I ever want to get hired in positions like that, then I have to do distinguished engineer level work while not getting paid for it, right? Like every time you get down leveled, every time someone says like, well, 
we don't really see on your resume that you have a track record of this. That's basically their way of saying, we want you to do and perform at that level for like four years, and then we'll pay you correctly. We want you to do that at like a third the pay for a while first, you know? And it's just like, why? Why should I even bother? Why do I want to like work my ass off doing something that I know I can do? I know I can write OSs. I know I can write hypervisors. I know I could write a replacement to Kimu for fuzzing. Like, it's not even a concern. It's not like, how would I design it? Maybe there's a risk in it. I, I just, because I've done it like four times. I haven't done it at the scale of Kimu, at the genericness of Kimu. I haven't done it with all of the devices and all that support. But I know what it would take to do that. <laughs> Like, it's not like I don't understand what it takes to implement a device emulator or an emulator for a different architecture, what it takes to write a lifter. Like, I just, I know I can already do these things. I don't want to prove myself when I already just know I can do them. Um, how do you, how do you make learning code more interesting? Yeah, find a, yeah, find a, a project that you're, you care about. Find a project. Don't let someone else tell you, like, this is a good project. This is something to work on. Find something that you want to automate or speed up or get introspection into or literally just anything. You know, when I was a kid, I wrote, like, a Yahtzee application in Visual Basic. That was shit. But, like, I just wanted to know how you'd make a game. <laughs> what did they do to reach that level? A lot of the times... It's just right place at the right time. Like most of those like top distinguished engineers in those positions, a lot of times they were either there when something massive happened, you know, like the creation of the company, you know, stuff like that, or they were acquired. Um, the same rant is why I opted to build my own SMTP server so I could learn how it works. Yeah. Um, James Gosling is the Java guy, so he's hired to oversee Amazon's massive Java shops. What's the security equivalent? Dude, so most companies do not know who to hire for security. Like, they literally don't know what they're hiring for. Um, yeah. Like, for me, at a lot of big companies, the security interview is identical. And when I say identical, I don't mean like, oh, it's got the same core structure. No, identical to an engineering interview. It's literally you do two lead code interviews, and then you do a behavioral interview, and then you do two interviews of just like other shit, right? But it, like, literally, I have done interviews where I have been requested to basically run and architect their fuzzing team. And I never got asked a single question about security or fuzzing. And a lot of it is, once again, when you have this management culture, they're looking for people who confidently say, I'd love to have 20 people under my wing, because I had 20 people under my wing. If you're, if you're in security, at least I've seen it a lot when interviewing people or seeing people come through the pipeline, there's a lot of people who are like, I... I don't know anything about security, but it sounds like a growing field. And I managed 10 people before and I want to get into it. And they're always like, fucking, yeah, let's hire them, hire them. And they get like principal plus level positions. And then I'm here and I'm like, I've been doing this shit as a hobby 80 hours a week for 15 years. And I have a very thorough understanding of how basically everything works. And they're like, hmm. Have you had direct reports under you? No? Okay, you're a senior engineer at best. Fuck off. <laughs> Fuck off, dude. Behavioral interviews are usually given at like a principal plus level. Um, and they're typically more focused on like how you would integrate and kind of like handle uh things outside of your team so once you get past the senior level like in those principal roles and companies have different definitions for senior principal it fucking varies everywhere but when you get to that level um they're really looking in those behavioral interviews like how well you can communicate how well you can toe the line of bullshit like 
I'm not going to sugarcoat it. Like, how well can you tow the company line? And they're really looking for, like, cross-functional stuff. A um, lot of that is, like, spanning out to see how you will interact with other teams. Like, if I were to be a fuzzing lead, they're going to be looking for a, how do I go and reach out myself, like take the initiative myself to reach out to other teams and basically get people on board with learning, um, uh, like learning how fuzzers work and getting them onboarded and, and basically selling, right? It's like internal to the company and at a high enough level, they're looking for industry wide. They're looking for people who can give, uh, give talks and have an impact across the industry, release open source tooling or even closed source tooling that people recognize as like improving their workflows and stuff. And it's a lot of it is looking for your ability to adapt and find and get people involved, right? It, it's basically snowballing, getting people in. Um, it's definitely not easy, right? Like it, it's definitely hard, especially when you get into super technical roles and people often start to have more like social issues. Um, it's really looking for people who can reach out extracurricularly, get people on board, you know, really increase that influence sphere. Um, sometimes not even whether or not it's relevant influence. Oftentimes it's a thing of numbers. It's how many people do you have using your tools, regardless of, you know, they don't really care if the tools are necessarily useful or whether or not you're disrupting someone else's work by trying to shoehorn your way into someone else's team. Um, even though you can't put it that way, if you put it that way, you immediately fail the interview. But it's like, it's, it's selling yourself. How do you sell yourself? How do you get more people on board so more people vouch for you? And it's, it's, it's definitely a valuable skill set. But I think a lot of times it's, less about the impact and the value you bring to other teams and more about getting signatories for your promotion documents. <laughs> you know. Um, my work has shoved me to a lead position, yeah. And I think, I think I would love a lead position. I had a conversation with a company that really wanted me for a lead position and... I was like, yeah, I've never really led before, but I feel like, you know, from my Twitch audience, from my projects I've done, like, you see a way different side of me. When I come on Twitch, I'm here to, to just be, you know, an exaggeration of my internal monologue, right? And because that's what people enjoy, but it's also how I feel. I'm not saying it's a fucking act. Like, clearly, clearly these things affect me and I have thoughts about them. Um... But, like, my projects where I abandon random projects and I just, like, don't polish things or don't finish things, like, that's not what I would do at a company. <laughs> because I am on stream doing things I enjoy. I'm not here to make money. I make fucking nothing off doing these streams. I'm here to, like, share and do things I enjoy, and I'm glad that people enjoy the shit I enjoy. But I'm not going out of my way. I'm not trying to make products. I'm not trying to make big open source things that change the fucking, you know, industry. I, I, that's not fun. I would want to be paid to do that. <laughs> like, seriously. Like, if you want me to really care and really care about PRs and really be up to date on issues, then that's going to be something you're have to, gonna pay me to do. Because I can do whatever the fuck I want and sell Ode and live a good life without doing any of the politics, without the bullshit, without kissing ass, without pretending that I have impact beyond what I actually have. I can just be me and I can make a living off that. So if you want me to like be in meetings and design reviews and processes and shit, it's going to have to be significantly more lucrative than anything I can do in my free time. <laughs> I'll probably just accept lower pay to do what I love. Yeah, that's basically what I've done. That's where I've kind of converged to. And it turns out, now that I'm doing what I love, uh, yeah, it just pays more than what I would have made anyways by selling out. So it's kind of fucking weird. <laughs> Can you sustain yourself with Ode research? Yeah. And a mix of like, you know, random contracts here and there. But 
I could probably sustain myself on straight Ode research, but that's a little riskier than I like to live. I, you know, I want my bills paid for with a, with contracts and then whatever. What's my price per hour? It really varies. I mean, if it's big tech, 500 plus an hour. If it's blockchain, it's a thousand an hour. And if it's really dank, cool research, it's like 100 to 200 an hour. <laughs> it, it really, really depends on the work. I'm not going to lift a fucking finger for big tech for under 500 bucks an hour. And if they tell me that's overpriced, then I don't give a shit. I'd rather work for half and enjoy my work. <laughs> Is blockchain worth learning? For money. Or if you find a passion in it. If you enjoy it, do it. Um, if you want to make big money, it, there's big money in it. And although... Keep in mind, there's a chance that you invest in learning blockchain and literally in six months, Bitcoin's at 10,000 and you now have no marketable skill. I mean, in reality, you probably know tool dev and dev and security and stuff on top of that, right? Um, it is very important to recognize that blockchain is an extremely volatile industry that, that can go from million plus dollar a year positions to literally laying off everyone and like year in six month windows so um there's a lot of risk there there's a lot of reward there personally i don't find it very interesting i don't think blockchain really provides any value to the world um i just don't like i i think i think we should probably figure out how to like make software that kind of works in the first place, before we, like, codify our fucking legal systems and monetary systems. Because we, we literally can't even make, like, basic applications work with tens of years and tens of people working on them. So I don't really know why we're trying to, like, strictly codify our legal systems and our trust systems. Like, the ability that I can call up my bank and be like, yo, my card got stolen, I don't, this charge is weird. And they're like, okay, we can, like, we can waive that, we can do something about it. Like, that's, that's pretty important. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's use of blockchain outside of crypto? Yeah. Kind of. Blockchain is really just trust, right? It's it's a way of like codifying trust. And you know what's really not something that builds trust? When I need strict legal codified documents every time I engage in an in an interaction. <laughs> like like that isn't uh uh, if you were to run a relationship like that, you're probably not going to find that there's a very strong bond of trust when uh, everything has to be in writing and written and explicit. And for some reason, it's totally okay that if something is missing in a contract, that you exploit the fuck out of it. Like, that's... Mmm. 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 <laughs> software quality is really bad nowadays i i don't i i think software i think written software quality is going up however i think software uh attention to detail has gone down and i think a lot of it is the, like the lack of testers the lack of uh, there's just so much rapid churn as much as i love rapid churn and throwing away old shit um I think a great example is, like, video games, right? Like, uh, video games are a great example of, like, there are a lot of companies and a lot of developers now that I legitimately do not think could have made video games 20 years ago because they literally could not have made a product that they could have put on a mastered DVD or CD and shipped. Like, without a day one patch, a lot of these companies literally cannot produce a, a working game. They just can't. Not about trust, but control. The idea is to make it uncontrollable. Yeah, I mean, if, if you want to say it's uncontrollable, but I look at it from a different perspective. 
to make blockchain and like these things work, you basically need the most fragile infrastructure that's ever been created in likely the universe, which is the internet and a stable power grid. So if your ISP goes down or your internet goes down or your power goes down, it's literally useless. <laughs> and people say like, oh, well, what about your bank? No, people are still going to take my fucking word for like banknotes and like actual monetary like fiat currencies. And I know I'm biasing towards like crypto and stuff, but you need to understand that crypto basically ex like relies on the fact that the most complex utility system is in perfect running condition and only ever improving. And that, I wouldn't say, is a safe assumption. Like, it, it just, I'm sorry. Like, yes, if you're used to living in a first world country that's never experienced war or poverty or a bad depression, sure, it sounds fucking great. But historically, like... I don't really want to know that China can just, like, shut down, you know, global internet traffic and do a 51% attack on Bitcoin. <laughs> like, to me, that doesn't seem very decentralized. Relying on the most sophisticated infrastructure ever produced doesn't really seem decentralized to me. <laughs> It really doesn't. It requires chips get faster, power gets cheaper, internet gets more bandwidth, more connectivity happens. That seems not very decentralized to me. Sorry. <laughs> like, that's not to say there isn't value or theoretically it could be great, but like, it's not decentralized. It's decentralized in that you have a bunch of people contributing to a ledger from like, their own personal computers but there's like three fucking internet backbone telcos in the u.s and a couple in europe and one in china and one in russia like that's not very distributed <laughs> that's not to say it's interesting or curious or fun to explore but I really don't see it the way it's advertised to be. Um, I hear a lot, about, uh, a lot of people talking about trust, and I don't agree. It's about making it uncontrollable. Calling it trust is PR to me. Yeah. And I agree with that. Like, don't get me wrong. I mean, I was big into Bitcoin way back in, like, 2011, 2012 and stuff. Um, it's pretty cool. Like, I... Thought it was really, not that I got too into the technical side. Well, I kind of did. I actually worked on making a Bitcoin exchange back in the day. And I did like live streams and updates on it. And I made uh, applications and stuff for basically getting like real time data into charting software like Sierra Chart. So that people can graph and, and do like technical analysis and that sort of stuff. And I made a uh, non-floating point based exchange engine that allowed for like lossless uh bitcoin like trading and stuff where you don't lose things with floating point precision and it was optimized you know if anyone remembers the mount gox days if someone dumped something that filled like a thousand orders shit would like lag for like 30 seconds and i made like an exchange that could handle like millions and millions of transactions per second where it just at that time you could literally like replay the entire year of Bitcoin transactions, not transactions, but uh, like trades on the, the exchange in like a second. Whereas Mt. Gox barely could handle the real world load of people like manually clicking buttons. Um, yeah, and I was big into like going around to groups and meetups and uh, I went to banks to talk about what it takes to uh, get the right legal, like to fulfill the correct legal requirements so that you can um, like handle ACH transfers and stuff. I forget what it's called, but you had to do it in like every state 
and you had to put up like a million dollars or two million dollars in in like uh basically state bonds where you would get the money back but you kind of are like putting money into this it, like i looked into a lot of this shit um yeah <laughs> <laughs> Have the desktop these apps run electron it's terrible yeah i know the upside is it means that a lot of my apps work on linux <laughs> so, so that's nice like five years ago i don't think discord would have worked on fucking linux <laughs> <laughs> i saw those early streams were they up on old youtube or something i have no idea i have no idea where they are um I mean, it wasn't until even like two years ago that I thought what I have been doing is interesting or unique or different. You know, once again, got to keep my ego in check. Uh, so different is the best way to put it. But like, dude, when I was doing like in like 2014, 2015, when I was doing like Falkervisor stuff and doing a hypervisor dev and fuzzer dev and shit, dude, I thought that's just what everyone was doing. <laughs> like, I didn't think that that was like a thing. I just thought like, oh, this is the natural progression for fuzzers. This is probably what everyone's doing. Every company probably has the same fucking thing. Nope. Nope. <laughs> nope. So I got to keep my ego in check, but it's definitely weird. Like I definitely have lived a unique life. <coughs> <coughs> can you go over a quick overview of the allocator? I don't know if I can. Um, let's see if more people show up. I mean, we're kind of on this rant. I probably should just keep playing game while we keep talking. I know, uh, we'll really start peaking viewership in like an hour and a half and maybe I can do another rundown. We, we did a two hour walkthrough of the allocator at the start of the stream, maybe like an hour or two in. Um, and I don't really want to repeat it yet. So eventually I will. What's the secret in doing tons of transactions that manipulate the same balance? I don't know. I just wrote like what to me was like the most naive implementation. And then everyone was like, holy shit, this is so fast. And to me, it was just like the bare minimum. <laughs> so, yeah. I don't, I don't know why. Like, I don't know. That being said, I never deployed it, so maybe it would be shit. Maybe it wouldn't work well. I mean, it never, like, finished. But, um, yeah, I called it Zepto. But, yeah, super focused on perf, and it was just the exchange engine. It was the order-making engine. It wasn't the, um, it wasn't the, uh, it wasn't, like, a whole exchange, right? It w t To me, an exchange engine is basically... It doesn't factor in balances and um, accounts and stuff like that. And that's the same for like big exchanges like NYSE, those sorts of things. Those operate on trust. Those aren't verifying balances. You're, you're just basically performing trades. And then afterwards, you're, you're doing the money and moving that around and, and doing that. So it's really just a matter of having like an atomic order book that can hold all the orders on it. And you can handle like market orders that clear out like you know, certain directions, whether it's buying or selling, um, and basically producing a log of like, hey, you got this much from this person, you got this much from this person, you got this much from this person. Once that operation has atomically occurred, that computation of the order book, then you can go in post and you can spend more time actually deducting the balances, doing all those things. Um, yeah. Yeah. Maybe Mount Gox will sink after each transaction. Yeah, Mount Gox was a shit show. Love ghost cells. Yeah, yeah. That's basically what this is, is ghost cells. Have you ever tried game development? No-ish. Uh, my first projects were like working with Game Maker, like 2D games. Um, I've done a lot of game cheats and a lot of game hacks. And recently, well, I did when I was in high school, in like ninth grade, I watched Hackers right? Um, I don't know how many people here have watched Hackers, but I watched Hackers in like ninth grade or some shit. And the, uh, is it Hackers? Yeah. With like global thermonuclear war. So I wrote a C application using OpenGL, probably Glut, because Glut would have handled like the window creation stuff for me. 
and I made like a simulator that like made a world map and then like drew the lines and the like the fake nuke explosions with the animating growing circles, right? Um, so that I that was probably my first introduction to like OpenGL, and I probably have done some things that I don't even remember. And then really until recently where I made like my World of Warcraft theory crafting stuff where I can like map out World of Warcraft. I think that is probably the closest stuff to games. And I feel like I could probably write other than shaders. I don't understand how shaders work. I feel like I could write a passable game engine, but I couldn't make a game. <laughs> war games. Yeah, war games. Yeah, that's war games. Yep, not hackers. War games. You're right. The Whopper. Um. So, yeah. Um, let's see. Helicopter game. Oh, yeah, the helicopter game. So, we could probably make relatively good real-time visualizations of the helicopter game now, which we didn't have that knowledge before. Shaders are literally function vertex data pixel. Yeah, there's nothing to understand. I know, I know, I know. But remember, when most people understand things i will be like another year or two before i internalize it like i just assume that i don't understand them until i very 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 thoroughly understand them um shaders are straightforward i know i know i know <laughs> uh, i couldn't make a game i have zero practice doing anything art i do think i i love the idea of making a game that doesn't have uh textures where you're working, like, I really wanted to make a game for a long time. I've probably talked about it on stream before, but I really want to make a game. It's such a waste, compute resources. Uh, but I want to make a, a game that is um, quantum, where basically, like a 3D game, where the collisions, where basically it is impossible for two objects to pass each other. And like get you basically like you can't clip through a wall or anything because there would be there would be like a plank distance and then there'd be the speed of light which would be like an object moves the plank distance every single frame or like internal from not like rendered frame but like internal frame um such that there would never be errors like physics errors but it would be so computationally ridiculous and expensive to make. But I think it'd be so interesting where basically a slower object just has a lower probability of moving on each frame, like propagating. But the fastest an object can ever move is one plank distance, which is like a pixel or whatever we consider it to be, uh, per frame. So that it's impossible to ever, like, clip through something, if that makes sense. Um... I don't know. I thought that would just be like really fun. If anything, a good analogy of like actually quantum, like actually how quantum works. How do you quantize rotations? Ah, uh, I mean, you you have to do everything probabilistically, right? So like. You would basically I feel like you could still do that, right? You would. Basically, your probability of movement for your, like, your, like, pixel, we'll call it, uh, would be relative to your center of rotation. So the further out you get, the, the, like, higher, lower probability, the closer you get in, the, like, lower the probability is. You distort mod- well, you only distort models- <laughs> Right? <laughs> you only distort models if your Planck distance is too short. Right? If your Planck distance is a pixel, yeah, there's absolutely distorted models. But if your Planck distance is one one thousandth of a pixel, it all will work out. <laughs> right? You see what I'm saying? Um, it's the same thing as reality, right? <laughs> Uh, you know about the Redox OS project? If so, what do you think about it? I think it's pretty interesting. Uh, definitely a weird undertaking. 
Um, I don't know much about it. I've used it before. I've used it for symbols and stuff. Redox is the Windows replacement thing, right? I'm not I'm not getting that confused with something. Um, I think it's fascinating. I don't think it's particularly like good. I think it's designed to fill a void. It's not designed to like innovate. It's designed to literally duplicate something. So no, Redux is the Rust one. God damn it. I'm getting that confused with React. Well, they, they, start, they both start with R-E in their five letters. Redux is the Rust kernel. Yeah, I'm not super familiar with it. I think I looked at it initially and probably brushed it off. Um, I don't know. I My kernel designs are very exotic. And if anything resembles a Unix-like kernel, I probably don't like it. Redux is React. <laughs> R under 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 OS. Yeah. Yeah. So you see how it gets confused in my head? It's not me just being dumb. Well, in reality, solid objects have a, a specific structure that preserve their shape. So, technically, no, if you go down to the quantum level. In reality, the Planck distance is just so much smaller than like molecules. But in reality, like, if quantum is theoretically correct, and I even remotely understand it correctly, which I don't, um, yeah, like, things have to snap to a Planck distance grid, which means that rotations have to, like, they have to have distortion. Now, the thing is, the grid that you're snapping to is like one one trillionth the size of the objects that you're snapping to the grid, so it doesn't really matter. They don't have to snap to a grid? Is that true? Is that true? Source, MS, and physics? Okay, well, you win. Fuck you, okay, nerd, loser. Pfft. Bet you didn't get laid with your physics degree, Desu, okay? Gosh. I don't know, but I think it would be fun to do something like that. Um, I would also be okay with maybe having, hmm, there, I could make it work somehow. Yeah, you bitch. <laughs> oh, we didn't, we didn't need the Desu command back. I did get laid with a physics degree, get wrecked. I mean, technically, everything has a quantum probability. <laughs> game idea gone. Yeah, fuck that. That game sucks. You know what? Fuck rotations, dude. <laughs> uh, I'm glad that we can have such a great, a great friendship between chat and streamer here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so this is what nerds talk about when getting laid <laughs> rotations are for nerds honestly I just wouldn't support rotations in my game problem solved checkmate atheists got him poor Gamoza exists in the reality where Tessie got laid <laughs> oh my god alright chat should we uh should we write code Avoid Desu at all costs. Minecraft did it and it's fine. Yeah, Desu. If you understood physics so well, then why didn't you write Minecraft? Because you would have been a billionaire. And instead, you look like a bitch. <laughs> Rotations are made up by Big Matt, the Summer Sine Waves. <laughs> oh my fucking god well i'm glad we could have that fantastic uh rant i'm gonna have to delete that one from my existence so i don't get fired uh <laughs> can't wait for that one to come up in job interviews Wait, you said we you said you fuck companies i'm just gonna sell ode because the companies don't pay me enough <laughs> well, it doesn't seem like you really care about defense. No, I don't. I care about how much money you're fucking paying me. 
Why the f why the fuck would anyone want to work for a big tech company other than money? They suck ass. <laughs> Woke up to an agar stream for breakfast. <laughs> Get wrecked, Einstein. Fired? Does that mean you're hired? No, 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 definitely not. <laughs> I control my own destiny now. Fuck you, pay me. Yeah, exactly. Like, you, you recognize that, like, sitting in meetings 30 hours a week and sucking my boss's dick to get promos is, like, not necessarily fun, right? Like, like, don't use that against me. <laughs> I will play the game if you pay me enough to play the game. But if you pay me half of what I can do working a couple months a year, fucking around in my house, doing whatever I want, yeah, you're gonna have a hard time getting me to give a shit. <laughs> D colon. <laughs> I know managers probably love it. Like, they probably love sitting in meetings. Because you can- if, why, why do you want to work here? Money. I like when recruiters get offended for asking about salary like the it's the only thing you care about. Yes. Yes. Yes it is. Like like I can I can guarantee you my work is way more interesting without the company. <laughs> like if I wanted to make something cool happen and I got like people on board and like got people together and did a hobby thing, I'm pretty sure it would be way more fun than work and way more interesting than work. And way more challenging than work. And way more rewarding than work. So, like, you gotta at least find a middle ground of pay me a fuck ton so I stop caring. <laughs> what did you do at Microsoft? I did, uh, like, binary security stuff. So I did, some, I did some fuzzing and looking for bugs and various things. Mainly DHCP, and then I wrote a fuzzer for them. And then I did a bunch of the, like, CPU bugs when those came out. I love IT, but I wouldn't work in it for no money. So, yes, I do it for the money. Yeah. Yeah. I will do work for less money if the work is more interesting. But the less interesting the work gets, the more money you have to pay me. <laughs> like, it's, uh, you know. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. <laughs> oh my god all right part of me is just uh, i just enjoy you know b you know getting myself deleted from the industry uh if there's uh <laughs> there's one thing wait what is this It's ironic, but true, yeah. No, it's definitely true. I work for half pay for cool work, man. Like, you need to understand when I shit talk companies here, that doesn't mean that I'm not willing to put in cool work. I mean, if your company sucks ass, you're gonna have to pay me a lot. But if you have a cool management structure or you're doing something above and beyond or you're doing something off the beaten path or you're not treating me like shit because I'm not a manager, then, then less pay starts coming in the picture. <laughs> How much do you have to react app? Uh, there might not be a price point for that one. I'll pay you zero dollars to work at home doing whatever you want. Yeah, exactly. Uh, off topic, will we ever get another marble story or other games adventure? I don't know what that is. Is that something I did? Because if that's something I did, I've forgotten it. <laughs> oh, Maple Story! Marble Story! <laughs> uh... Uh, uh, the video I made, like the, the edited animated video, dude, that was so fun to make. And I would love to get to a point in my life where I can make that same video in one tenth of the time it took me to make that video because God damn it. Did that take a lot of effort, but I really did like making that video. 
Um, I'm sorry. No, it's, no, it's fucking hilarious. The game's a piece of shit. You can't offend the game. It's garbage. I'll give you my monthly Prime sub Bezos bucks for you to work at home and stream all day. Dude, if I could afford my lifestyle on streaming, I would fucking do it. But I can't. <laughs> so instead, you just get me when I'm manic and want to do fun streams. So get fucked, okay? Sorry. Sorry, not sorry. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Have you done more with the oscilloscope hacking? No, because that was running an architecture we couldn't compile Rust for. If we could have compiled Rust for it, we would have gone further. And that Rust GCC is getting better. It's getting better. And at some point, it might just like dot slash configure and run make where it takes one hour to set up instead of like five hours to set up. And at that point, we might revisit it. Rust G, whatever one is official, not GCC's Rust. I don't, the, the, the least, the least important thing to me is getting GNU shit anywhere near my fucking code. It is a waffle cone. Yeah, that one. Rusty Coach and GCC. Yep, that one. We all know that unhinged streams are the best streams. What about the RTOS for the streamer, uh, for the freezer? That is something I still want to do. That's, that's a problem I haven't solved. That is... That, right now, that freezer is why I'm not eating ice cream tonight, okay? And if we're going to put things on a level of, like, one to this needs to change, not eating ice cream is up there. <laughs> okay, chat. <laughs> I'm going to hit the head. People, uh, come up with ideas. How do we uniquely identify types of, uh, how do we uniquely identify types of objects? Why don't you like genius stuff? It's just notoriously really bad code. <laughs> it's, it's totally fine. Like genius stuff has been a tremendous value to society. Uh, we just like to shit on it for the memes. Uh, but it is notoriously very bad code.
All right. Plus one for the Artos project. Yeah, that sounds really fun. Uh, that's something I've wanted to do for a while now. And honestly, so uh, the hardest part about that stream is we probably need to do a stream planning it out, like figuring out what physical hardware we want to use, what sorts of temperature probes we want to use, how we want to interface with those temperature probes, if we want to use an onboard uh, ADC, or if we want to get an external ADC, if we want to like make a board. And uh, I want to say that that would be really boring, but I think that would actually be really fun. <laughs> um, I don't like how the chat uh, on the stream uppercases everyone's names. It does. Well, get fucked. Does it? Well, now I have no samples. What? They're not... What? Well, now I can't see any on there. <laughs> uh, it does. Oh, there it is. Oh, yeah. Well, well, welcome to 20... What is this? This, uh... 2022. Uh... Lower, all lowercase names are just, they're, dude, that was so 20, 2019. Sample, sample, <laughs> Evanescence. Does it do, no, it doesn't do that as well. Okay. Was this ranting mostly? Yeah, uh, Dev Angels, how are you doing this morning? Uh, we're working on an allocator, or more specifically, we were kind of going through the allocator here. Use HTOP and not BTM? What's that? How do I identify types? Wrong answers only. Type ID. Stringify. Desu. That is not legal. Uh, <laughs> yeah, my dad was in town over the weekend, so I'm kind of back on the grind. BTM is bottom. Bottom is the better H top. What? Really? It's a replacement written in Rust. Oh, well, it has to be better. Oh, shit. We need music now. Let's put on... Let's put on some trash music. Okay? Can you, ha can you handle some trash? Let's put on this right here. Fuck yeah. Missing Kitty. Love this song. I've been banging this song all week. I don't know why. Fucking Krayshawn, dude. Mmm. Mmm. It's got such a thick ass beat, I love it. <laughs> uh pug trash music. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, generally, yeah, companies have their developer tooling been, like, uh, did you use the provide? Oh, my God. Dude, at Microsoft, I got, like, a dual-core hand-me-down laptop with, like, two gigs of RAM. Dude, I never used it. It was terrible. It was terrible. Um, the, the workstation was pretty nice, though. Um, uh, bah, 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 how do I identify types? Ask their pronouns. <laughs> I'm I'm from this point on referring to types as pronouns. Let's kill Steam. I'm sick of those pop-ups. Jesus. How many times do I have to kill all Steam before it exits? That many times, apparently. Jeez. Um Cybergenic, thank you so much for the three months. Me and my sub will get you a bit closer to being self-sufficient on Twitch. Hell yeah. My pronoun is arc slash rc. <laughs> no perf there. U U I D. Okay. So, um, basically, we want to use the any type. I was trying to bait you, but no one got there because you know Twitch shatters. Uh, so any is the trait in Rust that allows you to... <laughs> My pronoun is unsafe, so... Oh, I fuck with that. Uh, 
our unsafe cell slash this. There you go. Uh, we need to do stream sometime. I know, I know. I'm so bad at that. It just makes it so stressful. I'm so bad at planning things, dude. Uh, is, uh, is Rust any something like, is Rust anything like TypeScript? Oh, oh, is, dude, I was trying to read that as broken English. Is Rust any something like TypeScript any? I have no idea. I don't do TypeScript. Does unsafe cell sleep at all? Dude, if my sleep schedule was a lock, it would be a spin lock. Uh, okay. So, basically, the any trait allows you to access this type ID field. Um, but, so let's try it, chat. You ready to see what happens? Streamers and sleep schedules, name a better duo. Uh, your mom in my bed. What? 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 Okay, uh, so, so, um, basically what we want to do is we want to attach a type ID to hide that one from potential employers. Uh, <laughs> I wasn't mentally prepared. Uh, my coworker streams private RSA key. Oh, that, that's, that's pretty good. I should put little, like, one-frame Easter eggs in my streams. Like, in my 12-hour streams, I should put, like, a one-frame, like, private key. Or, some, like, an O-Day private key. Something good, you know? <laughs> Any type in TypeScript is, uh, is, like, the default type. A variable gets, uh... Oh, if you don't specify type. Um... If I say const a is poop poo, and it will be, it will, it will be any type by default. Yeah, okay. Uh, so Rust, the any type is kind of weird. Um, it's to emulate dynamic typing. So the way that it works is basically you're able to get a type ID. And from that type ID, you're able to downcast. Um, shit. What's the best way to describe this? Um... So you can check basically if anything's like an instance of a certain object and you can downcast where this will basically fail. So you give it an any type, which is nearly anything, it will then give you the T if it is a T. And if it's not a T, then you get like the original any type back. So in this case, print if string, this takes a box dine any, which is a dynamic trait in a box, so it's actually stored on the heap, which is required for dynamic traits. And then here, you try and you try to downcast it into a string, and if and only if it is a string, then will you get the string out of it. Um, it's actually really cool. Uh, I pretty much never, ever use it. Um, it's bad. But, um, it's not a bad API. Haven't used the any type in Rust yet? Yeah. I would link it, but I would copy and paste this link again. Is it dev environment on AWS? No one's fucked yet? Oh, Desu, I'm in. I'm in. I am stealing all of your company's IP. Can't wait to sell it. Hey. <laughs> um, okay. So, basically, what we really want is this type ID. So, for any type, it says, most types implement any. We're not going to read this second sentence yet because that's going to be for chat to learn. So we're going to make this any type here. Um, okay. 
Here's their requirements for uh, poolable types. It's unsafe to implement because it requires a user satisfy some more assumptions. The pool type must be unique. Uh, we'll get into that in a second. Any type marked poolable must only contain plain old data and or numerafs to data stored in the same pool. So, right, you can have plain data and you can have references to plain data. Um, uh, and or numerafs, blah, blah, blah. Uh, you can also store, well, yeah. Poolable types may also be composed of other poolable structures. A la uh, derive. Right. You don't have to manually derive, but you can. So we have the poolable type here. It requires that it send in sync. And this is because anything that ends up in the pool, we have to be able to share between our threads, right? Since our node, our NUMA pool is shared, um, anything that we put in the pool by nature has to be able to be shared. So what we want to do is we want to give a pool type with poolable things such that we know anything that is defined poolable we can look up the type of that object that is being stored in the pool. So we'll say um, this is a type. No, this is a constant, associated constant. We'll say it's the pool type. It is a type ID, and it's uh, you define it. So when you mark something as poolable, you have to define that pool type. So what we're going to do down here is we're just going to hack it so we get the code working. So we'll say pool type type ID is uh, type ID, uh, uh, I think type ID, uh, yeah, there's type ID of, and then we can say, um, we'll just say U32 right now. Uh, we're just creating that, that type ID, and now this will fail to build anywhere we don't define that pool type. So we're going to get rid of that prefix slice again, just so... Um, We've got some work we have to do before we can kind of get this working universally. So we're just going to disable some of those things so we don't have to worry about fixing them up until we have a good idea. So then here's poolable and here's poolable as well. Okay. So uh, prefix slice and here. <laughs> pool type eight ball pool type snooker. Uh, just found your channel. I've been lurking for five minutes. Already feel right at home. Hell yeah. Well, you missed all the depressing rants where we complained about everything. And now we're actually doing code again. So welcome to the fun part of the stream. <laughs> okay. So what we need to do is we need to go to anywhere that we implement poolable. And we need to then uh, basically give it a unique uh, type ID. So we have impl poolable here. And why do I do this? Why do I have separate implementations of this? And I think it's because of the old thing I was doing with pool types. I think I can collapse this into one now. I think so. Let's try it. It wasn't fun before. <laughs> it ain't programming unless you have something to complain about. Hell yeah. Okay, so um, this should fail to build. Poolable is not implemented for invariant ref. Uh, no rules expected. Uh, expected. Yeah, yeah. So what we need to do is we need to make it so you can implement poolable. So let's take a look at where we do that. Impl poolable. So we do it in impl base poolable. And impl base poolable, this is where we literally say, like, these are the core types that can be poolable which is all of your primitive plain old data types, including floats, um, because basically these are fine with all representations and bits. And I think that's true for floats. Is that true? Is that true for floats? Does anyone understand how floats work? Because I certainly don't. Um, and then poolable. Down here, this is the procedural macro. We'll get into that later. This actually calls impl poolable. And it passes in the lifetime. The lifetime is required to impl poolable. So, um, basically, we want to implement poolable for all the base types. And that makes sense. 
So here's that. That will call impl base pullable. That does this. It also implements deserialize. And what we want to do is we want to make this generic across lifetimes. So we'll just match on one, zero or one lifetimes. And then now what we can do is we can say uh, lifetime here. Uh, oh, shit. Can we do this? Oh, maybe we can't do this. I don't know if we can do this, chat. Uh, that's tie on F32. Um, that should match. Um, really? How do we not match on those types now? Anyone know? How's there no... No rules. This should be optional. I don't think this works as well. But, um... What? I'm not, like, scrolling past to uh, the wrong errors. No. Unexpected rules for the token U32. Impul poolable for U32? Ha, what? Because this will match, right? No. What? What? Oh, that's not an idens. That's a tie. Um, okay, let's see what happens. Not allowed after a type fragments. You can't see that, but here you go. Now you can. Um, started playing music. It scared the shit out of me. It's spooky. Uh, okay. Uh, so idents. Let's see if I can do ident here. I don't know if I can. I don't think that will match. Oh. Okay, well that works. That okay. Um yeah, so this will implement I guess the ident works here but not types. I don't know why. <laughs> All right, let's find a elm to put on. Let's get a bopper. Let's get a good bop going. We'll put on some stain. This elm's really good. Stain to open your eyes. All right, this is the break the cycle is the elm. What's your OnlyFans? Unfortunately, I got rejected from my OnlyFans. Okay, so impl base pullable on an ident. That's a type. Impl deserialize for tie. Um, and that's only on base pullable. So base pullable, we have to associate an ID with deserialize here, such that we can tie to here. That makes sense. Impl pullable, we call this where? And here. And that is an ident name, ident, yes. And then the lifetime, okay, I guess the trick is that. All right, so impl poolable. And now, basically, this for all of the primitive types will implement poolable and will implement it by saying, can we do tie here? That's the real question. Would you do? That shouldn't build. And I think this shouldn't build when we have an actual example. So let's grab, uh, let's grab this. The existence of this header should now cause this to fail. Uh, that doesn't exist in the crates. Yeah, how do I want to do that? Crate. Hmm. This is due to my procedural macro, which is really bad, but, uh, uh, give a shit. So, how do I make this universally work in any context? Floats are like integers, but they're inflatable. 
I was on an apocalyptic concert last week. The, my 13 year old self was so happy. That's awesome. What's the song name? This is Open Your Eyes. There was you. Um, how would I make this work? And we can get rid of globalize right now because we don't have globalize. The crate thing. So the hard part about that. So we need deserialize and that. Um, so here are our procedural macros. Um, and we implement these differently based on lifetimes. So I'm curious if I can make this generic with respect to lifetimes, but I don't think I can. So we'll see. Um, we're just going to get rid of globalize because we're not doing it yet. We'll worry about globalize when we actually implement it. Um... So, that is failing to find Alicado. So, I can do crates. But, crate, dollar crate in this case, is that the proc macro? No, it's not. Okay, that works. That's fine. Um, yeah, so dollar crate, because these... You see how I'm doing these proc macros, right? I am literally making procedural macros work or derive macros work by simply injecting a token stream where I just invoke the, uh, the macro on it. So then I can implement using macros and then I can use that nice derive syntax. Compared to before when I did, uh, I did a deserializer before and when I made that deserializer, I had to like wrap this in a macro call. And then like that's hard when you have multiple different traits you want to derive. I really like this. This has no dependencies. This doesn't depend on the uh, fucking crates that you have to pull in. Literally, all you do is you just, you just invoke macros on that. Uh, which means that if you write macros that expand and match these expressions, which you can do, you can write macros that match any structure initialization implementation. And to me, this is better perf for compile time, and it's... To me, this is way more readable than manually parsing code and generating code. I like this a lot more. I recognize that a lot of people don't like these Rust macros. I really like Rust macros. They're very, very, very strict. Unlike if you were to manually kind of parse and implement those macros yourself. This is legitimately what I plan on doing from this point on. It's really good. And then, yeah, so when I say deserialize... All that does is it calls this macro, and I have two implementations, so that's a bad example. But when I do, like, poolable here, all it does is it just invokes this macro. Still waiting for proc macro to, yeah, me too. Um, for a lot of these things, all I want to do is I want to make sure everything's poolable. So I make a fake constant uh, function, and I go through, and I, I make another fake constant function. And all I do is I make sure that every toop which are the types that you define in those structure members. This only handles, um, this doesn't handle unit structs and it doesn't handle uh, tuple structs, uh, only name structures right now. But I can write macros that match on all of these, no problem. But yeah, basically, derive poolable, we can get rid of deserialize temporarily. We only care about poolable right now. Uh, and then prefix slice in 247. Oh, yeah, perfect. Let's just say numerf ID uh, U128. Perfect. There we go. And this builds. Shit. Uh, we'll do cargo watch. And then I think there's a clear option. Yes, there is. Okay. And then foo, we'll just underscore this so we don't uh, get that warning. I, uh, I know... Um, I now know I know nothing about Rust. This is deep. Gamoza, what are uh, you making a Rust course? Bet it would sell? I don't know. That would be really fun, actually. Um, you might... Dev Angels, you might like the start of the stream. But um, TLDR, I have made a uh, an allocator that really only works in Rust because it requires, like, compile time valid validation of, like, bounce checks and stuff. And that is, um, where's the fucking photo? Uh, 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 where is it? Here it is. So here's how my allocator optimizes. <laughs> 
so my allocator, um, my allocator, here I'm like allocating a uh, uh, five U8 in a loop. So I'm creating a bunch of one byte allocations and the compiler is able to just turn it into memset. <laughs> And I go through like all the technical details of how this works, but it's it requires like lifetimes and stuff to basically associate the allocation from the pool that the allocation came from, because then that means that provably at compile time, we know that an allocation is always correct. So we don't have to like ever check it when we access it. It's really, really interesting. Um, but... We kind of already hit on that. I don't think I'm going to have time to explain that again this stream. Unfortunately, I want to, but it's we already uh, spent a lot of time on it. Okay, so um, here we're basically matching on this and implementing poolable. So the way this works is this matches on the visibility, which may be pub or non-pub, right? So this is matching on that. Then it's looking for struct. It's looking for a name of a structure. It's looking for an optional single lifetime. And you might be thinking, well, can't structures have multiple lifetimes? Well, in our case, no poolable structures can ever have multiple lifetimes. There are only zero lifetimes where there's no references inside, or there is one lifetime, and that, that is the tag for the pool that it came from. How slow is compilation uh, on a real program? Fine. For, like, Rust, it's totally fine. It can be bad, but I've never had a problem. It's really a, a matter of how much third-party code you pull in. Okay. So I match an identifier, which is the name. I match optionally, question mark, on a lifetime, the ID, which also may or may not be present. So let's make another example. So here's header two, and this has a foo u32 in it. This will also correctly match on that. I need to stop up erroring now that I'm doing a uh, check. Um, is it useful for single CPU machines? What? Uh, what? Uh, the allocator? No, I mean for the allocator you showed a second ago, you mentioned it does compile time checks, so I imagine a 100k line of code program would slow down. No, it's a very cheap check. Um, it's a very, very, very cheap check. It would be below the noise floor of the cost of compiling the program itself. Um, but yeah, this is totally useful on single CPU machines. It's designed for fuzzing on many core machines with multiple NUMA nodes, but you can use it without, well, technically the API requires that you have a NUMA pool always, but you could rip the local pool out and not use the NUMA pool. Um, it's, it's just an extremely fast... Bump allocator. That's all it is. It's not a universal drop-in replacement for all allocators. It is a drop-in replacement for any bump allocator. Um, and I would hazard most code could actually use bump allocators if you architected your code accordingly. Like, I, I think bump allocators are universally usable. Um, obviously, you, for legacy code bases, you can't just drop them in. Um, but I, I do think bump allocators work in most situations. If you write your code anticipating that you're going to use a bump allocator. Okay. So we match on that uh, lifetime. Then we're looking for uh, an, open, uh, an open curly and a closed curly. And then for each field of the structure, which is uh, identified by a field, followed by a type, and then... Uh, and this is one or more, so or zero or more. So the star, it's a wild card, right? Zero or more. So this is looking for zero or more repetitions of this group, including a comma. So um, basically, it's looking for a bunch of fields with types. Th that's how you define a structure in Rust. And then this just consumes and discards a trailing comma. This means that I like trailing commas. I don't like having the last element not having a comma, I personally prefer to always have trailing commas on every entry such that you can like move things around in the structure without changing up the commas. How do you make the macros become a derived macro? <laughs> this, I make a proc macro that has no dependencies, right? It's not using the like rust parser thing that you always pull in. And it takes in the item 
and it converts it to a string and then emits that string inside of an invocation of the macro. There you go. No dependencies, nothing, no crates, nothing pulled in, nothing at all. I really like this. I really do. I really like this. I know it's weird and hacky. I genuinely really like this. <laughs> because now I can do poolable and deserialize without wrapping them in like nested macros, which then have to match for the macros themselves. That's such a great trick, right? I personally think macros are better than procedural macros because they're stricter. They're more strict. They're stricter. -er -er. Um, I don't like procedural macros. I don't like, I don't like programmatically producing code. It's just, it feels gross, okay? Uh, I'm going to use that for sure, right? <laughs> right? That's it. That's all it is. Like, you understand exactly what this do is doing. It's very clear. I don't think it's unclear what it is. Aren't all those mem sets to the same address? Yes. Where's the bump? That is the bump. It, uh, it, it's doing a million allocations. It's doing a meg of allocations. And, uh... And, uh... The bump is, is the mem set. It's doing a, a million... It's doing a meg of five... U8 allocations, where they're initialized to five. <laughs> it, it, it's actually in there. <laughs> the reason there's multiple mem sets is because we reset the bump allocator multiple times. Every time you make an accessor, it, it clears the, the, alloc the bump allocator. Proc ma macros are also pain to write, yeah. So I really like Rust macros. Um, but you'll see that this isn't uh, exhaustive. If I put pub on this, this will... I was going to say that would fail. What is that? How is that pub matching? Do I not need a visibility thing? Because if I don't have this viz, this now fails to build for this pub struct. What? What? Is something like not... What's going on? I wouldn't have put that there unless it was necessary. And it should be necessary. Uh, let's derive only poolable just to like minimize. Never constructed. That's fine. Debug actually gets rid of that warning, which is nice. Um. What? It's the worst kind of success. No, well, no, now I'm just very confused. Um, like, if I get rid of that, okay, what's going on? I think, okay, I think the, uh, that dollar crate is doing something wrong. Let's do this. That's doing, that's fucking something up. Um... Let's do, uh, just these, right? This is broken from other crates, but we'll fix that later. Yeah, no rules for this. What? How? What? How would that not be giving an error? Like, this can just be anything. That doesn't need to be, like, escape, does it? Uh, okay. 
Uh, here's what I'm going to go with. I'm going to say that crate is just fundamentally broken in this context. This is probably in some weird, like, middling stage of the compiler, and you probably can't do dollar crate here. And that's probably why I didn't do it before. Yeah. I think s this is in, like, a weird stage where maybe dollar crate doesn't exist yet. Um, okay. So do we have other options here? Uh... So if we do this, the only pro this works fine from external crates, but it doesn't work in this one. And why is that? Oh, because it's not import. Can I import myself? No. Um. So what I could maybe do is just put this in a mod test. Oh, you self is that? Let's see. No. Use crate as that? Or like dollar crate? No, no, no. <laughs> Weird. Unused import. I Do I need the two out front? Let's try this. Only in that. Okay, great. <laughs> hey! That works. So, do I need the two colons before in other crates? I don't think so. I think it will correctly resolve this as a root crate, right? It won't treat that as a module, even if we're in a sub-module of an external crate. I think this is good, right? Yeah, that's that's what I thought. Using colon co uh is more correct because you'd use the alicado crate specifically. Just alicado can take the local variable. Yeah. That's what I really want, but I don't think I can then make this work. Unless I can do that disgusting extern crate self as alicado. No fucking way. Okay. Okay, I like this now. Because now we're doing colon colon for these. This is good. This is good. This is now a very, very strict path. You used to need it, but they reworked it. I know. But I do like that this is a little stricter. Extern crate self is alicado. Fuck yeah, dude. We're in it. Okay, now we need this viz, right? Uh, viz viz. Perfect. And nothing is matching on foo, which is probably this. Foof. Yep, and that is because we don't have viz here. And viz is a weird one. You don't need to actually say this is a conditional, a zero or more viz. Um... Duplicate binding. Uh, oh, yeah, we can just say uh, field viz. Right, there you go. Uh, do you maybe have advice for handling difficult work colleagues? Um, not really. Like, the biggest thing is like time always helps with those situations. And that's tough because sometimes you don't have time. Um, but being able to like sit back, recognize differences, think about like what, why is there, why is there maybe conflict? Why is there difficulty there? Um, a lot of times, I hate to say it, a lot of fucking times for everything in life, it's a communication issue. Like you're talking past each other or you're intentionally like agitating each other. Um, if it's that kind of 
you know, difficulty. Um, in a lot of situations, it doesn't necessarily mean that you'll, like, come around to liking this person, but maybe you can decrease the level of conflict or something. It, a lot of times, though, it, it's communication. It's intentionally omitting things to almost, like, sabotage the relationship. I find myself doing that, and I recognize it's unhealthy. Um, where sometimes I'll omit details to almost, like, sow confusion for no reason other than to, like, I don't know, validate myself. I, I don't fucking know, right? It's a flaw, but look for stuff like that. I, I, don't, I don't know if you can elaborate on difficult work colleagues at all there. I just say, okay, we do it your way. Well, don't do that uh, because that's going to lead to you burning out and, and hurting, right? And that's tough. Sometimes that's a good point to maybe bring in a superior if you think that if you think you have a good superior to talk to there. Um, passive aggressive writes like a hundred comments in my PR. Yeah, I've I I know what you're talking about. I've I've seen stuff like that before. Um, have you have you addressed it bluntly? Have you been like I don't I don't really have the time or like. Can you come up with a reason why they do bother you? Like, let's, Im let's imagine that they are irrational because sometimes people are irrational with, like, what bothers them. But is there, is there a reason why it is inconveniencing you that he's making these comments? Are they not improving the code base? Um, also, are you wrong? Like, that's another thing that is scary uh, to think about. Like, are you wrong? Are you just wrong? Um, but you have, okay, yeah, that makes it really tough. I, I don't know. Um, a lot of times it depends on the environment. It depends on the managers. It depends on the culture. It depends on the leaders. It, I mean, I, I really, I really fucking hate to say this, but sometimes it depends if you're the better employee, you know, if you're the better, more important, more valuable employee to the company's eyes, right? It's not an objective thing it's a very subjective thing um then you probably can put your foot down but if this person is above you then sometimes you get fucked and that's hard i gotta put on a sweatshirt i'm cold i could close the windows but i really like bundling up in the cold been in the company for yeah that's tough man um because there's also a case that he just doesn't like you right and that or they yeah he um maybe feels like you're stepping on his feet yeah god i wish it was cold here it's cold at night here but it's Really, it really kind of depends and like the stage of my metabolism and stuff. That's really tough, Neochromer. Like, I, it's really hard to give external advice because first of all, it doesn't sound like you have too much ability to really overrule here. Um, sometimes that's just a shitty working condition, you know? I, I don't know. Um, it's tough. It's tough. It's really, that, that's really tough. So we're going to pull up the Rust manual here and find, um, where is it? So somewhere they describe, I always, I always forget where it is. Somewhere they describe how macros work or more specifically how everything matches. And that's what I really want to find right now. Um, I think the reference. And we're looking for, here we go, items, structs. So this kind of is our guide for how we know like what fields have to be parsed. So we know that a structure can be a struct struct or a tuple struct. And um, the question marks are basically where there's like one or more. You have fields and these sorts of things. So you have a structure. We match on struct. Then you have an identifier. We match on that. You have generic parameters here. 
and generic parameters are in um in the brackets and they're separated by commas there's zero or more and oh there's always at least one is the way i interpret this so there's zero or more at the start and then oh is that question just optional yeah there's zero or more repeating here then there's always at least one then there's an optional trailing comma right now in our case we actually want to be strict we're never going to implement pullable on things that have more than one lifetime so it doesn't matter we'll strictly match on specifically one lifetime optionally no lifetimes or one lifetime okay then uh there's a where clause we don't have a where clause here so that's fine then you have struct fields and uh it's optional and these are in curlies with a semi um or a semi oh i see if you don't have fields then you have a semi so the fields are a struct field followed by there's always at least one struct field that's not necessarily true is it potentially with the trailing comma so we handle the trailing comma and then the field is an outer attribute uh a visibility so we handle the visibility an identifier a colon and then a type so the only thing that we don't handle here is an attribute and the way that we can trigger an attribute here should be a uh, comment or a document comments correct and that now fails to match on that so inside here i forget what an attribute is does anyone remember how you match an attribute it's not a token tree is it uh meta the fuck is a meta <laughs> okay so this is field um adder meta okay and hopefully this will now build uh oh do we need to say like um, repeating how do we do this Do I need to say multiple of these? Ambiguity. I, oh, shit, I swear I did this somewhere. Here, oh, this right here. That's what I did above. <laughs> okay. Uh, yep. And then this I don't actually do viz on here and then type and I think this is pretty thoroughly matched now Right zero or more of these Macro is a little bit incorrect because it accepts a struct with just a comma Yeah, I think I'm okay with that. I don't know Like I see what you're saying um, is that even valid in Rust? Because the thing is, if it's not a valid enough structure, then it doesn't really matter if we match on it, right? Like, if this, if this doesn't build in Rust, but we still match on it, that's fine, right? Yeah, expected identifier. Um, local ambiguity when calling poolable. Yep, and that's something that we'll work on in a second here. Um, yeah, it would fail to compile later anyways. And in fact, in this case, I don't think it's... I think this is unrelated. I think this... Basically, it has to be a correctly shaped structure in the first place. That's because it emits structs anyway. I don't actually emit a structure. It's because you're, you're creating the actual structure. But yeah, that's kind of my view is I just need to handle a superset. I need to handle all possible structures, which in this case, I even handle this, which is empty. Yep, and that makes sense, because I match on zero of these, and I match on a no comma. Um, just want to ask your opinion of Rust is phenomenal. What made you switch from C? A uh, lot of memory corruption bugs in my code. Not even, like, security-wise, but just Rust is way easier to debug. Um... 
Field vis or other. Yeah, I think this is fine. I could make this a little stricter. I, I love Rust. It's way easier to debug. It's faster to write code and you can use iterators. You can use ranges. Uh, you have drop handling on your locks. You have drop handling on your allocations. You never have to call free. You never have to call unlock. You don't have to worry about race conditions. You don't have to worry about uh, really complex, hard to debug bugs due to going out of bounds on things. Like, it's really, really good. Um, so, uh, visibility, struct, name, lifetime. Okay. And I think this is now thorough. Uh, Desu, you see anything here? Obviously, we're not handling tuple structs or, um, or unit structs, but for curly brace structures, I think this is universal. This will discard all attributes, not discard them, but it will match on all attributes. This will match on visibility, the identifier, the type, potentially trailing comma, one or more of these, comma separated, visibility on the structure itself with a name and one lifetime. Okay, so then what I do is I implement, I implement on a given, uh, on a given structure, uh, I make a private function that is check members poolable, and this goes through, and for each field, so this is now matching on this, for each field, I create this fake function that requires a poolable type, and I attempt to call that with the type of that field. Um, I could technically move this outside, right? This will lead to a warning if I have nothing in the structure, right? Um, this will end up saying check pullable unused? No, really? Really? That's weird, because this function is unused if there's no types. I mean, I would just put an underscore on it, but yeah, I don't understand why that is okay. Is it because the outside one is okay? Because if that one... Associated function is never used, that's fine. Does it not matter for, like, internal functions? That's interesting to me. Weird, yeah, right? That's not what I would expect. So let's try fn main. Let's try this. This. Run. Uh, oh, yeah. Let's just say t is, I don't know, copy. Doesn't matter. That gives me a dead code. Uh, no, I don't think I like globally enabled unused for stuff. That's weird. I'm still going to underscore it. Because I think this is still fine. If I get rid of this, this will fail to build. Correct. And this is fine. I think, do you think, Desi, what are your thoughts on the way I'm checking this? So I make an associated function that's never used. It's not public, so it won't show up in anything. And I call this function, call this function on every single field. There's probably a better way for me to do this. But yeah, if basically, if every single field implements poolable, then we implement poolable on the structure. That doesn't emit dead code. Oh, interesting. Okay. We'll do this. Fuck it. <laughs> kind of interesting. That might change in the future, but I'll leave it for a... That'll be a fun thing to discover uh, in the future if they change that. So for every single type in the structure, check if it's poolable. And this is not used. We mark everything as constant to make things easier. Um... This won't work with unsized types, but that's okay. 
we actually don't want this to work with unsized types because you would never have an unsized type inside the inside this, right? So we can have an unsized type here by having this be a slice, but the numeref makes this okay. Well, maybe not yet. Uh, check poolable. Oh, maybe not. Uh, numeref that's. Oh, uh. So here we have our generic implementations. Four types that implement poolable. For slices of types that implement poolable, um, we define that those are poolable, right? And that's true. Slices of T's that are poolable are poolable themselves, which means that we can put the slice in the pool. Um, and then, that's interesting because this, um, I mean, I could relax this and just say sized. And we could let this fail. This is not okay. Because I can't make a header here. But that's okay. Because this actually is fine. I can make this. This is a valid structure. However, anything that actually uh, takes sized. Um, well, localized takes sized. And that requires you have an existing reference, but nothing takes question sized in that nor in source uh, numeref, numepool. Um, so we have numerefs can have unsized types, and these, uh, that's unsized type because those are impuls on it. Uninit can be unsized types, but we can't actually instantiate or create those ever unless they're specifically a slice, right? So new requires that they're sized, and slice requires that t is sized. Um, and that's fine. It's like a box, right? We can't... So this is actually okay. So this is fine. Uh, so it has to check poolable. It has to implement poolable, and it can be non-sized. And that's fine. That's fine in this case. Okay? Uh, then we can have numeref ID of this, which honestly shouldn't be sized. And this is size of types U128 can't be known at compile time. Size is not implemented for U a slice of U128. Poolable, okay. And that's up here. Ah, I think it's this. This, yes. Here it is. So, slices are poolable. Slices of T are poolable if T are pool is poolable. Um, numerefs of T are poolable for that same pool if they're if they're poolable and not uh, and not sized um, or any sized. So we can actually get rid of that now. That fixes that issue. Okay, this makes more sense. I want to forbid this. Because while this is okay to exist, it doesn't make sense. I want it so you, that you can only instantiate, the only way that you can have unsized things is by a slice, right? So now, numeref, numeref itself is sized. Even though it's an unsized type, this is like a box slice. A box slice is a sized type. Um, so yeah, this makes sense now. So... Slices of T are poolable if T is poolable. And then um, numerefs of T are poolable for any T's that we can make a numeref, a valid numeref of, right? It has to be poolable and it can be non-sized. And then that means slices of slices are not poolable, which makes sense because that's literally impossible. However, slices of refs of slices are fine and that makes sense because it's like a slice of boxes of slices is it even correct for slice t to be poolable yes because i can put a slice t in, a, in the pool right it gets metadata i have to do that through new slice right but i can create a numeref of slice t and the slice t is what is stored in the pool 
it's special case, right? Slices are special cased because I handle the metadata for slices. But yes, they should definitely be poolable, I think. <laughs> that would be very confusing if they shouldn't be. All right. Um, poolable just indicates anything that can safely be put in the pool. And a slice, a one level of indirection for slices is fine. Who stores the length? I do. Literally here, uh, up here. You, you missed the starting thing, but uh, um, here's new uninit slice. You pass in elements. I then construct the true layout for a U size, followed by extend, followed by an array of elements of T. And I compute the true layout with all the alignment and all that stuff. I allocate memory for that size, and I store the size here. The, the size is in the pool. Yeah. So slices are fine to be in the pool because those are handled. And then slices of, uh, slices of slices are not okay, but slices of refs are okay because that's like a slice of boxes. A slice is a ref to U size T. Yes. Yep. Exactly. And that's why, um, that's why we don't use uh, unsized for almost anything, so, um, right, so we used it for a numeref because a numeref can refer to a slice, so it has to be here. Um, this is, once again, just for the numeref, so we implement clone and copy for it. And then uninit numeref, once again, can have an uninit ref to a slice. The length is actually defined, even in uninit, the length is, uh, initialized during creation. And then here, localize, this actually isn't really used here, but this is basically any reference, any valid numeref can be converted to a numeref of this type, regardless of if it's sized. So then these kind of make sense to me, where slices are poolable, if t is poolable, for one level of indirection, and then numerefs for anything are poolable because they're literally just an index, it's an i size, right? Okay. And then impl poolable here. Here we do a manual implementation for our root types. Um, and we do that on these types, right? These are all the plain old data types. So these are the root things. So you can make anything by default. You can make anything that is, are these values, are slices of these values, or are references of these values in slices. And all those combinations like this will expand to many, many, many combinations and permutations of slices and refs. Um, but yeah, okay, so now we got to we get to do the fun part, um, and uh, so here's impl poolable, that takes that lifetime, this matches on that lifetime, okay, perfect, so, um, this, wait, how is this, wait, what? Wait, can I just do this? How does this work? This code is being produced. Wait, how does this work? You can, wait, what? Uh, what? What? Oh, well, I, okay, I guess I don't have to do the, like, weird intrinsics thing. Holy shit. What? What? How does this work?
I never tried this. How the fuck does this work? Like, how does this compile? Am I crazy? Is this intended? Like when you have struct type A and you instantiate without an explicit lifetime. Holy shit. So I can just do this. Well, I thought I had to do my brilliant. This just works then. Holy shit. Cause if I don't have this, this will be like, you can't implement for a, a basic type like that. Yeah. Whoa. It infers it. Yeah, it has to infer to static. Um, okay. So I can, j wow. I mean, I might need it up here. We'll see what happens. Um, holy shit. Or maybe it never was a problem on structures. Oh my God. What? Uh, ID, uh, T. Yep, now this is a problem. And can I align it here? No. Oh, maybe this wasn't a problem except for on the generics. Underscore here. Yeah, there's no way because T could contain. Okay. Yep. It's still, a, we still have to do a cool trick. Woo. Okay. Woo. All right. Yeah. So type ID only works on static types. It only works on types that are static like this. Um, obviously we don't have that. So, uh, yeah. Um, let's just, uh, once again, let's get this down to building. U32 on this. Okay, and then here, I don't think there's any way for me to do this. Right? Type ID is only available for types which describe static. Correct. Yep, and that is, uh, this is the error that we're expecting to run into. But we have a workaround. Yeah, and I can't, I can't do this. Because now I can't store, now I can't make a slice of uh, headers, right? Like header two, this can't have a numa ref ID of a slice of header ID, right? This is now impossible to express. It will say poolable is not implemented for that. Um, if I get my brackets and everything correct here, right? Yep. Header ID does not fulfill the required lifetime things. And that makes sense. So what we have to do is we have to break this. And this is what I found last night. And this is what got fucking crazy. So technically, I actually had this impl poolable working before where I'd match on the lifetime and then I would just manually say static for it. Um, so technically, I already had solved this problem. But uh, this is the true problem is on the generics. I want to implement this generically on everything. So, why would type ID depend on the lifetime? Because the types, think about, think about is any downcasting. The, uh, you would, if, if it can't, if it's not static only, that would mean the lifetimes would have to be factored into the type ID. And how, how, do you dynamically, how do you dynamically store the lifetime information such that you can downcast in any type into a structure that contains references that are not static? How do you, how do you, like, how do you get the lifetime information back? Does that make sense? So that's why. Um...
if that makes sense. But yeah. Whip out the nightly features. Yeah, we're about to get in there. We're about to do some illegal stuff, okay? Um, we're gonna do this in another crate. Does that make sense, Desu? Basically, the lifetime affects what you would downcast into. And so they only allow it for static. Uh, yeah, we're about to do very illegal rust. Uh, this is called, uh, Alicado. That's such a great name. Cargo new bin, um, any, uh, 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 type ID unsafe. I don't know. What do we want to call this? Type ID unsafe, uh, type ID any, uh, lifetime. Yeah. Okay. So what we're going to do. Oh, this is new. What's this? Add? That's new. There's a new template. There's a new template for libs. I feel icky about downcasting a non-static ref. Exactly. That's why they don't allow it. <laughs> That's why any requires static. Right? That, that is literally why there is the requirements for any types to be static. But, we're not actually downcasting. Uh, well, technically we are gonna downcast, but that's okay. Um, we're going to- we need to get a unique type ID. <laughs> and that's it. Uh, okay, so here's what we need to do. So, what we can do is we can look at how type ID is implemented. And type ID of goes into here. And this is implemented uh, using the intrinsics type ID. So it wraps it in a type ID. Here's where the static bounds come in. Um, and if we take a look at it, type ID for the intrinsics has a static requirement. Kind of never thought about it. Yeah, it makes sense. So what we're going to do is we're going to make our own intrinsic. And we're going to make our own intrinsic that doesn't have the static bound. <laughs> <laughs> Don't do this chat. We are way in the weeds. This is very unsafe Okay All right This is very illegal and all we're gonna do is we're just gonna delete that Okay now this is gonna fail to build and I can show you we got to do more illegal stuff uh, This is uh, type ID lifetime Okay, so this is gonna fail to build. Intrinsics are, uh, yep. So to use intrinsics, we need to ascribe to this, which is now nightly. Then stability attributes may not be used outside of the standard library. So I, I need this to be constant because I am literally defining a constant. So my type ID has to be constant. I can't do this. I can't do pub const fn. Um, if I do this, then this fails because extern blocks cannot have qualifiers. So, const is actually added by the compiler through this rusty const unstable, right? That's how this is done. Um, so, now this is very mad because you can only use these stability attributes in the standard library. But we can tell that to go fuck itself uh, by using the feature which is, uh, what is it? Uh, uh, free. I posted it in my Discord. This is very illegal, chat. Okay, so now we're gonna say that this is a staged API. Okay? Now, it's gonna fail to build because the module doesn't have stability attributes. So we're gonna say, the module itself is stable. The feature name is uh, type ID lifetime since 1.00. Now, this function is missing the stability attribute. And the reason that's missing the stability attribute is because we have to say that this is now stable. And we'll say that this is stable for type ID lifetime. Okay. And now. 
I think we're good. I think that's all we had to do. Um, I think we might have to do const type ID. I can't remember. Do I? Okay. So let's, let's see. Let's keep going. So now this pool type is uh, U64. It's made by Rust. So it's a, it's a good one. Pool type U64. This is a, uh, we're going to do type ID in here. PubFN. So this is a type ID lifetime. Uh, type ID of a slice of T's. This will probably fail to build. Uh, this will just say this is a uh, five. And this is also a uh, five. Okay, great. And now... Uh, what's going on here? Uh, unused import. That's fine. We can nuke that. We can get rid of that. Uh, we can get rid of this. Okay. Uh, I think we just need to fix this error first. So the way that we can fix this error is by... Uh, oh, we got to get rid of the static. There we go. Get rid of static here. Bam. Beautiful. There we go. Uh, cannot call non-cons. Blah. Yep. So we need this. Now that that's back. Now type ID is not stable yet. Let's see if we can do it up here. I don't know if we can. We might have to expose our own function. Yeah, we're going to expose our own function. Uh, pub fn. Uh, we'll remove pub here. And then we can say... Uh, um, pub const fn. And we'll say type ID. Uh, how do I want to scope this? Yeah, we'll just say ID. T can be sized. This is going to yield a U64. And then we'll just do type ID. Uh, of the, uh, of T. Okay. So this is gets the, uh, a unique identi uh, type identifier for a uh, uh, T, regardless of the lifetimes of T. Okay, so this is fine because it's just a U64. It's just a value, um, but there will be collisions here and then missing stability require uh, things here. We'll just say this, bam. Okay, um, inner attributes. Not permitted following an outer dock. That. Oh, uh, no X clam. Thanks. Okay, a function has missing stability. Doesn't though. It doesn't though. Rusty const stable should also work. Uh, okay. You're right. Wait, missing since? Ah, I see. Beautiful. There's missing constability attributes. And do I need this anymore? I don't know if I need that anymore. Let's see if I can do this here. Uh, okay, so we do need those as well. Um, stable feature is type ID lifetime since 1.0.0. This is very cursed, okay? Both of those done. Private. Yep, that makes sense. We do want that to be private. This is the one you're supposed to use. This has the actual like, const designator in that case. And then we'll just say ID. Beautiful. So now this gets us a unique ID for slices of T's. Regardless of the lifetimes. 
So this is not a globally unique identifier. This is only a unique identifier for uh, types, slices of T with the same lifetime. But with poolable, we know that they all have the same lifetime. So we are using this as a unique identifier for a type. And that is actually okay in this case because anything in the pool is always going to be specifically ID. Similar to this requiring static, um, where it requires static, in our case, we require ID. But we can't do that because static is special. Um, yeah. Is the ID to use this allocator as a stand-in for libraries like JMalloc? No, this is for uh, anything where you'd use a bump allocator. Okay, so now this... We want a unique, once again, it's just these, right? We just want to make sure this is a unique identifier for a numeref that contains an IDT, right? And then a semi. So now that is a unique identifier. Uh, it won't meet its lifetime bounds. Um, why? Oh, do I have to say ID here? That's actually okay in this case. Uh, so for uh, implement poolable for numerefs of t's, where t is poolable itself, it can be unsized because it could be a slice, and it only ascribes to id. That makes sense. So we implement it for types that only contain id references. Um, and we could even specifically say that here, and it, it doesn't make a difference. Well, we don't have id in the scope. So um, yeah. Okay, so for numerefs, this is basically, you can poolable types that have references inside as long as they're ID references. Um, okay, and that is numeref IDT. This is critical that these are unique pool identifiers. And then down here, same thing. Uh, pool type, type ID lifetime, and this is going to be tie... Um, and then I like the explicit lifetime here, so I'm just going to add it. I think this should be fine. Bam. Okay. So now uh, when you implement poolable on stuff, which is done by the base poolable and by this, if everything is poolable, then it calls impl poolable, which will implement poolable unsafely, and it will assign it a unique type identifier based on the type. Um, and the lifetime stuff doesn't matter. Will this work for slice numeref IDT? It should, right? Um, yeah, that's actually what we have here, technically, right? This is actually a little bit more complex than that because the header t contains numeref since itself. But like, yeah, this passes on this. It already works, yeah. Right? Isn't that nice? So... That's a unique identifier because it's sliced. Um, this is unique because it's the numeref of T's and T's could be a slice. So these kind of can feed off each other recursively. And then this is for the base types, which is the base types here and the structures and the slices. Well, slices actually all are implemented here. You would never derive it. So this is where derives go and the base implementations are implemented here. This expands it to slices of those types. This expands that to references of those types. And there you go. So now these give us unique identifiers for all these things, which is really, really, really cool. Interestingly, with different IDs, it will be with different lifetimes, you'll get the same type IDs. But that's okay because you would only ever get IDs from a given pool. And if you can only get IDs from a given pool, then they're already that type, right? That's why this weird type, this lifetime erasure thing for the type ID is actually okay in this very, 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 very specific case, okay? <laughs> get that right. It works in this case because we, are o we only care about type IDs that are in that pool itself. And I think I comment that pretty well. 
The poolable type, type ID, must be unique for all types stored in a given NUMA pool ID. In many cases, we just use the static variant. Okay, that's no longer the case. Um, and we can get rid of that. Right? So the poolable uh, type ID must be unique for all types stored in a given NUMA pool ID. All things must be only IDs in those pools, which means that this is a unique identifier inside of a pool. <laughs> which is very weird. Even though we will use the same type IDs in different pools with different lifetimes, you would only ever be accessing objects from that pool in the first place. So, and all this needs to be is it, it's just a unique identifier for a type. That's it. So that, isn't this shit crazy? Like the ramifications of a lot of the assumption, or not the assumptions, but the, the like way we've designed this API allows this to be okay. All right, so now what that means is we should be able to bring back in prefix slice. Um, the only lifetime you're allowed to have in the pool, uh, fake pool ID and you'd throw it away for static. Yeah, which is fine. Yep, yep, okay. So now we can split, we can get this working with prefix slice. So a prefix slice is just a little helper. Uh, once again, it just contains a numeref and it's record transparent. So this is just an I size, but at compile time, it knows to deserialize or to serialize with an additional length prefix, which is kind of neat. Um, okay, so the problem here is it's missing pool type because inside of here, we have our own we have our macro where we get to find slices with different prefixes, U8, U16, U32, U64, U128, U size. So these are the lengths in elements that can be prefixed on a slice of a given type. We manually implement pullable here. So what we'll do is, um, yep, and all these look good. Numeref slice PT has to be pullable. Um, actually, I don't know if we need that constraint. Um, yeah, I actually like that constraint. I like it. It's good. It's stricter. Um, okay, so now we have to do const pool type u size or u64 is equal to uh, type ID lifetime. And this is uh, ID of, in this case, t is this. Right, and that's unique. That's a unique type because that's literally what we're implementing on, so that's fine. Okay, there we go. This no longer needs type ID. And now that builds. So now prefix slices get their own uh, pools. So I don't know actually if I want to do that. I think what I actually want to do is say this is a slice of PT. And I think this is, so prefix slice is a helper, a zero cost wrapper that helps you deserialize things with a prefix length. But at the end, you end up getting a slice PT. Like this, when you deref a prefix slice, you get a numeref slice PT. And thus, I think it's most appropriate um, for this to be typed as, do I want it a numeref of a slice PT or a slice PT? Type ID literally hashes lifetimes. Yeah. Um, but that's like hashing the existence of the lifetime. It's not hashing the semantics of the lifetime right because lifetimes are trees um okay uh i need to figure this out basically this type id tells you what you get when you pull things out of the pool um i'm a ref so uh type id or pool type this is really important that we get these right. So this slices of T's, that is a slice T. And that makes sense. 
Um, because that's in the pool. This is a numeraf of an IEDT. Um... Which makes sense. I guess if we ask for a numeraf... No, I think I do want this to be a numeraf. And I think... Yeah. That's a unique type ID for a slice T. This is a unique type ID for a numeraf T. When we ask for a type, we're actually going to ask for it with the numeraf. Uh, that's basically the big thing is I need to figure out if I want to query. So this is... You ask for this. That is unique ID. So technically, I actually don't need pool type on anything that isn't numeraf. This is the only one that matters because these, I can never pull a slice T out of the pool. And I also can never pull like a U8 out of the pool. I can pull a numeraf U8 out of the pool. Um, so I think semantically, I want this to be the DREF target, which is this. Right? So... A prefix slice internally holds a numeraf IDPT, which is what we want. If you were to pull a prefix slice out, you want to query by that type. Okay. Woof! How do you have so much energy after such a long time? Uh, I mean, I've just, it's just not late. <laughs> it's just not late is the big thing. Uh, prefix slice, yep, now we can re expose that. Now we can pull in the type database. Let's see what we did here. Um, I can't remember what this code is. A high-performance database for storing register types in a local pool. Uh, type ID. Okay. So it looks like I wrote... <coughs> it looks like I wrote a database here. Uh, max types, max refs. Database for holding references to different types. Um, I think Yama should be quiet. Number of unique types in the database. This is uh, only on local right now. So we'll have to make two copies of this. We'll have to make a local copy, and then we'll have to make an atomic copy that works on the NUMA pools. But this is like where the types will be stored and registered. And I think we'll probably make this a, um, yeah, okay. Max types, maximum number of types that we can store, like unique types, maximum number of references that we can store of a given type. <laughs> Lipstick. Font, I don't know what this font is. <laughs> um, number of types in the database... Number of type. I think it's Noto, maybe. I don't know. Um, number of unique types in the database. So that accumulates as we add types. Type IDs. Type ID of the types for a given index. Um, I can't remember if this is done or not. I don't think this is. So this is a lookup table for type IDs. Number of refs and then the refs. Okay, that makes sense. Okay, so it's a three-part structure. Uh, that's a maybe uninit type ID. And what we want to do is probably... Hmm. Um, we have clear num type set zero. Perfect. Create a new empty type database. Num types is zero. That takes a self. This takes a self. T is pullable or sized. Uh, takes a local. Oh, yeah. Local refs don't exist anymore. That's a legacy concept. Uh, numeref IDTs. Get the type. We need to put this in the database. I think this code will work. We just have to slightly. We have to change it from the type ID stuff. 
So we're just gonna do that quickly. I might rewrite this data structure a couple times. Um, no way. No local ref. Yep, that makes sense. This is a numa ref. Box. Uh, yeah, we do have boxes in here. Uh, use alloc box box. Oh, fuck me, that works. Never constructed. Okay. So, max types, max refs. Number of types. This accumulates. Clear it out. Set these new init, uh, new uninit slice for all the types. Insert. Get the number of types. Go through all of them until we find that, uh, a type. This is what I decided I think was gonna be the fastest. And I think I still agree with that. Check if the type ID matches, so raw get that, get unchecked on the index as pointer, deref that to get the type. Um, and I think type ID, it implements clone and copy. Okay, why am I doing maybe uninit unsafe cells? Because I can just do cells, I'm pretty sure. Well, maybe uninit because, well, uh, yeah, I think we can just do cells here. U size. Well, we do want maybe uninit, actually. But it doesn't need to be an unsafe cell. We'll leave it because the code builds. Um, this is meant to be really, really fast. So if the type is equal to this, then break. That leaves us with the index. Uh, we keep looping. If we get to the end, if index is equal to max types, this is wrong. Okay, this is fine. New on init, zero. Zero it out. Register this. Val. We take a numeref by move. That's okay, because that implements clone and copy. We get the type for this. Oh, we get the type for T. Not for the numeref T. Okay, and since we're doing that on the numer of T. Okay, um. So this is where it's tough. Basically, do I want. Do I want to use the pool type? Do I want to use the pool type of the numer F or the contained thing? And I am leaning towards the numeref, in which case what I actually want this to be is of the val. Can I do this? Unknown field, um, val as poolable? How does this work? Uh, what am I trying to do here? Yeah, that's not a type. Um, I'm being dumb. How would I get that constant? I mean, I could do the full this, right? I could just do this, and this is technically the same thing. But I want that by through val. I don't like that code duplication, because if I ever change that, I could fuck it up. But, okay. So, we've decided the numeref, the type ID of the numeref containing the T is what we're going to use. And I think that's a little bit more sane. So, like, this will never actually be used because when we look up something, we're looking up a reference to it. Uh, same with this, not used. Perfect. Okay, I'm happy with this. And then with the prefix slice, that makes sense as this registers, prefix slice registers itself as a numeref of IDPT. Okay. So, inserts. So we get the type, this is just a U64, get the number of registered types. Impl poolable pool type, yeah, I can make an accessor, yes. But I like, I like this more than an accessor. <laughs> it's tough. But yeah, an accessor definitely works. So index is zero, while index is less than num types, that's the number of registered types. Um, we go through, 
this doesn't need to be unsafe cell. I can't remember if I was writing this to maybe be a little bit more portable for the atomic implementation. Um, while the index is less than the number of types, increment this. If index is equal to max types, then we failed. Okay. If not, if it exceeded num types, then we might have found. Uh, I guess maybe we rely on this follow through. So a raw get, get a pointer to the type ID, get a pointer to the number of references. If index, if we failed to find a matching type in the loop above, okay, nice. If we fail, so these are just getting pointers. If we failed to get a matching type in the loop above, then we register the type ID. So we set the pointer type to type. We set the number of references to zero. We increment the number of types by updating that. Perfect. Then everything is now the same at this point. So we get the uh, next free index, which is a uh, number of references. If it's less than max refs, if it's not less than max refs, then we, we can't store any more of these references of a given type. Otherwise, we go into here, uh, get a pointer to the index buffer, get a pointer to our specific index, Register the reference. Update the number of used indices. Actually, I think this code is fine. So pointer index, that slices it again. Register the index. Update the number of indices. Perfect. Get the raw indices stored in a given type. Pullable this. Pull type. Once again, this is going to be... Okay, in this case, I actually need it to be numeref. I couldn't do associated types because I'm not passing in a reference here. So now... This allows me to get the raw indices, a slice of, a slice of indices, uh, which are basically references for a given type. So I say I would like to get all of the types associated with this poolable type. Um, and I guess here we're wrapping it in a numeref. So here we give it like slice u8. I. Mm. Yeah, I don't know how I want to do this. I'm going to I'm going to do it on the internal type. Fuck. Where this is a uh, PT. Okay. It is such a tough decision. Basically, do I want that layer of indirection? And I don't think so now. That's a slice T. This is a numeref T. This has to be a unique thing, but we'll never be looking up a numeref itself. Now we're going the other way. We're now we're looking up these. Um, nothing changes here. It was just this and this. Okay, so now this is T. Okay, look it up for T. This makes more sense because we passed in here. Uh, there we go. So get the number of registered types. Go through all of the registered types. So we're looking for uh, we're looking for a type that matches the type that we're looking for. If we don't find anything, we couldn't find the requested type. If we could find it, then we get the number of references for that type. We get a pointer to the index buffer. We get a pointer to the first index. We get a slice from the raw parts for that pointer index of num references and return that. Okay, so this, this does work. All right. Fuck yeah. Holy shit, chat. Uh, in a local pool. And this is correct. This type database only works for local pools. So clear all that stuff. Okay, so now what we need to do is we need to go into local pool and we're temporarily going to hack this in here. Um, so this is going to be the, um, this is the type database. Type DB is a type database and max types will just say 1024, 1024. These will actually plumb up through here as generics at some point, but right now we're not gonna do that. Uh, use create type database, type database. And we'll have to make another type database that is atomic and safe in that context. So type database here, 
missing type DB. Type DB is a uh, type database new. It knows what it's supposed to be based on the generics. Then clear will get called here. Uh, reset the type database. Right, we have to wipe this self dots uh, type DB dot clear. And we'll actually do this up here. So reset the type database. That's a free operation. Literally just sets that cell to zero, which is the same here. So we clear out the type database. And then um, what we're going to do is when we create, when we initialize a value is when we register it, right? Basically, whenever we produce a numeref, which is uh, init, and init slice as well, and um, here's init slice. Yep, that's a result, because that can fail. This one cannot fail. So initialize the data. Once it's initialized, we now have the numeref, and we can now register this. Let ret is equal to this. So now I can do self.type db. Uh, and uh, register, insert. Insert uh, ret. So this is register the type. And then we return this. Type db on accessor. Yeah, this is actually on the pool. Okay. Um, yeah. So register the type in the pool. Holy shit. Okay. And then the same thing for numa ref down below here. So we create it on localized, but localizing, we don't necessarily want to register it. Um, at least not the way that I want to do this here. So we'll, we'll come up with ideas for that later. Uh, this is ret. So get that accessor, register that, and then uh, OK ret. Bam. So now slices get registered. So once they're initialized, we register them in the type pool. And then from there, we will be able to query things in the type database. Uh, that takes mute self. So we can't use self while that's happening. Um, so uh, what do we call it? Types. So we're really just going to make like a pass through API here. Um, Bam. Or this is going to get, uh, get references to types um, of a given type in the pool, right? And this will be your local ref ID or numeref ID T. And then this will call self dot uh, pool dot type db dot types. Okay, so this is not correct yet, mismatched because it expects numerefs. We know at this point we can literally cast that. <laughs> so uh, what we're gonna do here is I think we're going to uh, just make a new slice as pointer. Uh, so let types is equal to this. So get the raw indices. Indices. And something like that. And then what we'll do here is we'll do, uh, a question mark. This is now unconditionally sum, uh, core slice from raw parts and this is safe because uh yeah it just is types dot as pointer and types dot len maybe add a static assert i could but it's repr transparent so um as const num uh, ref id t But numaref is literally repr transparent. 
So that would be that would be pretty hard to fuck that one up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um Okay. Types T. Holy shit, that builds. Honestly, I don't even know why I don't just give the numerefs here. Oh, because I don't think I have ID. Yeah, I don't have the tag. Well, I could take the tag in here and just directly plumb that through, right? There's no reason I can't do that. Get the raw indices. Why would I why would I do that that way? Why wouldn't I just return the numerefs here? Because it really is no difference. Uh, get the references to types of a given T in the pool. Okay, and then this has to be a specific ID. Um, that, and then this is numeref ID T. Do you think we can start again? And then we don't have to do this anymore. We can just, bam, plumb this through, pass it through as is. Right, so this is just an accessor function. Um, and ID, we actually have, I'm going to strictly say ID here. Numeref ID, that's tied to the local accessor's ID, that's tied to that ID. Okay, so that's very strict now. And then at the end here, uh, pointer index, should I learn C before Rust? Never hurts. Uh, as const numeref idt. Holy shit. Oh, is this why? What's this mean? Oh, because this just needs to be a different ref. Uh, a. A. Um, okay, maybe I see why I did that. I'm just going to go back. <laughs> that might have been why I did that. <laughs> yeah, I don't have, like, access to all the lifetimes I want here. Perfect. Okay. Um, I could probably make that work, but I... The accessor is like where those lifetimes really come into play, and I think I'm trying to just not use those in here. So that makes sense. I I really am concerned of any like erasure of that ID. I want to make sure that ID is this ID and this ID, and all of those are very strictly associated here. Okay, so now what I should be able to do is our test program. Uh, what do we call it? Elk test? Yes. Cargo run. Beautiful. Uh, release. Okay, this is benchmarking. We don't need to do this shit. So we're going to create an accessor. Oh, here's where it happens. Let's, uh, yeah, I like this. This is good. This is good. Prefix slice of that shit. Um, eh, you know what? We'll deserialize this packet. 10 elements, 10 of those, bunch of U128s, 69s. Okay, so the perf is gonna drop a lot. You added a comma, did I? Oh. Well, then that makes sense. Okay, so this is gonna be much slower, of course. Because now we're actually registering. Every single time we deserialize something, we register it in a database. But what that means is that now, um, what we can do... Holy shit, this is crazy. For tip is equal to... Um, oh, we're going to do extend from slice. This is going to be ii. We'll do this. ii as u128. Right? Um, so we're going to deserialize this array... And then for type in la dot types, we're looking for u one twenty eight. Yes, here we go. 
So these are all the U-128s. Holy shit. There should be 10 of them. Yep. Um, uh, we're getting a slice here. Wait, maybe not. Maybe it didn't work. Uh, we're gonna get rid of this shit. I don't care about benchmarking anymore. For type in this. Oh, uh, unwrap. It's an option. So we iterate and we get the... Yeah, there we go. I was about to say. Um, okay. So here are all of the different... Yeah. So basically, we create this fake packet. We deserialize this packet, which is a U32 followed by... There's a prefix slice. A U32 followed by that many of these. So if we were to have this U128, there's no objects in here. Because this, if this will give us a slice of UN28s, um, yep, none. So we have to deserialize these into their own objects, right? We can't, we can't get objects that weren't instantiated as individual objects. So here, we can get these, and now we can do la.get. And these are all of the different objects that were registered here. LA.get type found ref. I think we just deref that. Yes. Would it work if you looked up LA types? Yes, it would. Um, so let's try that. Um, but yeah, there's all the individual numbers that we created. You, I think you must should be quiet Cause it never tells the truth Tell me, so tell me who I So, a slice of U128 And this is technically putting it on the pool when we make a prefix slice Uh, unwrap on that Because that doesn't exist That's true That's true Um, so if we get rid of this we then go to this. This is now the Desu case. Here we go. But this should work. Yep, there we go. It's just one. And that makes sense. Um, and if we were to index that at zero and la.get on this, this is why I like having the... Uh, okay. Uh, la.get. Um... Oh, I don't need to get it. Do I? LA types zero. This is a numeref? No, this is not a numeref. No, it is. That makes sense? Yes. Because any slice has to be a numeref. LA dot get slice. Yeah, there we go. And here it is. So this is the contents of that slice. Yep, there it is. Right? Isn't that fucking cool? God, that's so sick. Nice, yeah. So now what I need to do is I need to make this work with globals. Uh, so I need to basically make a type database that is atomic safe. And also stores duplicates for like node copies. Such that I can put one of these databases on the NUMA pool. Um... Because right now, this is only for the local pool. But yeah, if I were to deserialize something else, if I make packet 2, right? Uh, this is now packet 2. And we'll just add, uh, I don't know, 69123. Or we'll do like 69123 because we're printing decimal. Um, if I were to get slices here uh, for... How many types do you expect to write? Uh, what do you mean? That's gonna be user controlled. Do you consider linear lookups bad? Um, yeah, so my view is that linear lookups will be faster for my N. Like, think about it for like, uh, think about it like deserializing TCP. Like, how many types do you have in a TCP header? Right? And it's really not that many. 
in reality, what I'm going to do is um, the pool, the, uh, uh, the type pool, this type database is going to be a trait. So things will implement like type database. There will be like type database and atomic type database that will be traits. You will then pass in a trait. There will be a default trait implementation that's null. And the null trait will do nothing. Such that if you just want a fast allocator, you don't want to do this like fuzzer, this type database thing. That means that all of these things will disappear. Like this code won't exist. The registration won't exist. Because now that we're registering this, these allocations are way more expensive. Um, but yeah, what I'll probably do is that will just be pluggable. That will be something that you will pick as an implementer. You will pick that. Right? And I know that's kind of strange, but that way there will be like a, a, you can use the null type database, which doesn't record types, which means that you just get full perf on allocations. Then there will be like a linear type database, which will be designed for when n is probably less than like 512, right? Um, and then there will be like a fucking hash map type database where it's like you expect a fuck ton of types. You don't care about the perf because you have so many objects, right? Stuff like that. But like what would an IP uh, TCP packet? Like how many things are there in the, this entire layer here? Hopefully I can see. That's only the TCP. I want the whole packet. So the database will be a generic type parameter and you can plug and play filters and backends. Yes. Yes. That is already, like, I have designed this because I know my very first use of this code. Linear lookups are going to be faster because types is, N is going to be probably under 500. Um, but... Eventually, it gets larger and larger. I maybe want to do like a page table or a hash map or some sort of... Maybe I just want to sort by... Maybe I want to sort and do... Um, honestly, that would probably be fastest is like a binary tree or just a, a, a vector that's sorted. And then I would... Anytime you insert a new type... Because keep in mind, we don't really have to optimize for new types. Type ID is already hash. Yeah, exactly. So, um, we could pretty easily, honestly, I actually think it'd be really good, would be to maybe do just a sorted thing. Um, and I could do that pretty well generically, where basically if the number of entries is less than 50, then it doesn't do a binary search. Or something like at some point a binary search is not worth it compared to just a linear search and i could just have that be a threshold instead of a pluggable thing a manual hash map yeah that's what it would be all it would be is it would just be a uh when you like inserting a new type would be rare with a fixed size. everything here has to be fixed size right ultimately this is going to kind of mirror the implementation we use for numa pool and numa pool has to be fixed size because it's atomic you can't, you can't resize without a lock, and a lock will absolutely crater performance here. Um, well, we couldn't do a map on the Numa pool then. Well, we could do... The local pool could actually have cached indices for the Numa pool. Where like the NUMA pool, you just append objects. So that would be a linear lookup. But after doing the first linear lookups, you then cache them in your local pool. So your local pool, which then can use, well, it doesn't need locks. Your local pool could then have a, a translation table. So you could go from, right? So you look it up once and then you cache that. And then that can be a hash, that can be a little like rust data structure, if that makes sense. There's, uh, there's many different approaches that we can take. I haven't really decided on one. I haven't decided if I want it to be super pluggable. I know that this is a solvable problem. Like, I know that I can get very, 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 very fast atomic read-only accesses where I'm looking up these types and hammering them in a mutator, where I'm constantly hitting the global one. 
Global pool would have to do linear lookup during insertion. Yeah, and that's okay, which is rare. Exactly. Yeah, even if n is 5,000, that's probably okay. Um, because keep in mind, that's basically my coverage database. And the global pool never can be freed. So that global pool, I mean, like, how many lookups can you do before you run out of RAM? Right? Because every time you do an insertion, you're inserting into the global database, which you will never free. And if you're never going to free that, then that's pretty rare. Like, you're probably only inserting into that on coverage increases or some other, like, in a fuzzer context, like, something happened where you want to archive something for future use. Um... And that's basically going to be logarithmic. And I'm also planning on deduping that. For the global pool, I'll probably dedupe objects to decrease uh, basically the amount of cache pollution. Because a lot of times you're going to insert the same objects. You know, your, your TCP header, you're going to have the same options field almost every time. Your DHCP, you're going to have like the same number of options. You're going to have the same types of options. So... There will be probably a lot of backends there, if that makes sense. Um, so I think I'm going to start heating up food, and then I've got one last thing I want to do on the stream. But yeah, you, you see how there's many different problems and solutions. Sounds challenging. It absolutely is. Um, but for my current use right now, I'm not really bottlenecking on perf. Um, keep in mind... Perf aside, even with slow lookups and even with like a fucking locking implementation that's not an atomic insert only database, it's this still as a mutator is just a phenomenal way to write a mutator. Like even if like the local pool will be fast because that doesn't need locks. And then when you push things to the global pool, even if that needs like a full blown lock to insert things, who cares? Because that's pretty rare. Um, this is just an incredible way to write a fuzzer. It just, it just really, really, really is. Um, so I think the only thing that I actually want to do, you should make deserialize for enums. Yeah, I actually have that offline. That's why I haven't really added it here. I already have an implementation that I'm probably going to rewrite anyways. Um, but I have an implementation for enums. So... Basically, you implement your own deserialize for the enum to determine which variants, and then you just you just call deserialize on the on the uh, structures. So you have to you have to you have to have a way to programmatically like tell it which enum variant to use. But then the the enum variants are just already implementing deserialize. Always rewrite, yeah. Um, so. I think there's one last thing I'd like to do this stream. And so I'm going to start reheating my food so that I have my food ready when the, the stream's over. But what we're going to do is uh, we're going to make uh, we're going to make the numerefs no longer i sizes. We're going to make those user specified. So the user will specify the type to use for refs such that you define that. So if you think uh, if you're only ever going to do under 64 K allocations, then there's no reason to not use a numeref of a U16. There's no reason for an I size. So um, trait mutable for a deep mutator. What do you mean by that? Um, but yeah, so basically I would like to make it. So like for a lot of the local refs, like the numeref, the, the numa pool is you're probably going to use eye sizes most of the time. But for the local pool, when you're deserializing, like literally only the packets that have been observed during a specific fuzz case that lasts for like literally microseconds. Honestly, I think like a U16 or a U32, like a U32 is absolutely enough for really any fuzzer for the local case. Um, so I can make it so that allows you to, you know, since... This really encourages you to have these refs. It'll decrease the size of these and get you some more cache density there as well. Yeah, a struct which has many fields and a trait which allows a mutator to come to the struct and mutate any... Oh, yeah, yeah. So I have... 
Um, I have that, I have like this same procedural macro thing offline, where just this, where basically for each member, randomly have a probability of like 10% chance that for that field, you then replace it with, uh, with an object in the pool. And right, it, it works exactly as this does. Basically, for each member, look at the type of the member. Well, flip a coin. If the coin flips the way you want it to, then you have to make a copy of the NUMA uh, reference into the local ref. You have to localize it because now you have to mutate fields. So you have to make a copy of the like top level structure, copies that, then you replace the field that you want to replace. Only once you've decided you're going to replace anything do you make the copy, and then you can recurse into that whatever. When it compares to a byte-based mutator, it slaughters it. <laughs> slaughters it. <laughs> In terms of perf, it should be slower, but it's just not even close. It's not even the same fucking ballpark. Because, like, if you're for your U32, you don't just randomly flip bytes in it. You actually put in U32s that have been observed to be known that they are good U32s. And even U16s. Like, U16s even, you get, you know, by nature, we're recording a distribution of, of fuzz inputs that make sense from what have been observed, rather than just randomly in a mutator being like, oh, I don't know, just bias it towards like the lower numbers a bit because that makes a little bit of sense if it's an index or a length but have a random chance of it being arbitrary um no this is really 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 good can i ask a question absolutely have I ever done fuzzing of uis <laughs> uh. So how do you like my allocator? Fuzzing kelk.exe, yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay, so uh, let's see if we can bang this out quick. Now my food's ready and then we're gonna... And I'm gonna get on my way. So, um, yeah. I hate adding generics, but I mean, this, dude, generics are so important. Um, so what we have to do is we have to make a fucking, what, what do we have to do with the eye size? So we have to implement like what, uh, this wrapping ad. We don't actually have to do wrapping ad. I don't think. So I think what we'll do is we'll have cast tune from eye size. Maybe 
That might be all we do. Um. Yeah. Sound out of sync? It probably is. Because that's just how Linux or OBS works. Um. Hmm. Oh, I don't think I left that sit long enough. There you go. Okay. Now I go back to this. All right. Hmm. No, it's still out of sync. I don't know. This time it's really fucked. <laughs> I feel like that has worked most of the times. But this time it's not. So, uh, yep. Test. I don't know. It still might be out of sync. Honestly, I like this allocator, but one, most of the time people don't care about throwing objects into a database. Uh, I'm worried about correctness. I'm not. I'd probably use it for lo some local allocations, but my resizable vec? Fuck your resizable vec, dude. Resizable vecs are for people who can't commit to a size, okay? Um... Yeah, like, this is, this is not, it's not meant to be an allocator. Uh, that being said, it's very fast, but just use the, just use the null thing. Use the null type database, and then it doesn't register them in the type database, and then, then it literally doesn't matter. Like, like, that's the point of that. Like, things won't be registered by default. You have to opt into the type database. It will be implied that you do not want that by default and it will just be the null type database which will be implemented in this file that will do nothing on clear and it will do nothing on insert and it will do nothing except for return none on types all of that will get inlined all of that code will get deleted and thus no registration will actually occur so i'm not worried about that i that that's already solved correct there's no correctness issues it's perfect and then, yeah, the local allocation stuff. I don't know how I would make it so you could make the local allocator without needing the NUMA allocator. Um, but... impl type database for that. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Like, it... Yeah. Like, it wouldn't cause any extra space. It wouldn't cause any allocations. It wouldn't cause any code to be inserted. It would literally just do nothing. And that would be the default implementation. But I would have to, I don't know how I would make this not always take a NUMA accessor, but once again, I'm not really designing this for other people's allocators. <laughs> this is just for me, okay? Fuck you. This code's for me. <laughs> Boo-hoo, Desu. Make your own fucking implementation if mine isn't good enough for you, bitch. Uh, do I have to OCR? No, I'm going to make a blog post and push it, but, like, I've, this is not, this is not for general purpose allocation. If you want this for general purpose allocation, you should, you should implement this as a general purpose allocator. <laughs> like, you should take the concepts here and use this as a general purpose allocator, because this is way more than an allocator. Um... But it, it, this doesn't really make sense to, like, uh, there are situations where I will want to use this without the type database registration, where I want that null, but I don't think there are any situations where I don't want the um, NUMA ref, NUMA stuff. Oh, no, I won't use this as a GP allocator. Yeah, exactly. See? Okay, uh, how do we want to do this? So anywhere we have an eye size? How many eye sizes do we have here? She's probably a lot. Oh, really not that many. So, alloc this, uh, that, um, like for frame local data for games. Yeah, exactly. Like this is what it's very good for. It, it allows you to recklessly kind of use allocation. I mean, Honestly, even there, like a bump allocator is just fine. This is the really the main reason this is good is because it allows for uh, it allows for combining allocations across allocation boundaries, 
which is really not useful in conventional code because in conventional code, if you have like a bunch of objects that are associated together, you just put them in a structure and allocate room for the structure and fill in a structure. This is used for, useful for fuzzing because I want to explicitly delineate each field of a structure into its own object so that I then can pull those out and use them as, uh, as part of a corpus, right? If that makes sense. So like even like, I don't understand how much perf gain this would really give you over a normal bump allocator, given you're actually allocating things in chunks and allocating them in structures. I can't really think of many situations where you would be doing a bunch of small allocations that are close enough that they would get merged by the compiler, but that you wouldn't want to just make a structure for. Now, in theory, this should just be a better bump allocator. It just, it just is, because it just allows that optimization to occur. But really, this enables me to make many, 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 many small allocations and pool them. Um, the NUMA stuff is massive. The NUMA stuff will literally give me like a 60-70% speed up on mutation on large servers. And yeah, I, I don't know. <laughs> this is more a technology than an implementation. This is very applicable for fuzzing. It's very applicable for corpuses. It's very applicable for structured data where you want to have a collection of basically the tree, like the recursive tree of typing. Um, like even for like a Wireshark, this is useful because it's super fast deserialization where you can kind of like look at buckets of like what values are. Um, but for normal code, unless you're writing really sloppy code, this shouldn't be a speed up. Like to play on real servers, just get experienced new malware code. Yeah, it's really important. Um, I mean, it's basically doubles your perf. <laughs> so like, it, this basically gets me back. If I have a four node system, I literally get back like those three nodes that would be at half speed effectively if they all had their shit on one node or, um, theoretically even worse if there was like uh node interleaving where they kind of all mix the backing memory so they use like all the memory bandwidth but now you got really fucky latency on every node no node is local so um but yeah it's i would say 2x is just a good ballpark basically for heavy heavy reads of things that are shared um do i want to do this right now kind of not really i think i'm not gonna do that i think i'm just gonna call it here start winding down i'm really tired my throat's starting to get sore uh, let's find someone to raid. Uh... Great stream, hell yeah. We got a little bit of everything in there. Um... Uh, hmm. But yeah, that's my allocator I've been working on. Uh, I don't think you can really beat that. <laughs> it's for its use case. And even as a bump allocator, it's just really, 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 really good. Um, But the indices mainly are important because it allows me to do those NUMA allocations where I can have different pools on different nodes and use the same references and same structures across them. And that, it's, it's just, there's nothing even close to this. This is multiple orders of magnitude faster than anything you could possibly create uh, that gets you that. Dude, there's like no one streaming, man. What the fuck is this? Bunch of EU plebs. I don't know, some dude during, doing neural net. Someone's a C and C++ game dev. Uh, let's see what this is. Uh, 
They're on Windows. They're talking with some accent. And they've, they've got, they look German, maybe. Uh, we'll send you over there. We'll see. We'll see. I don't know. I've never seen them before. So good luck. Uh, we're going to send you off there. Uh, read this. Uh, okay. See ya.